19. Minus 79 HP. It wasn't until I landed with a back crunching thud at the bottom of the steps that I realized my health bar was blinking. When I tried to roll onto my butt, all the nerves in my right leg shrieked in symphony as if someone had punched me with a cattle prod. The jolt shot up my hip, raced up the side of my torso, radiated across my ribs, and zapped my spine. It was everything I could do not to scream. Instead, the molar clinching growl I opted for was quite intense. Click scampered down the stairs, then the outer door closed and sealed with a hollow thunk. Muted footfalls scampered down the stairs in short steps. Then Roshan slid to the floor next to me. I'm so sorry, Gemini. I forgot you could not see. I think I broke my leg. Of all the stupid clumsy. I rocked back and forth, cradling my knee in my arms as Roshan grasped my shoulder. Lowering herself to one knee, she pressed a firm hand to my chest and held it there despite my resistance. When I realized she was waiting for me to stop freaking out, I did my best imitation of a calm person. She barely glanced at the injured leg before she spoke. It's not broken. Here, set your back against this wall and let me look. The pain resonated. I cursed under my breath as I shoved my back to the wall. Leave it to me to kill myself before Nora can. Roshan peered over at Click and said, You go and stand guard like a good whatever you are. The animal clicked. I grunted my answer. Yes, yes, do as she says. My pet scurried up the stairs. A glow filled the room. Roshan kneeled beside me, her hands joined at the thumbs and cupped above my knee. Golden light gloved her fingers and palms, and a whooshing sound filled the room. Her vest and undershirt rippled as if caught in a slight breeze. Relief washed over me as the worst of the pain dissipated. Plus eleven HP. Plus eleven HP. Plus eleven HP. A healing spell. A smile crossed her lips as the spell's glow cut through the darkness and illuminated her features. It was the first time I'd seen her up close. I took a mental snapshot to remember my first heal. My neck warmed above my collar as I consumed her features. Or maybe it had been the healing spell. It's because she feels real. It occurred to me suddenly that all those other video games NPCs designed to be attractive were very different from this one. If I believe Lucera and Nokoro, these NPCs had familial lines and Roshan was born to parents like any human in my old world. A meticulous scan of her high cheekbones, smooth forehead, and angular chin brought questions. Did she resemble her parents? What traits pass from generation to generation? Were genes simulated and passed on? Roshan tilted her head to one side. Is it better? Hmm? The low health warning indicators had expired. The red bar representing my HP pool ticked a final time and was full. My voice sounded distant to my own ear as I replied. It's perfect. Her shoulders hunched and she giggled a little. Other than a heel I was forced to cast on the ship that brought me here. This is the first time I have aided someone by my own choosing. I hid my skills for so long. But you are my liberator. I couldn't think of a worthier patient. I flinched as she slipped her arms between my neck and the wall. Though I jerked at first, I found the pressure of her embrace welcome. I'd been so tense since first walking into the forest, and the hug was therapy. My mind flashed to my old guildmates, Meyer, Caitlin, the Rod, and what they might think of this display of affection with an NPC. I should have felt silly, holding this non-player woman, I rested my head on her shoulder and sniffed something familiar, like Coco. Well, congratulations on your first cast. I'm glad you were here to relieve my pain. She maintained her grip as she spoke while shaking her head. If I had not been around, you likely would not have fallen down the stairs. Hey, it's all good. Like it never happened. I used the moment to open the companion tab again. Roshan, human, 
Level 8 Light Priestess. Two available attribute points. I skipped her stats, my eyes gravitating to her spell list. Inner Illumination. Level 4. Allows the caster to see in dark environments. Mana cost, 35. Cooldown, N.A. Minor Heal, Level 7. Heal over time, Hot Spell. Mana cost, 40. Cooldown, N.A. Heals injuries for 10 to 15 hit points per second for 10 seconds. Potency dependent on the intelligence of the caster. And light skill level. Maximum yield. 150 hit points per cast. Outer illumination. Level 5. Projects a ball of light that floats above the caster for 10 minutes. Mana cost. 45 mana. Interesting. Rescuing this one was a good idea. Another prompt caught my attention. You have discovered the Oak Cellar, plus 250 XP. Legacy quest completed. The rescue. Complete. Rescue the prisoner from her captors. Complete. Complete. Reunite with the woman in the woods and see her to safety. Reward. 2,000 XP. I pushed myself up. Despite her healing magic, I sent a stabilizing hand against the cold wall and cautiously tested weight on my leg. All better. Without the glow from her healing spell, I couldn't see her in the inky blackness. She responded as if she'd read my mind. Oh, just one moment. Another glow emanated from her hand, then a ball of light hovered overhead. It rippled and shimmered on the walls and ceiling as if it reflected water. Ceiling. I pointed up. What the heck? I traced from the ceiling to the corner where it met the wall and down to the floor. Where are we? And why are walls beneath a tree made of stone? Roshan shrugged. I come from very far away. I'm afraid I wouldn't know. I nodded. I know that feeling. I'm no stranger to being a stranger in a new place. Her eyes rose in surprise. You're not from here. It was my turn to chuckle. I'm from about as far from here as one can get. Before she could ask the obvious follow-up question, I waved a gently dismissive hand, recalling the warning about the player's agreement. It's a long story best saved for a safer time. For now, it seems we've entered our first dungeon. Dungeon? Reflections of the overhead light spell glowed in Click's eyes as she curled into a ball at the top of the stairs. I cocked my chin in that direction. Either we go back up there into the dark forest, where we can't use your light spell without fear of being caught, or... I peered up the stony hallway into the darkness beyond. We forge ahead and see what adventures await. But we cannot see very far. She squinted into the hallway. Even with both my light spells, I cannot see what lies ahead. How can you call it a dungeon? Because I was sent here on a quest to eradicate a bad guy. Roshan cocked an eyebrow like a pro. Bad guy. A quest. She gave me a cursory up and down gander. It can't be that such fortune has befallen me. Well, I'm not all that. I try to hold my own and all, but Anora takes some heavy lifting. Her tone turned inquisitive. You mentioned in the forest that you leveled. Are you an adventurer, Gemini? When I didn't immediately answer, she traced the frame of my body again from forehead to ankles, then up again. In other circumstances, I might have been self-conscious at the way she kept scanning me, but something about her demeanor set me at ease. Are you a humble man? Is that it? Does it offend you that I ask? My threadbare duds dangled in all their lowliness as I threw my arms out and presented my pathetic form. Don't let the rags fool you. I'm in this to win this. I'm a long hauler. I shall vanquish all mine enemies with great prejudice. I chuckled. Roshan clasped her hand to her chest and breathed a fast sigh. Oh, thank the light. 
I feared I had pledged myself to the service of a pauper. She burst out laughing. Her mirth proved contagious. Her face flushed pink, and I found myself magnetized to her intense presence. She bled positivity, which reminded me of Caitlin. She could certainly suffer worse comparisons if she wanted to adventure. Wait, did she say she pledged herself? I suppressed the urge to shake my head at my stupidity. No, I mean something else to her, surely. Probably just an indebtedness of which I'll relieve her after reaching level 10. Enora saw fit to toss me a gift, and I'd be damned if I'd take it for granted. In a sense, I guess I am a pauper, but maybe we could change that together. Then I instantly wondered if that had been stupid. Did she really care about money, or had she been joking? How much might my words muddy the path our friendship might take? More importantly, how could I convey I was a good person, worthy of her time? What would she want to hear? She acts like a person. Treat her like one. Everything else around here is ridiculously genuine. So be that. I drew a serious tone. I would also understand if you wanted to return home. I can't imagine the suffering you've experienced, and being dragged away from all you've known has to be painful. When I realized I was jabbering in the vein of the socially challenged, I ceased my exaggerated hand gestures and tried again. If it's your desire to return home, I'd be honored to help you find your way. Roshan smiled, her mouth so full of tiny, pearly teeth I thought they could have illuminated that dank, damp tunnel in place of her light spell. The smile faded as she peered down at her hands and twisted her fingers. You are an honorable man. I can see this. But I have no desire to return home. Those men. She huffed a couple short breaths, and her chest jittered with emotion. They killed my father and my master. I don't know if my sister lives. Besides, my magic was discovered just prior to their raid on my village, and my return might be unwelcome. This NPC is losing her shit like a real person. A tear trickled down her face, and the way her shoulders shuddered, a wave of guilt surprised me. My humor was the shield of a past life that I'd used to protect myself from bullies of all kinds, but now it just made me feel like an idiot. I'm... I'm sorry, Roshan. I know what it's like to lose your family. She swiped at her face, as if the tear might burn her cheeks if left to roll. You are a kind and patient man. Let us speak no further of these things. I have bound myself to you and your causes shall be my own. My abilities were never welcome in this place I called home, and if you offer the opportunity to use them, then Solara has deemed me worthy to serve. So, her people believe in the Solara deity, the AI's in-world name, just like Lucera said. Who would frown on your ability to heal the injured? Her humorless smile didn't reach her eyes in the way her laughter had moments before. When my parents learned I'd inherited the gift of mana from our ancestral line, they hid it from the warlord's regent in our village. I only learned the few spells I know by the generosity of a priest who practiced the old ways and detected the light within me, much as I do in you. I feel its warmth on you. It's overpowering. And yet, new. Raw. Almost as if you have only just been born. You sense it? She gave a single curt nod. We sense our own kind. Well, you got the just born part, right? I suspected she was detecting Jara's buff. My teacher sensed my blessing when I was young, although others call it a curse. He knew others would have seen me as a threat. In his youth, he encountered the harsh injustices visited on those born with mana pools. He was sent to live in isolation by his parents. For years he built a congregation in the hills until their dwellings were pillaged and burned by the warlord. When he sought out a new family in his middle age, he found us. In the wake of his great loss, he swore an oath to protect the manna born. He sounds like a devout man. The most of all, I'm certain. There is wisdom in your words. The richness of her accent brought me to wonder why I understood her. 
Roshan, does everyone in Honora speak the same language? Her head tilted. Why would you think such a thing? There are many languages in the world. She squinted an eye and took a subtle step backward. Have you never met someone of my race? How is it you speak my language? A lump formed in my throat at her sudden suspicion. Fear filled her eyes, and hesitancy to answer seemed to disturb her further. What trickery is this? I sense the light, and yet you use the magic of demons. No trickery. I held out both hands, and she flinched. Not at all. Just give me a second, would you? Her gaze solidified, her eyes locking with mine as if she sought answers printed on the brain behind them. But she held fast and nodded. I opened my interface and thought languages. My character sheet flipped open, and tucked away amidst the numerous skills was a tooltip regarding language. Languages. All neutral and lawful languages. Tooltip. You learn languages of neutral and lawful beings instantly upon hearing them. That little mystery solved, her question posed an entirely different problem, especially considering how she'd asked it. I didn't know how to explain my presence in the world with these abilities without breaking the player's agreement and losing a quarter of my XP. Here was an interesting predicament. My thinking turned tactical. Scenarios danced through my mind for another moment, and then I wanted to smack my head. I was complicating things. The solution was simple. Tell believable stories. Keep it short and simple so you don't get caught in lies. And roll with it. Roshan had been trained by a priest. She attributed my rescue of her to Solara. Following that line of thought, the little white lie I needed to tell was obvious. I'd play it up. The goddess blessed me at birth with the gift of tongues. And that was a pretty damn good answer especially considering the walloping follow-up I delivered to appease her concern about demons. But only neutral and lawful languages. I did not understand the languages of evil beings. That was what I called bringing it home. Her jaw dropped, and one hand covered her agape mouth. You lie, she barked through her palm. At first I thought maybe I wasn't so sneaky, but her voice had been void of accusation so I decided to test my interface to find out what she really thought. I ran a quick inspection of my new companion as she glared. Disposition, friendly. Whew, maybe it worked. She splayed her hand over her heart and bowed her head slightly. As you are now my companion, I have uncovered the ability to view your attributes in my interface, Gemini. The same ability that I share with my priest. I would not, however... Venture to inspect you without your leave. May I have your permission? The smooth timbre of her low voice was like music to my ears in spite of the formal tone of her words. Man, I'd been lonely. Is it socially unacceptable to analyze people where you're from? Without permission? Yes, it is rude. I'd never played a game where NPCs had interfaces. A lesson learned at the point of a stone knife wielded by a preteen what seemed like weeks ago, but had only been the day before. Did other cultures in Honora share this privacy concern? I nodded. You can view my stats. Her eyes flickered to my chest, then back at my face, but I knew she wasn't looking at me at all. She was reading her own interface. Her expression seemed to cycle through emotions. Awe. Curiosity than realization. Such a life-altering ability, she muttered. It's as if you are... She jerked as if waking up from a nap. No, that can't... She shook her head, set whatever thought challenged her aside, and nodded at me. I wondered what she saw, but she continued before I could ask. So Lara has blessed you with a great destiny for only her touch could inspire such grace. You are an extension of our goddess Anonora, a tool of her will. I am so blessed to have been granted this opportunity to serve her, and I will therefore serve you faithfully for as long as you will have me, as is my debt. I shook my head and adopted a formal tone. As long as you stand with me, Roshan, we'll both exercise free will. I'll be happy if our interests align and... For as long as you want to stay, I'll be glad. 
But if you ever decide our paths should split, you'll have the freedom to follow your own. Her eyes welled with tears. What did I do? Was my delivery poor? Had I somehow rejected her on a cultural level? My mind raced for the words to form a proper apology, but she interrupted my scattered musings. You are the most generous man I've ever met. Roshan dropped to a knee and bowed her head. I have spent my life hiding my gifts, yet you embrace them. Our enemies shall fall before us. Command my direction. I could see we would have to better define the concept of free will, but this wasn't the time to press the point. We were being hunted by our kidnappers, and I'd stumbled onto the destination for a quest that could seriously boost my chances of survival. I peered down the hallway once again and thrust a finger in that direction. There's only one way forward. 20. How she nodded with such enthusiasm at my direction surprised me. Since she'd spent God's knew how long in the company of smelly thieves, crossing an ocean, and whatever else she'd endured, maybe there was nothing left to scare her. I now had two companions. Not only that, I got a healer. I'm almost ready, Gemini. She leveled a finger at the stone floor behind her. But if I may make a request. I followed her gesture to the long leather bag laying in the corner beside the stairs. After my fall and subsequent conversation with my new companion, I'd forgotten all about the satchel I'd stolen from the beach. Of course. What's your request? I paced over to the bag and knelt. I believe more proper clothes are in there. They will better suit our purposes if we are to meet with danger. She tucked her chin, glanced down at her clothes, and spread her arms out to the side. These are adornments of those ugly men. One of them who died during our journey was about my size, so they insisted I wear these clothes lest I garner more attention than my slanted eyes already did. One side of her lips ticked up in a sneer. You should have seen the hat they used to shade my face. Hmm. So features like hers are uncommon on this continent. She continued, Probably in case they ran across people like you who would stand with the light. A subtle tone in her voice communicated hope, as if she wasn't entirely sure I stood with her religious inclinations of right and wrong, but would prod until I confirmed or denied. She was just so damn... human. You're kind to say so, Roshan. Trust me when I say I haven't always been the nicest person in the world, but I'm trying to change that. I reached into the bag. You have acquired... Magic Bag of Holding. Type... Storage. Quality. Rare. Storage. 48 slots. Items stored inside incur no weight penalty. The text was blue. I wondered where rare items fell in the quality hierarchy. No weight penalty? No. It's a wonderful artifact. Roshan said from behind me. The thieves stole this from my temple after they killed my father and took me. It's only proper it passes into your hands, for I am with you now. I thought your people didn't like magic. Magical items are not inherently evil. This one has no offensive or defensive attributes, so it is acceptable. It is probably precious and valuable, but an adventurer might be better served by using it, if you'll grant me leave to say so. Of course, Roshan. I value your opinion. Her lips creased and she gave a subtle nod. If we find or purchase a scroll of binding, you and the people of your designation will be the only ones able to access the inventory. I reached out and grabbed her hand. Roshan, I'm sorry they took your father's life. She gave me another gentle nod and squeezed my hand. I've made my peace with it. My father was a stern man who suppressed my natural inclinations for magic. And though I know it sounds cold, it was his undoing. Had he fostered the growth of my skills, I would have been more advanced and able to resist the thieves. But I was left to level slowly, only as my mentor could allow in secret. Though I miss my father, our destiny was not shared. I understand. I lost my father when I was seventeen, but making peace with it was difficult. Hell, 
I'm not sure if I ever made peace with it. I reached into the bag and opened my interface. Switching to the inventory tab, the sight of the filled slots flipped my demeanor. Holy mother of the gods! So many of the slots were full. I wanted to go through every item but needed to prioritize. After a quick scan, an illustrated icon of a hooded robe of green and yellow caught my attention. Its smooth cloth filled my hand after a moment of focus. Robe of Apprenticeship. Level 5. Type. Robe. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 19 of 20. Plus 20 maximum mana. Plus 5 healing and damage from light spells. Plus 5% resistance to magical attacks. A smile crossed Roshan's face as she grasped the robe and hugged the garment to her chest. Master Mitwa gave me this just before those evil men raided my village. The mercenary thieves' employer was a warlock who scried magic items with an orb and found it in the temple basement. I admit I took satisfaction in his death by sickness at sea. Though I possessed no abilities against plague, sleep was lost to me in the days after he passed, because I wished a plague on them when they dragged me onto the ship. He kidnapped you. They killed your father and stole your robe for coin. I would have cursed them too. But surely you would not have, Gemini. I sense the purity of your soul. Well, you might want to get your senses tuned up. Because I'd have let those Cretans rot like the rats they were even if I could help them. She covered her mouth as her eyes flared. She slapped my shoulder. Surely not. Certainly you would cure the sick. The innocent deserve mercy, I said. The evil can go screw themselves. Her head jerked back. Well, if that is Solara's will, then it shall be so. She glanced down at the robe and let it unfold. It's funny. If he had not stolen my robe, it might still sit beneath my chest in the priest's quarters, and I would not have it to use in service to Solara today. She might as well have fed me my line. Then our coupling must be destiny, right? It is as you say, Gemini. A gentle smile crossed her face, but I sensed loss in her eyes, as if conflicting emotions tugged different ends of her rope. Her tone perked up. Another item they took from Master Mitwa would aid us. Oh? What is it? A scepter. I reached into the bag as my eyes scanned the boxes in my inventory interface. Then I spotted it. Apprentice's Scepter of Light Power, Level 5, Slot, Weapon, Type, Light Imbued One-Handed Scepter, Quality, Rare, Durability, 19 of 20, 7 to 11 Magic Damage, Casts a Narrow Beam that causes Light Damage, Minus 2 Damage Inflicted by Undead Enemies, Plus 2 Magic Damage to Undead by All Party Members. Handing her the Scepter, I raised one shoulder in a half shrug. It belonged to Mitwa? Yes, but he never wielded it. I wonder why. Doesn't seem to be soul-bound. I've asked myself that question, she said. My conclusion was that Master Mitwa intended it as another gift for his lone apprentice. He would have given it to me in his own time, if that was his desire. She ran two fingers over lines engraved along the shaft of the silver scepter with slow appreciation. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll discard these rags and don my proper attire. She stepped away as if she would trek into the darkness beyond its halo. We don't know what waits in the darkness. You should change here. I'll turn my back. Her finger shot up at the glowing orb above her. The light follows me where I go, Gemini. She glanced down the dark corridor. But leaving you in the dark is no better. I will change here. Long fingers loosened the clasps of the dirty shirt beneath her vest. I turned away and continued rummaging through the bag via my inventory panel. New prompts greeted me with each item I focused on. Minor potion of health. This potion will instantly regenerate 70 hit points. This was no small deal. As Roshan rustled with her clothing behind me, I flipped to my companion tab to check her stats with the new gear. 
My attention fell on the amazingly lifelike representation of her form in motion. She wore only form-fitting undershorts as she held the robe overhead, preparing to let it slide over her mostly bare body. It was real-time video. Close it. My face warmed under my silent self-admonition. Then it hit me. I'd just responded as if Roshan was a real woman. Again, I'd caught myself falling into Enora's web of realism. Competing thoughts chased each other around my mind. On one side of the debate was my sense that I should treat the world like any other game. The opposing viewpoint came with the sudden epiphany that NPCs in other games were entirely different entities. They weren't born, they were programmed. Parents only existed if the developers added them for story content. While Roshan's narrative might be mistaken as a simple story construction written by game developers, I knew she'd actually live the events she described. Enora was my chance at a new life. A life in which honor, a concept largely lost on my old world, in my opinion, could play a part. A life where the darker ways of my old world could be cast aside. As to my former guilds and what they would have thought of me treating an NPC like a real person, well, screw them. What did they know? Hell, wait until they get here. I'd only let ghosts from my past slip into my decision-making when logic mandated it. Game mechanics, yes. Spotting patterns when engaging foes, absolutely. Figuring out puzzles, no one deciphered those things like Caitlin. But as far as determining how I'd engage allies like Roshan, no. Uh-uh. I gave myself a reaffirming nod and reached into the magic bag. Rapier of Scorn, level four. Slot, weapon, type, one-handed sword. Quality, uncommon. Durability, 13 of 13. Damage, five to seven. Plus one to parry. The weapon label was printed in green text. With a thought, I dragged the rapier and Roshan's scepter from its new position on her companion page next to each other, and a comparison pane appeared proving the robust programming of the game system. As if I needed more proof. Max durability is 13 on the rapier, and uncommon is printed in green text. Roshan's scepter is rare, and the title is in blue text. Max durability on that is 20. After I'd noticed the attributes for later use, I withdrew the rapier, the white light of Roshan's illumination sphere reflected off its narrow, gleaming edge. The thin, curved blade fed into a handguard with a metal loop attached to its handle. Old World pirates would likely have chosen a weapon like it. A prompt popped up. By equipping this weapon, you will learn a new starter class, Fighter. Fighters use melee weapons, like tree branches, to combat the evils of Anora. Fighters can choose from three combat professions at level 20. Warrior. Dark Knight. Blade Dancer. Did the snarky AI seriously inject a snipe at how I'd used a tree branch to beat a snake to death? That's kind of awesome. As I'd learned when I'd become a woodsman, combat professions were selected at level 20. It would make sense that the starter classes Lucera and I'd discussed probably stopped leveling simultaneously at that point. Roshan stepped into my field of view, and I was so stunned by the sudden appearance of her form in the thick, pleated, green and yellow robe that I teetered back on my bent knees and dropped on my rump. The sleeves flared at the wrists. The split in the robe rose to her mid-thigh, revealing the inside edges of her taut, muscular legs. What a beautiful robe. The words had escaped my lips before I knew what I was saying. You are too kind. She pressed her hands to her abdomen and peered down at the garment. It is part of me. Each time its light embraces me, I feel like I'm in my natural form. I tried to eradicate the memory of my earlier view of her natural form in my inner face. It's nice. I continued to peruse the contents of the bag. At first, I'd considered pushing forward as time was ticking, but then I allowed myself a second to think about it. What was I rushing to? My death? Conflict promising to end me at any moment? What if something in the bag proved a game-changer? 
as much as I doubted that, especially given the levels of the items I'd found so far. It would be stupid to leave a boon inside and later regret it. Or not live long enough to regret it. I dug. The rapier was cool, but a bunch of the contents were crap. Maybe the pickings were slim on Roshan's side of the world, or the warlock who died at sea had stashed other plundered items elsewhere. On the other hand, he might have gotten what he came for and cut out Sonatas to push his luck. Roshan was his ultimate prize. If what her captor implied about this governor's intent to make her a sex slave or concubine was true, she'd probably fetch a heavy bag of coins. She was young, and the thought disgusted me. It's pretty ironic that a low-level fighter ended up being responsible for Roshan's delivery. I wonder what level the warlock was. That's not the important part, though. The guy who was so close to handing her off after what sounded like a long haul had lost sight of his charge at the last moment. He was going to be pissed, and determined to retrieve her. My pet snored atop the stairs. I distributed a couple of mana potions to my healer to keep her topped off when we ran into trouble. Then I found a black-sleeved pullover and matching pants. Although I could care less, Lorshan showed me her back as I discarded my homespun crap and slipped them on. They fit perfectly, which wasn't a coincidence. Reality was cool and all that, but if players had to find clothes that didn't automatically fit, they'd be peeved. As I glanced a final time at the inventory, I noticed a scroll arrow on the bottom right of my HUD. I focused on it and revealed two more rows in the bag. My eyes locked onto something beautiful. Carved leather chest plate of the archer. Level 5. Slot. Chest. Type. Armor. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 15 of 15. Plus 3 defense against physical attacks. Plus 2 ranged accuracy. The level 5 piece of gear I'd have donned and scoffed at in any other game was a godsend in Anora. Hell yes! I focused and the smooth edge of the chest plate appeared in my grasp. You seem pleased. Was there another bowman in the thieves' group? Roshan nodded. They lost many during their travels. The seas are treacherous, the ports rampant with disease. They also took two other girls from my village. They passed as well. This was the second time she'd mentioned disease on the return voyage, but this time the switch flipped. So, sickness exists in Anora beyond battle mechanic usage. That's too bad. That's sad. I'm sorry. She shook her head. Best not to focus on such things. Death is a part of life. A common earth expression. One I had disagreed with. One was the opposite of the other. If I had my way, I wouldn't have to worry about it anytime soon. A lump grew in my throat and an overwhelming need to change the topic passed over me. Eyeing the ribs cut into the armor a final time and noting how it clasped together in the back, I slipped my arms into it and wrapped it over my new shirt. A huge grin stretched my face. My companion matched the smile. Stepping toward me, she said, Turn, and I will clasp it. Thank you. She laced up the leather straps and cinched my new armor so the fit was snug. I pounded the chest three times with the side of my fist. I feel ready to take on the world. When I turned to face her again, her lips were pursed. She shook her head in soft derision and cast a finger toward my simple boots. I glanced down to find one sole already peeling away from the thin leather siding. Perhaps you will find a pair of adequate footwear inside. I'm sure they kept the boots of the fallen. Not only did I find footwear, but a pair I could equip. Stealth boots of the prowler. Level 4. Slot. Boots. Type. Armor. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 16 of 16. Plus 1. Stealth skill. Plus 1. Dodge. This text was also green. Another prompt popped up as I donned the shoes. By the benefit of equipping these items, you have discovered a new starter class. Assassin. Assassins specialize in the dark arts, utilizing sneak attacks and potions to paralyze or kill their victims. 
At level 20, assassins can select from the following professions. Rogue. Bone Reaper. You may now change your class to assassin by equipping a dagger. Equipping multiple daggers after level 5 will teach you the combat skill, dual wield. Though I'd found a pair of simple daggers after a quick search through the bag, I needed a minute to consider the implications of a class change. Roshan showed infinite patience as I scoured my attributes. As luck had it, dexterity was also the common attribute of the assassin class, so I decided to switch. I would still get the automatic attribute point each time I leveled. But on the flip side, my dagger skill was only one. My ranged accuracy was 11. I could use stealth as either class. So, I ran one final test to make an informed decision. Arming my daggers, I switched to the assassin class. You are now a level 5 assassin. Global skill cooldown, 30 seconds. You have learned a new skill, backstab. A vicious attack performed while stealth is active, causing 150% main hand damage. Damage scales with level advancement. Chance of mortal wound increased by 3%. Lucera had told the truth. The new class was the same level as Woodsman. Backstab was a common ability among MMOs for shadow fighters. I guess when it came to names, Honora didn't see the need to make it unique. After all, it described its function. Now I wanted to measure the stat differences. Assassins were a melee class. My melee attack rating, buffed by equipment, was 8, less than the aforementioned ranged accuracy. If I could count on respawn upon death, I wouldn't have minded trying out close quarters combat. Then again, the sharp memory of having a spider pincer rip through my shoulder and the stinging porcupunk needles penetrating my arm ended that thought. Besides, my bow skill was 15 and my dagger skill was 1. Somehow, a dark, dank cellar ending in a quest with a higher recommended level than I currently held didn't seem the best place for a change. But a bow might not be a great weapon if quarters became close. I tapped my lips as I considered the options and slipped the daggers into their sheaths, which I slid onto a tattered belt I'd found in the bag. I grasped my bow and received a system message. You are now a level 5 woodsman. Global skill cooldown, 30 seconds. I unsheathed the knife I'd taken from my victim on the beach. The recollection of his black blood spurting in the moonlight caused a sudden shiver to quake in my spine. In the moment of conflict, my survival instinct had forced my focus toward keeping him quiet so I wouldn't wake his companions. Even with the passing time, it felt like I'd murdered him, but remembering the arrow reverberating in Click's body calmed the sensations. Eyeing Roshan eviscerated them. Grabbing the knife by the blade, I held it out, but Roshan looked through me. It seemed like I wasn't the only one lost in thought. The observation made it even more difficult to think of her as a bunch of ones and zeros. Roshan? Her shoulders jolted. I extended the knife. For emergencies, you can conceal it under your robe. Her eyes went wide as she eyed the weapon. She waved a palm side to side, shaking her head. What? I asked, shaking the blade in my hand. Drawing blood with a blade is against the tenets of my order. You think Solara is going to fire a lightning bolt down and zap you? For a creature of such light affinity, you speak loosely with the goddess's name. And you won't defy those commandments even if you find yourself in danger? I pressed the point. She stared blankly. I adopted a soft tone and matched it with my expression. It would make me feel better, knowing you had the backup protection. While I respect the rules of your order, we are companions now, and our survival depends upon one another. She eyed the blade uncomfortably. I would never use it, Gemini. Never. I waved it in the air. I don't mean to be a pain, but do me a favor and slip it somewhere subtle, just for my peace of mind. Roshan sighed. Sweeping away one side of her robe, she slid the knife against her outer thigh. Patting her robe and checking its pockets, she raised an eyebrow in my direction. Oh, right. 
I reached for the rope I'd used for a belt since being reborn in Anora. Um, I shot a hesitant glance at her leg. Do you mind if I fit this? Roshan eyed the belt, then my expression, and her facial muscles morphed into understanding. Pink filled her cheeks. Of course, my new companion. She slid the robe out of the way and pushed her foot toward me, exposing her thigh again. Ignoring the warmth rushing to my face, I twisted the rope around her thigh. Once I determined how much excess would flap free, I used a knife to cut the slack. She angled her leg so I could slide the sheath onto the rope and tie it off. After depositing the knife into the sheath, I nodded. How's that? Slowly drawing her leg back and releasing the hem of her robe, she nodded. I will adapt. You are quite handy, Gemini. When the robe swept back together, the blade was invisible. She flared the robe open to show me the knife a final time and smiled. Does this please you? I muttered a joking response without thinking. The knife or the leg? My loose tongue with Caitlin prior to my death on the other side had formed bad habits I needed to expunge. After taking a moment to decipher my meaning, Roshan blushed for the third time and silence ensued. A smile crept across her face and relief washed over me. She didn't respond. A quick check of her disposition toward me revealed we were still friendly. I needed 200 more disposition points to reach the next level but I was more concerned with losing the ones I'd achieved. I shook my head at myself and turned back to business. During my investigation of the bag's contents, I was pleased to find some foodstuffs with attribute bonuses. All my stomach grumbling had made me think I might end up starving up in that God's forsaken forest. There was more deer jerky, which Click seemed to enjoy. I fed her two strips and checked her interface to discover the attribute boost didn't stack the more she ate. Oh well. It fed her belly, and that raised her demeanor to happy for a plus-one attack bonus. Roshan, who ended up knowing something of plants, preferred the mixed berries times five. Item type, consumable, plus two mana regeneration every second for one minute. Duration, one hour. Apparently, the bag preserved produce. I also stumbled upon a strange, uncooked plant that looked like weeds with little knots. Once she told me what the plant's benefits were, my interface had revealed their qualities. Whisper grass. Item type. Consumable. Plus two to ranged accuracy. Duration. One hour. Consuming whisper grass would raise my ranged attack skill to 15, so I'd definitely remain a woodsman despite my reservations about possible intimate engagements as we traverse this place. Hey, will I have the bag open? What can you tell me about these? I unrolled one of the leaves I'd tucked cloudberries into. Roshan blinked her eyes in succession. Cloudberries. You should throw those away, Gemini. They are poisonous. I knew it. That's such a dirty trick. They might not kill you but they will make you quite sick. I discarded all the berries in my bag. Click scurried down the stairs and sniffed at them, then turned away. The matron of the wood told me I would need more levels to complete the quest she'd given me. At the time, I'd been a level two nobody. Now I was a level five nobody, about halfway to level six. But in addition to my pet, I'd added a healer. If she knew her game, that should help me mitigate the level deficiency. I faced Roshan. If you've never done this before, I have to ask, are you sure you're ready? Roshan nodded. My nineteen years have led me to this moment. Let us venture forth into the unknown together. She was a tad younger than I'd expected and didn't have my history with games, but the best I could hope for was that she wouldn't freeze up under fire. Her enthusiasm was contagious, but I saw something deeper in the flare of her eyes desire. Like she wanted this all her life, as she'd claimed. That told me something about what the people of this world might think of adventurers. Her light spell expired, and the cellar fell into infinite darkness. But with the loss of my sense of sight came the further scrutiny of my hearing. Rattling to my right, beyond where the light spell's halo had ended, reminded me of hollow blocks of wood tumbling to the ground. 
Her sounds echoed off the walls and drowned out the distant ones I couldn't identify. Impatience swelled in my chest. Mentally cursing my trembling hands, I tried to keep my tone even. Recast the light spell, please. The glowing orb reappeared over Roshan's head. Clicking bounced off the walls and echoed back to us as the animal sniffed the air. You smell something, buddy? She clicked a few more times. I cocked my head at Roshan. Time to earn your mixed berries. Shrugging my bow off my shoulder, I crossed beneath the ball of light above, took a few tentative steps to the edge of its halo, and motioned toward the darkness. Aren't you forgetting something, Gemini? Huh? I turned back. I promise to teach you your first spell of the light. The skin next to one eye crinkled with a squint. Surely you don't want to alert our enemies to our presence. She pointed toward the light above her. In L.O.B. and all the other games I'd played, trainers were usually found in villages, towns, and cities. When I reached the required level for a given skill, I had to seek them out. If companions in Honora could train, that was a pretty big deal. I appreciated the implications of a more linear progression and less downtime, but seriously doubted if my companions could teach high-level skills. That might be a bit too easy. I cleared my throat, shoved an arrow back into my quiver, and stepped back beneath the light. Yes, right. Shouldering my bow, I shrugged. What do I need to do? She cupped my face in her hands. Close your eyes, Gemini. After a short glance at my pet, which she matched with a click, I did as Roshan instructed. I have only the memories of what my master did to guide me. Relax your shoulders. To receive the light's gifts, you must be free of anger and your inhibitions. Focus fully on the sound of my voice. When you receive your first spell, you also must accept the comfort of the light. In all things, it can guide you if you only call it forward and trust Solara's power. Do you, Gemini, agree to receive Solara's power of the light? I blinked my eyes open. Does this affect my alignment in any way? Like, if I decide to cut someone's head off, is it going to negatively affect my influence with this power? You know, keep me from casting light spells? She patted my cheek. You must be a vessel into which the light of Solara can enter. You carry too much tension, too much worry. It will help you if you think less of decapitations. If you're to be a successful guardian of the light, you must let these things pass from your shallow mind. Though the words could have been construed as harsh, I found nothing but gentleness in her easy smile. So human was her expression. It was hard to believe she was a computer-generated construct. Soldiers of the light revel in its glory with our chins high. We are bolstered by its presence, but accepting the light doesn't affect your alignment nor your reputation with a given group. Accept steadfast advocates of darkness and of chaotic alignment. She tapped the tip of my nose. In which case, you will want to vanquish them away. You may still learn other schools of magic. Solara is not a jealous goddess. She gently cleared her throat. One thin eyebrow crept up. Legend has it that powerful casters of light magic were often of neutral alignment during the wars. But those bathed in the dark shadows of Hokram might not have the light touch them, lest they perish like the evil dogs they are. I sense none of the darkness in you, Gemini. Just the opposite. I sense your affinity for light magic. It warms me when I'm near you. But your susceptibility to the light is an empty container that waits to be filled. So before we proceed, affirm you have no desire to seek chaos. I took that to mean she wanted to know if I had any interest in a chaotic alignment. Definitely not my thing. I don't, but I'm also no goody two-shoes. I tend to fall in the middle, I guess. I watched her eyes and rounded cheeks for any sign of a reaction, but saw none. I do what needs to be done to keep me and mine alive, no matter the cost. Roshan nodded. So you stand in defense of your own. This doesn't make you special. She clicked her tongue. Something tells me nothing is going to be simple with you. 
She cleared her throat gently. What of the downtrodden who are too weak to defend themselves? I considered the question, realizing the weight of it. I was no stranger to quests that aided others or struck down those who sought power at the expense of others. I gave the simplest answer. I don't like bullies. I'll stand for the weak. The goddess Solara requires only that you carry yourself with dignity, but it pleases me to know you are not self-consumed. Now, calm yourself. Her eyes follow the line of my neck to my shoulders. Better. Good. Now, do you, Gemini, agree to receive the power of the light? I nodded and blew out a long breath. I do. She smiled again, raised her hand, and thumped my forehead. Then close your eyes. Chuckling, I acquiesced. By infusing you with the power of inner illumination, I wash you in the power of the light. And a little grandiose, maybe. A sudden surge from where her fingers graced my cheeks coursed through my face, down my body, and into my extremities, like a warm jolt of electricity its energy thrusting out of my fingers and toes. It was like Jara's touch, but less intense. My eyes shot wide open. I closed them again and the room flashed around me as the inside of my eyelids glowed orange. The word righted itself as the energy gently faded, but there was no mistaking the warm sensation signaling something in my chemistry had changed. My body fell forward. My hands went numb. I saw Roshan in a new light, Pun unintended. She gripped my hands. Welcome to the light, my companion. You are forever bonded to the followers of Solara. You have gained a new affinity. Spells of the light. You may now learn light spells of rank equal to or less than your level. You have learned the spell Inner Illumination. The warmth coursing through my veins receded as the cold of that place reasserted itself. But I'd just learned a new spell and unlocked a school of magic. I could have given less a damn about the cold. I gripped her hands. Thank you for trusting me with this gift. Now that you have chosen the path of the light, your choices will have consequences. A slider bar has been added beneath your character pane to illustrate your alignment. When you choose actions that align you with the light, the slider will move to the right. If you make decisions aligned with darkness, the slider will move to the left. Players and NPCs of high level and who have also adopted a spell school affinity will detect your current alignment and this could impact your interactions in Anora. Roshan interjected before I could consider the implications of the system message. When you appeared on the beach and dispatched that most evil man, I knew your soul would accept the affinity. You saved me from a life of horror, Gemini, and it is I who should be thanking you. Nonetheless, you are welcome. Her face tensed suddenly as she peered over my shoulder into the inky darkness beyond. She stood taller and lifted her chin. Now, let us venture forth. The minions of darkness await. As if in response, the rattling I'd forgotten repeated down the hallway behind me. I spun around and peered into the black as chills snaked across my skin. 21. The three of us crept forward. I led with my bow at the ready, click right on my heels, clicking nervously. Roshan followed only a couple of steps behind. When we crossed the threshold from the cellar beneath the tree into what had been darkness, I received a new message on my HUD. You have discovered tomb of the lost. This tomb of a long past civilization has become home to a new civilization of subterranean creatures. Note, the tomb of the lost is not an instanced dungeon. The changes you affect here could be far-reaching and impact your story and the world around you. Level recommendations. Solo. Level 9. Duo. Level 6. Full party. Level 4. Discovery. 125 XP. Although the message about impacting my story and the world at large seemed like a warning, my hands trembled with excitement. 
leaving the unknowns of the forest behind to enter the fray in an underground area where I could more likely implement some crowd control measures was like a gift wrapped with a bow. As a duo with a pet who could tank, I felt pretty good about our chances, even if I was one level short of the recommendation. The stench of decay filled the air. That there was any scent at all was a tribute to Enora's ingenuity. That it made me want to retch was too authentic. The further we walked, the cooler the stone-encased environment grew. If not for the new clothes I'd pulled from the magic bag, my teeth might have chattered. I glanced over my shoulder to see how the sudden cold affected Roshan, but she appeared comfortable, even though the slit in her robe exposed her thighs with each step. Perhaps the place from where she hailed was frigid. Cobwebs crept along the upper corners of the stone walls and spread their fingers over the doorway of a chamber on our right. Roshan's scepter cast a glowing light that melted them away. I whispered, Well, that's useful. She nodded curtly. The light provides many tools to help us shed our encumbrances. It was funny how she adopted a more formal tone when she spoke of Solora or the light. That shit is deep, yo. Roshan threw me a questioning glance. Not important. I peered into the room and spotted a dingy debris pile in its center. This inner illumination spell doesn't do a whole lot. I expect a true night vision, I suppose. You are rank one, Gemini. It will improve as you advance. Surely you didn't expect to be handed everything. She scoffed and cast outer illumination. The area was ensconced in light. I will dismiss the skill when we return to the hallway. To my surprise, she stepped past me and into the room. When I crossed the threshold, the contents of the rubble became clear. Bones. I relaxed my arms, lowering my bow as I peered down. Humanoid. I've seen enough in games that... What demented games would involve human bones? Tex flooded my HUD. You are reminded that it is a violation of the Enora Online Player's agreement to discuss the outside world with NPCs. While Infinity Designs understands the use of common expressions in day-to-day -day gameplay, it is forbidden to inform NPCs of your life outside the game world. Although NPCs... I'm begging for an XP penalty. Never mind, it's not important. Her silence seemed to indicate that she'd accepted my answer, or didn't really want one, confirming the game filter had kicked in. Despite Lucera's suggestion that it was standard, I needed to read the player agreement. But it would have to wait until level 10. Everything would. In the back of the small room was a porous stone bench cut into a wall lined with slate plaques. Intricate symbols were carved into their squares. An archer. Some animal resembling a buffalo with horns. A winged serpent standing upright. These are very old. Roshan said. But they are not born of the darkness I sense in this place. My forehead wrinkled up as I absorbed her words. Do you mean you literally sense darkness in this place? She furrowed her eyebrows. You don't sense the chill? What? Wait, are you telling me the cold? I thought maybe it was just cold. So... She interrupted. Yes. Apprentices sense the presence of evil as cold. While the air is cool here, I've spent many years underground, in the mines of Aniqua near my home. There it is cold. Mines of Aniqua. The name of the place brought forth an entangling web of thoughts. That's not a backstory. She's lived her own life. This woman has existed on Anora for 19 years. Remember that so it stops surprising and distracting you. There was a certain comfort in thinking of Roshan as an NPC, an emotional detachment that kept my psyche safe if something happened to her. But as she mentioned her previous life and explained how creatures of the light detected evil, cracks formed in that shell of security. So you're saying because you injected me with the light, I can detect evil? Injected. You have quite a way with words. Yes, that's what I mean. Be warned, however. You are but a suckling babe bathing in the gifts of the light. The only reason you sense its presence is because someone or something much stronger than you cast this place in darkness. 
Though we are separated by only a couple levels, you will find the effect compounds each time you advance. Well, that's reassuring. Nice to know I'll turn into an icicle when I detect an evil being at level 20. You will adapt as you strengthen, so you detect evil in a new way. Don't be so... The rattling we'd heard echoing from these halls erupted. A rolling high-pitched barrage of clicks emanated from my pet's throat. My chin dropped as the pile of bones I'd just analyzed rumbled and clattered together, formed a small mountain in the room, and unfolded into the form of a stocky skeleton with thick bones. Dwarf skeleton, minion, level eight summoned undead. A rusted chain wrapped around the skeleton's neck ended in a silver medallion with a black stone at its center. A glimpse of the stone sent a wave of nausea over my gut like I'd just gargled and swallowed a shot of cheap tequila. I thought I'd heave, but when the skeleton's jaws clicked together and its hollowed-out eye sockets faced us, the discomfort was all but forgotten as my adrenals took over. Adrenals in a game world. The temperature of the room plummeted, and a shiver ran down my spine. When I raised my bow... It was like my arms were seized by arthritis. I took two quick steps backward to create space. I tried to yank an arrow out of my quiver, but it rattled to the floor for my shaking hands. Strap your quiver somewhere else! Raising her scepter into the air, Roshan bellowed, Back into the abyss with you! A blinding white glow filled the room, and the skeleton raised its bony arm to cover its eye sockets as it cowered. Though the light was intensely bright, it caused no discomfort to my eyes. Instead, it cast the same warmth over me as Roshan's earlier heels, delivering temporary relief from the violent chill of the cold. Her voice took on an air of command as she barked an order. Do not just stand there, adventure. Attack it! Ripping another arrow from the wooden sleeve, I knocked it to the string and fired. It impacted the hand the skeleton used to shield itself from the glare. The hand snapped back into the skull and a finger dislodged. The digit rattled to the floor as the skeleton lumbered toward me, quickly closing the distance. At this proximity, I had no time to pull another arrow. So it came down to a choice, and I had to make it fast. Rapier or daggers? Either way, I'd face a 30-second cooldown of my abilities leaving my damage greatly diminished. But the rapier would allow me a longer reach, and I might be able to keep the skeleton at bay. Dropping my bow, I unsheathed my narrow sword and dodged to the side as the skeleton lunged forward and aimed a bony fist at me. I swung the rapier. Though it connected, it bounced harmlessly off the undead's shoulder, leaving only a crease in its wake. The skeleton reached into a ratty leather belt and withdrew his own sword from its tattered scabbard. I answered my own fleeting question about the origin of the sword. It had been hidden in the pile of bones. What mattered more was the undead bastard was swinging it at me. I blocked with my rapier, but when the blades met between us, the skeleton proved much stronger. He forced his weapon down on mine until the blade sliced into my cheek. My blood spurted into the air as the incredible pain of sliced nerves radiated through my face. Dwarf Skeleton uses overpower. Critical hit. Gemini Fowler. Minus 72 HP. 155 HP remaining. Ah! I stumbled backward and covered my face with one hand as I wielded the rapier with the other. Pulling my hand away, I found it awash in crimson. A glance at Roshan's stoic, brave expression urged me back into game mode. The skeleton swung around and I ducked. The wind of its swipe blew through my hair. Your dodge skill has increased to rank six. A red droplet icon flashed twice and turned solid. Gemini Fowler, minus six HP, bleed. 149 HP remaining. Great, more bleeding damage. Why do I have to be such a bleeder? It's my old life all over again. My inclination to sit click on the undead minion made little sense since it had no flesh for her to tear away, and I doubted she would even serve as an adequate distraction. Nonetheless, she clicked away at me, begging to get into the brawl. Why the hell not? Do it! Gemini Fowler, minus 6 HP, bleed. 143 HP remaining. 
as the skeleton's backswing missed its mark. Click bit down on its bony ankle. The skeleton peered down, lowered its weapon, and raised its chin to look in my direction. Really? It seemed to be saying. But as it turned and raised its weapon to attack Click, I sidestepped, double-clutched my rapier, and swung. This time I followed through, and the metal clanked as it connected flush with the back of my enemy's spine at the base of its skull. Its head jerked forward with the impact. The strike sent shockwaves up my arm, surprising me with the authenticity and drawing some choice words. The pain from my cheek wound and the warmth trickling down my face and the side of my neck had kicked me into survival mode, and I was ready to beat down a bunch of bones. As the skeleton recovered, a sudden flash of light emanated from the corner of the room. I spared Roshan only a glance, wanting to keep my focus on the undead bastard coming around to slice my face off, but the quick look revealed an orb of light hovering above her free hand as she held the scepter high in the other. I jerked as the light shot across the room in my direction. Roshan cast minor heal. Roshan heals you for 14 HP. 157 HP remaining. Two steps carried me behind the skeleton just after I dodged left to avoid an upward sweep of its blade with designs on my chin. I lunged when the sword passed, then thrust my rapier between the skeleton's ribs. It caused no noticeable damage, but as the undead tried to turn on me, the blade caught between its bones and held it fast. It jerked, trying to break free. I clutched the sword tighter, but for the life of me, had no idea what to do next. When it stopped struggling and turned its bony face toward me, I grinned. Then I planted my boot into the skeleton's tailbone and shoved with all my might. Bone clicked and clacked on the stone floor as the magical being lurched across the room and slammed into the wall. Not wanting to give it any time to recover, I pursued, drawing my sword back for a good old-fashioned run-through. The bony bastard twisted in time to face me as I stabbed with the point of the rapier. The undead parried, and the blade swung high at the last instant. Time slowed as the skeleton hunched beneath me. I peered down to find the tip of my sword pressed into the stone bench with the necklace wrapped around its blade. In one fluid motion, I twisted the chain tighter with the pivot of the blade and pried it toward the ceiling. The chain snapped. The medallion smacked into the wall and clanked to the stone bench. The skeleton's joints gave way, and bones clattered to the ground in a rattling death. My chest heaved as I doubled over to catch my breath. The light from Roshan's scepter dimmed as she brought it down. Apparently her light spell had expired. We were washed in darkness. I ignored the flashing prompt on one side of my HUD and focused on my blinking stamina bar. We needed to deal with the darkness. Between breaths, I asked, You want to recast? Perhaps we should use our inner illumination spells instead. The light might alert more undead to our presence. At least someone around here is thinking logically. Dude, seriously. The NPC is a step ahead of you. Cast off your former successes. This isn't Light of Babylon. I cast inner illumination. You have reached rank two in light magic. The dim light came in a clean, natural glow. A strange warmth filled my eyes as the skin of my casting hand tingled. Roshan stepped forward as I stared at my fingers. Soon, you will not require your hands to cast. For now, focus on using only your mind. The discomfort you feel will become less noticeable as well. A steadying hand grasped my shoulder. It's not uncomfortable at all, actually. Just different. It's like the power leaves a trail. Yes! The outburst took me by surprise. When she saw me jolt, she lowered her tone. The way you describe the sensation is apt. I'm sorry. I'm just so unused to having someone with whom to share these feelings. It fills me with joy to relate to you in this way. She laughed. Though I'd just battled for my life against an angry bag of erected bones, I joined in. You're the shit. Roshan's eyes flared as her expression morphed into something resembling distress. I am... what? I showed her jazz hands. No, no, it's a good thing. I'm not calling you feces. 
It's just an expression, a term of respect among friends. It means I'm impressed by you. A tentative smile returned to her features and relief washed over me. It is a strange expression to call someone shit in appreciation of them. But as my grandfather always said, when you are in the land of the Nakim, emulate the Nakim. I chuckled. We had a similar expression in my village. When in Rome, I have never heard of this Rome. Is it far? I cocked my head to one side, not sure how to answer. Incredibly far. I had ventured as about as far from here as one could get. A system prompt warned me against talking about the outside world. I sighed and prepared to change the subject. Roshan spared me the trouble. Well, I am glad you clarified for me. I think you are shit as well. I decided not to correct her usage. We had other shit to think about. Starting with the medallion, I'd cut off the undead skeleton's neck. Roshan gripped my hand as I reached for it. It is best you leave the tools of death for the dead, Gemini. What is it? This is a guardian's medallion, used by a dark caster to control its minion. I have read stories of such artifacts. Since this guardian is outside the caster's range, I suspect he left it here so the skeleton would conjure at intervals to check the area and then return to its slumber. That explains why we heard it from down the hall. Is it valuable? Valuable? Her jaw dropped. Do you seek to profit from the suffering of others? Perhaps I have misjudged you. Suffering of... My eyebrows furrowed. Roshan, set your judgments aside for a second and hear me out. Her lips pinched into a white line. Though the expression didn't strike me as receptive, I pressed forward. Adventuring requires that we feed and equip ourselves. If I can make silver or gold from the sale of that medallion, it could very well mean the difference between living and dying. Roshan nodded, but her words didn't reflect understanding. And when you sell this dark artifact to someone and they sell it to another who might have foul intents, who might suffer as a result? I can see this is going to be a problem. I took a second to think it through. In LOB and other games I'd played, items sold to vendors would then vanish, except if I changed my mind and wanted to buy them back or accidentally sold something I hadn't intended to. Once I logged out, those items were wiped away from the database. I didn't actually know if items sold to vendors in this world could be repurchased by others, but considering the other unique properties of a Noran life, I couldn't set the possibility aside. But while the potential for someone to buy my leavings put a whole new spin on things, I needed to verify the mechanics, and I wasn't willing to leave potential gold on the table. Or stone bench, as the case might be. I nodded concession at Roshan. How about this? I'll bag the medallion and hold on to it so no one will stumble upon it here. We'll make every effort to bind the bag to me so no one can access it, and we'll be diligent in the meantime. We can decide how to best deal with its disposal later. Roshan gave a curt nod. I hadn't considered how this wart on the light might be used again if left behind. Perhaps it's best to bury it deep in the forest or try to destroy it ourselves. That you at least consider my words about selling the item proves that Solara has blessed me with a conscientious debtor who embraces the counsel of a woman. Man or woman, it makes no difference to me. As an afterthought, I added, and you owe me no debt. She squinted an eye, challenging me. It is considered rude to deny one her traditions. If you find me unacceptable, cast me aside and I shall return to the forest, evade my kidnappers, and accept whatever my destiny. Nothing in her expression conveyed that she had any intent on doing that. Though she'd indebted herself to me, I got the impression she wanted me to know that I hadn't adopted a child lacking the spine to speak out and a willingness to go it alone. And if that isn't free will, nothing is. I relaxed my facial muscles and nodded. Your presence is a gift I am unworthy of, Roshan. Let's seek our destinies together. Hmm... Wise indeed. You know talent when you see it. The squinting eye relaxed. Stow the medallion. We will let Solara decide our course. Plus twenty disposition with Roshan. Tossing the necklace into my bag, I focused on the prompt I'd ignored after killing the skeleton. 
You have vanquished Dwarf Skeleton. Level 8. 20% bonus XP for killing an enemy more than two levels higher than you. 1176 XP. I studied my XP bar. It was half filled. I muttered. Five and a half levels to go. Does something happen at level 10 toward which you aspire? People don't really talk like that. There. NPC all the way. Respawns, I said, without giving the requisite considerations to my meaning. I won't die. Her face wrinkled in confusion. What do you mean you won't die? Now that's a deep trough to wade through. What happens if Roshan dies? Will she respawn back home? With an adaptive AI in a world labeled literally evolutionary? I didn't think so. Her existence was in much in peril as mine. Whatever the case, telling this light priestess I won't permanently die if I can just reach level 10 could have her thinking I really am a demon. Can unique non-player companions respawn at all? Has she ever heard of such things? I can't imagine what skills I might receive when my level reaches double digits. Surely things change with such an accomplishment. I knew the response was weak the second I finished speaking, so I paused to throw a glance at Click. Hey, can you see us? A rattle of clicks told me she did. Well, damn. I guess you're the shit, too. How do you understand the throaty utterances of this beast? Roshan asked. Ah, the subject change worked. Hey, what does she mean, beast? Why, you don't like click? He is a fine companion. Very sharp teeth. Roshan threw click a smile that would melt dragon scales. Click spread her lips in emulation, and I laughed. I just wonder how you understand it. It's a she. We don't always communicate with words, but she has skills like us and can respond to my mental commands. It's more of a sensing thing, I guess. Though jealousy doesn't honor our goddess, I find myself envious of these intuitions you share with this pet. It must be convenient. It doesn't mean we can share feelings, too, I said. You've already warmed me. I threw her jesting smile, revealing all my teeth. She stepped forward and set her hand softly on my chest. I, too, feel warmed by you, Gemini, but I am a priestess of the light and have sworn an oath of celibacy so that I might spread Solara's gifts without inhibitions or distractions. Well, good for you. I'll try to keep my flirting to a minimum. Your flirtations are no threat to me. I just wanted to ensure you weren't misled into thinking they'd get you anywhere. And that was that. Roshan raised her scepter. The light calls us to do its bidding. She set off for the hallway with her chin raised high as Click and I shared a glance. A real piece of work, isn't she? My pet clicked twice and set off after Roshan. 22. According to my map, our first turn in the stony hallway was to the north. We soon came to an east-west intersection. Despite the surrounding stone, a scent of mineral-rich earth traveled to us from one of the corridors, but I couldn't be sure which. Five doorways were visible from the intersection, and cobwebs dressed all, save one. The three of us formed a triangle as we peered in each direction. Which way do you think? I asked. Roshan tapped her lip. Hmm, I am uncertain. But we should annihilate all evil in service to both the light and the race who occupied this place before the darkness destroyed it. You think the previous occupants were killed? She shrugged. Did you not witness the short statue of the skeleton who attacked us? Actually, I did. She nodded as if I understood how she'd come to her conclusion, so I shot her a confused glare. Gah! The pictures depicted a small people. The serpent stood taller than any figure on the wall. At first, I wondered if this might just be my own bias since I come from a tall people. She threw her arms out to her side. As you see, Roshan stood as high as my chin, probably just over five and a half feet. Uh-huh. And you come from a tall people as well, yes? Or were you a freak? You are quite tall. A freak. Interesting word choice. I didn't stand a hair's breadth over six feet. I wondered at the statures of others I might encounter in this world. 
if I lived long enough. No, I'm probably just a little above average. So, when the skeleton rose in the air and assembled itself, I noticed it was even shorter than I, and reasoned the depictions on the wall were indeed to scale. When compared to the other beings depicted, am I making sense to you? Sort of. Humph. Well, that would have to be good enough. I'd like to sleep sometime tonight, and Solara's tasks lie ahead. I smiled at her slight exasperation. Yes, dear. Dear, is that a horned creature of the woods in your language? No, dear, as in my love, as in darling. She blushed. How you have taken to me in such a short time. But as I explained, I have taken a vow. My mouth is going to get me in trouble. Nonetheless, I was taught this continent was a dark place filled with greedy devils. To be rescued by such a hero as yourself, and have you become so enamored with me so quickly? It's adequate to say the difference from morning to night baffles me. I woke a slave, now battled darkness with an adventurer. I didn't have the heart to tell her she'd overstated the meanings of my words. Besides, she seemed to like it, and that worked for me. It kept her around, if nothing else. Plus 500 disposition points with Roshan. New disposition. Endeared. Points needed for next level. 750. Reward. 100 XP. And also that. I should flirt with her more often. I suppressed a snicker and focused on the word endeared, wondering if I might get a tooltip. And I did. Disposition. A being's orientation toward you. Disposition is a measure of your relationship to others in the world of Enora. Disposition states, despised, hated, hostile, unfriendly, neutral, friendly, endeared, enamored, beloved. Holy crap, endeared is right up there. The AI might want to make that a little harder. This was the first time I considered the AI was listening to my thoughts. Though I'd managed to set that concern aside in the interest of focusing on survival, the AI listening to my every whim gave me the creeps. If anything, it motivated me to get to level 10 and cut that link. In the meantime, I needed to remember I was a tester of sorts. I did not want the AI to make earning disposition more difficult. I needed to keep my brain in check. On the one hand, I'd pulled Roshan off that beach and dragged her away from men who planned to sell her as a slave or concubine. I'd heard the leader say he couldn't beat on her because of someone called the governor. If I thought of Roshan as a human being, then it made sense she would have feelings of gratitude for my actions, especially since I hadn't turned out to be a total jerk. She'd practically pledged a life debt. So, maybe I'd earned her disposition. But no sooner had I rescued her than I'd led her into this place and put her to work fighting an undead creature. I dragged her out of one terrible situation and plunged her into a dank, stinking cold cellar. Human beings might wonder if they'd have been better off as a concubine in such a situation. But Roshan's vibe nary Gray's negative. She was a by-God's light priestess, bent on serving her deity against the dark forces of Enora. Cowering from conflict seemed the furthest thing from her mind. I cleared my throat. It stands to reason we don't want to pass by a room and leave our backs exposed. I raised my bow and pointed the arrow to indicate direction. Let's try that one. Your logic is sound, and now that you suggested it, obvious. Um, thanks? My words did not adequately reflect. I dismissed the apology with a wave. No worries. We tiptoed toward the room with click in the lead. Roshan's steps landed softly next to me. I didn't know if undead could see in the dark but at least keeping quiet reduced the odds of detection. Click stepped into the doorway and a sudden screech filled the air. The dead would have heard that ear-piercing yip. What the hell? I whispered harshly. She'd come to a stop. At first, I mistook the spikes jutting from her back for the ones she'd concealed in her fleshy tails, but when she slid down them and I saw her blood painting the pointed metal, I sighed. Roshan's hands flew to her lips. Her eyelids vanished. Oh no! 
Oops, I said simply. Does your heart lack empathy? Roshan asked. Your companion has found its end. Sighing, I switched the bow to my other hand and focused on the image of the porcupunk in my HUD. Energy surged up and down my arm as click rematerialized and my mana meter dropped. The porcupunk turned in a circle several times, and I thought for a moment she'd lost her bearings. Then she sniffed and scampered to the corpse of her previous iteration. A low grumble filled her chest as her yellow irises peered over her haunches at me. You have pretty crummy luck, babe. One side of her ultra-thin black lips raised in a sneer, revealing a few silvery teeth behind. She clicked once. One click only, please. I chuckled. Hey, at least I can bring you back. That could have been one of us. I doubted my pet took much comfort from my words. Her eyes glowed, and she sent a harsh glare in my direction for a long moment. My shoulders jumped in a half shrug. Like I said, crummy luck. I pointed at Roshan and then shoved a thumb at myself. We don't get to respawn. You're alive now. Don't give me that look or I'll send you back. The spikes retracted suddenly, causing all three of us to jump, and the porcupunk corpse thunked on its side. Roshan and I shared an unsure glance. I crept toward the doorway, grabbed the porcupunk corpse by the flesh tails, then lifted it. I grunted, surprised by its hefty weight. Shrugging, I dropped it again and the spikes shot up. Click dropped her backside to the floor and peered down the hall into the darkness beyond. She sighed. Looks like the spikes only stand high enough to disable humanoids, but I bet it hurts. I don't know if the occupants come to check for blood trails with regularity or what, but we shouldn't dilly-dally. I'd rather find them than the other way around. When I turned, I found Roshan's mouth agape. How do you have such power at your level, that you can raise this dead animal? The excuse popped naturally into my mind. Like you said, I'm a child of Solara. I threw in a half shrug for effect. I turned back to the trap. I think we can just step over it. Roshan's response came in a hesitant stutter. Your logic is sound, my lord. I'm not your lord, but I take your meaning. Standing and setting my hands on my hips, I gave the spikes a long gander. Give me just a sec to check this trap out before you come through. After Roshan nodded, I stepped over the twice-punctured porcupunk body and turned. From the other side, I knelt and analyzed the trap. Blood ran down into slits around the edges of the trap. The design kept it from pooling and spreading across the floor, which might warn other intruders. The design was intuitive smart. Careful not to allow my head to hover anywhere over the spikes, I squinted with the aid of my inner illumination spell. Along the outer edge of the squares, I spied a recess. Raising the corpse again and setting it beside me, I focused on a section of floor through which no spikes had risen. Then the spikes retreated. Once they had, I set two fingers on the floor and pressed down. The spikes jumped from the floor again, and though Click jumped back, Roshan stood her ground. I peered up and found her nodding at me. I smiled. It's a pressure plate. Put weight on it, and the spikes pop out. A blinking icon appeared on the right side of my HUD, so I focused on it. Through your analysis of the environment, you have discovered the skill. Locate traps. Using your refined skills of analysis, you can now locate low-level traps. There is no resource cost for this skill. Awesome. I peered past the text and Roshan came back into focus. I just learned a new skill. Her lips parted slightly and pressed back together. That is wonderful, Gemini. I see your intuition is strong. I shrugged and cocked my chin toward the far side of the trap. Kneel down right there and set your fingers along the edge where there are no spikes. Her head cocked back. I smiled. Trust me, I wouldn't steer you wrong. I just want to check something out. Roshan took a hesitant step forward, and I realized it might have been the first such step I'd seen her take. She knelt and gently set her fingers down. Good. Don't apply any pressure. Just leave them there and try to suppress your instinct to pull back, okay? 
Though her gaze was unsure, she nodded. I raised my hand and the spikes retreated. To her credit, Roshan didn't flinch. Now press down at the edge there. She did, and the trap fired again. You have taught your companion, Roshan, Clan Fort Juan, the skill, locate traps. Roshan pulled her hand back. You are a miracle, Gemini. I have known you for such a short time, and yet I have learned a new skill. If there were not a trap of spikes in the floor between us, I might kiss you. I found the idea of that surprisingly alluring, NPC or not. But like she said, she'd taken a vow. Bank that kiss for later, would you? If you mean I should save it for you, I was merely expressing gratitude. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. But you taught me a spell, so I think we're even. Now, to the next task. Engaging the trap again, I gripped one of the spikes and tugged back and forth. Gemini, please don't hurt yourself, Roshan said. It's fine. Something happens, you'll heal me anyway. Click rattled off a convoluted message of clicks I couldn't understand and stepped back. Maybe the sudden guttural reaction was an exclamation that didn't translate into words. Roshan chuckled. You're right, I will. How silly of me. Maybe you're not so silly. You can serve mana if I preserve myself. Someone or something could sneak up on us and catch us unaware. So it seems a good instinct to warn me. Roshan smiled. Tugging hard and removing my other hand from the pressure plate, I was able to keep the spikes exposed. I gripped the spike with my second hand to gain leverage and yanked harder. The whole pressure plate jostled, revealing a raised edge closest to me. I gently released one hand and stretched it over the trap. Hand me your knife. What? Oh. She swept aside her robe, but I focused on the spike in my grasp. When the handle slipped into my hand, I slid it into the newly revealed edge. I didn't want to break the blade, so I jimmied just a little bit at a time, raising the plate until I held its edge in my grasp. The knife clattered to the floor as I released the spikes and grabbed the plate. I raised the heavy metal, lifting with my legs and not my back, because this was an aura, then flipped the plate over. It slammed to the floor on the other side with a resounding, echoing, uproarious bang that vanquished the silence like a subway train. This time, Roshan jumped. Her head swiveled in all directions. Very subtle, my savior. Surely every dark demon in this place will come to greet us. I feigned bravery, though I knew I'd screwed up. Then we'll just kill them all at once. Or run like our butts are on fire. I reached to one side. Roshan gazed at the offering knife with disdain when I returned it. Staring into the recess of the stone where the plate had been, I spied the flat, metal tips of the triggering mechanisms on both sides and matched them to the round cylinders on the pressure plate's underside. The triggers were shaped like nails with long shafts. When I traced from the head down the shaft to the bottom, I saw the solution. Grasping one of the heads, I yanked it out of the floor and found it slipped out of its slot with ease. I threw it into the hallway, where it rattled into a corner and clanked to a stop. I repeated the process with the other trigger. If it had been a smaller trap that I might have taken with me, I would have bagged it. But this thing was huge. Clumsy. Shuffling to one side in a kind of duck walk, I pushed the plate back to the trap seat. It settled into place with a hollow thunk. When I pressed down on one corner, nothing happened. Through meticulous observation and experimentation, you have learned a new skill. Disable traps. Your disable trap skill is now rank one. There is no resource cost associated with this skill. I pumped my fist in victory, but kept my tone low so as not to rouse any dark occupants. Two skills in ten minutes. Gotta love that. Roshan rolled her eyes and shook her head in derision. Now he's quiet. She stepped past me and into the room. 23. A stone altar dominated the center of the room, leaving only a narrow path between itself and the wall on each side. Its edges were chiseled smooth, and I guessed it weighed tons. My first inclination was to search for bone piles around its perimeter. 
I found none. I wonder how they got it down here. Roshan's robe brushed me as she stepped closer to share my perspective. Hokram inspires the surface of darkness, much as Solara does the light. Whoever moved this wretched rock of sacrifice was motivated by his evil father. She spat harshly to one side. May their soulless bodies rot in the fire of his evil bosom. A copper plate covered in a fine layer of dust sat at the altar's center with two jeweled, stemmed cups set to either side. On each end of the altar stood engraved metal candle holders of gold with painted black lines winding in neat curves around them. I leaned close to the plate and smudged a line in the dust. By the light of my inner illumination skill, I discovered it wasn't copper at all, but gold. Gold ceremonial offering plate. This plate could be of high value. My interface calls it as an offering plate. I wonder if it got passed for coins somewhere, like in church offerings. Roshan scoffed. In this place of darkness. She paced around the altar, then leaned down to inspect the engravings on the candle holders, which turned out to be fake. Hokram's children sacrifice in blood. Without hesitation, I dropped the plate into one of the remaining slots in my bag. Her head tilted sideways. Roshan's eyes followed it to the bag and then shot me a look. What? You think a golden plate is a source of evil that could be dangerous in the wrong hands? No, I suppose not. Perhaps it will help to fund our expeditions in the name of our goddess. One full cheek rose with her half-smile. She was coming around. Ivory. Jewel-encrusted ceremonial chalice. This chalice could be of high value. Click sniffed around a corner on the far side of the room, while I raised one of the chalices closer to my face. Roshan spoke as I eyed a red gem. Would you like me to inspect those jewels? Do you know a lot about gems? You must not have checked my professional skills. I am a level 43 gemologist. It was my primary profession in my village. That seems like a strange way to make a living in a village. She smirked. I might be offended if your words weren't so true. There were several mines in the mountains near my home. We traded with convoys who traversed the mountain en route to the seat of the eastern kingdom of Lao. We have a rich tradition of mining passed down through many generations. Sounds like you have the market cornered. She stared at me, working something out in her head. Ah, you mean a market found nowhere else with a unique product for barter, right? Yes. You really should learn to speak plainly, Gemini. Her gaze fell on the jeweled cup, but seemed to peer through it. My master taught me to quiet my mind by harvesting crystals and gems. Wait, powers? Can we socket these gems into weapons and gear? Grasping the ivory cup by its stem, she turned it in her hand. Oh my, yes. Mmm. These are gems of the very finest quality. I also detect no curses. Well, that's a good start. I smiled, but she didn't turn her attention from her analysis. I would need a focusing lens or to observe them in daylight, but I detect no flaws. She held the chalice out. Perhaps you should keep one for yourself. I grinned. She waved it away. You are too generous. Pressing a hand of splayed fingers to her chest, she bowed her head for a second. It is you who has saved me from the jaws of slavery. I cocked my head forward. Well, that doesn't mean I'll keep all the loot for myself. Have I upset you? I rolled my eyes, set my jaw, and lowered my tone. I can hardly be upset by generosity. But what happens if you decide not to hitch your horse to my wagon, long term? Ah! She barked, holding up a finger. This expression I understand. Her lips peeled into a smile, but it didn't reveal her teeth. Very witty. I have no horse, only a seat on your wagon, Gemini. Besides, she continued, even were I to accept this gift, I have no bag. Then I'll hold on to it for you. My bag is your bag, Roshan. Her facial muscles relaxed her high cheekbones dropping just a tad. She studied the stony floor. After a long, awkward silence, I asked, 
Is something wrong? When Roshan raised her head, her expression caused me to step forward, a hand extended. What is it? Are you well? She spoke low, her head subtly shaking as she stared at the floor. I long not for riches and treasures. I seek fulfillment of a higher purpose. Her eyebrows arched. She raised her chin, grasped my shoulders to straighten me, then set a gentle hand on my chest. I am not simple. It's apparent to me that this is all very strange to you, that some female just a few years into her womanhood would bind herself so willingly to you, so quickly. In a way, this confusion reflects your true heart, that you expect so little in return for your heroism. Her fingernails scratched lightly at my chest as if she was flexing the tendons in her hand to loosen them. But my life is my own, as you have said. I nodded in agreement. Her gaze became stern. I am not finished. I nodded for her to continue. You should recognize the giving of myself and my various attributes to your cause for the gift it is and deem yourself worthy of it, as well as trust I am capable of making an informed decision. Since my life is my own, it is mine to give to your purpose and to those who share it. I sense the light in you, Gemini. I shared it with you. She tipped over the chalice and it rolled into a half circle before settling. I cringed, but she didn't seem to notice, nor didn't care. Even if it is sudden, even if you find my offer of companionship strange, I hope you can intuit the value I place on you and, in turn, value me, too. So I ask you, Gemini, will you still care for me when we leave this dark place and venture beyond the forest above? My throat felt like it would close completely as the depth of her meaning hit home. Those Sienna eyes showed no evidence of computer generation. Rather, I found a conscientious soul, a woman of depth gifted with sentience and intelligence beyond computational algorithms. Enora was my chance to live my life in a world where honor still had meaning, and Roshan was a golden reflection of that ideal shining in my face. I'll value your companionship for as long as it's mine. Roshan nodded, and a tear formed in one eye. Will you see me fed? Will I have a place to sleep near your hearth? A home in your village? You have been offered a unique quest, enamored from the east. Earn enamored status with your companion, Roshan. When companions maintained enamored status, they will fight by your side until death. Reward, 1,000 XP. Reward, 750 disposition points with Roshan. Reward, enamored status with Roshan. Will you accept this quest? Yes or no? The quest offer felt like Enora was pushing me to accept something, someone, for all the wrong reasons, when the right reason stood before me, her warm hand gracing my chest. To be urged forward by greed would be in contradiction to living with the honor I'd defined moments before, but I'd still accept the offer. I adopted a slow, formal tone. Roshan, while it would do me a great honor to have you with me wherever I go, are you absolutely certain this is the kind of commitment you desire? I wouldn't pursue a romantic relationship or ask from you that which you would otherwise be unwilling to give but I'll pledge to you a place in my party and a place on my team, as long as you accept we are partners and equals. Gemini, I am not a child, but a woman capable of making my own decisions. It is not purely out of debt I say yes to you. This is my way, the way of my ancestors. I seek to use the gifts blessed upon me by Solara, the gift of manna, the gift of adventuring so darkness might be cleansed from this world. If only one evil minion at a time. My only desire is to bring glory to Solara and the soul she sent to me. She continued nodding, her eyes wet. I accepted the quest and extended my hands, palms up. She took them. Roshan, as long as I have a home and a hearth, so shall you. Our life won't be easy. At times, I'm not the easiest person to be with. But if you journey with me, 
and help me to advance in this world, I promise you'll advance alongside me for as long as you choose. But I demand one promise from you. Roshan sniffled twice and nodded excitedly. Yes, Gemini. You must continue to be your own person. If ever you have an inkling it's time for you to move on, to travel on your own, or to do whatever life calls you to do, you must promise me you will. Follow what Solara dictates first, and never let me impede your way to becoming your best self. I will not want to be the one who keeps you from your destiny. Plus fifty, light affinity. She cupped my cheeks in her hands. Our faces were so close, I spied little flecks of black in her irises. I promise this will never happen, my lord. No more my lord, either. I placed a wet kiss on the tip of her nose, surprising both of us. Then I smiled. She crinkled her nose and rubbed it with furious flicks of her fingers as a grin raised her cheeks. Terrible. You have completed the quest, enamored from the east. You have earned enamored status with your companion, Roshan. Roshan will fight by your side until her death. Reward, 1,000 XP. Reward, 750 disposition points with Roshan. Reward, enamored status with Roshan. A gold light surrounded me and whooshed into the air as if sucked through an invisible funnel. A giant golden six flashed before me as a triumphant orchestra celebrated my advancement. It zoomed off, zipping through Roshan and disappearing into the wall behind her. Roshan stepped back then slapped a hand to her chest. Her chin dropped. Gemini, you have advanced. I've never seen it happen to another. She thrust a finger and punched the air with it. That is Solara's light. I presume she saw me level because she was now my companion, where in the woods earlier she hadn't seen the bit of theatrics. A smile swept across my face at the sight of her natural glow. You have reached level six, plus one to dexterity, plus one to constitution. You have two unspent attribute points. You have learned a new combat skill. Piercing shot adds three to five damage to ranged accuracy. Cost, 15 mana. Cast time, instant, longer draws, use more mana, but cause more damage. Cooldown, 15 seconds. Congratulations, my new companion, Roshan said. Thank you. I even learned a new skill. A boon from Solara. How wonderful. She clapped and bounced on the balls of her feet. Returning to business, I tucked the chalices into my bag. Under the thick layer of dust covering the surfaces of the altar room, Roshan and I found little else of interest. I couldn't help but think it had come too easily. But gift horses, mouths, all that. As we turned toward the exit, Click crossed in front of my feet and nearly tripped me in her desire to give the porcupunk corpse she'd once been a wide berth. That's strange. We ventured back out to the intersection and a strange tickle in my mind turned into a coherent thought. I tapped Roshan's shoulder and smiled. That's why no one heard us. No one comes here. That's why all the dust, right? Roshan thumped my forehead. Beings could still come here and leave dust behind, idiot. My chin dropped and I opened my mouth to protest, then slammed it shut. Which room next? Roshan asked. Her stoic vibrancy was renewed. She was ready to take on whatever this place threw at us. The dust didn't seem so important. As to her question, I wasn't sure. Did the quest Jara had given me call to vanquish all signs of the darkness, or just the root of the darkness? I was about to check when clicking at my feet drew my attention. You have ideas? I asked Click. Click, click. She sped off towards one of the rooms and sniffed at the threshold. Roshan and I shared a quick glance, then fell in behind the porcupunk. The room she picked seemed empty, which made sense since its doorway was blanketed in cobwebs. I thought about challenging Roshan with that bit of supporting evidence that no one came here, but what would be the point? Click scampered to the other side of the room and sniffed around each corner, so we waited. 
I used the lull to learn more about my companion. He mentioned your people suppressed your abilities, but you didn't say why. Because of the Continental War of Lao. Continental? Does news not travel here? It lasted for fifty years. She clicked her tongue and sighed. When King Edmus died of the plague in the era of the fallen moon, his regents warred for the throne and its vast resources. Untold masses died when Arturus the Shadow Warlock, servant of House Markel, cast a summoning spell from a book of dark power. Demons flooded the continent for twenty days and twenty nights, leaving blight and plague in their wake. A spell spoken from a book? An incantation. The spells we cast are different things. Controlled things. Unlike spells from these ancient texts lost for generations to surface only at the worst of times. Evil has a way of shrouding itself, I said. Power is always at the core of its desires. Hey, that was pretty good. She nodded. But the people of my realm didn't distinguish incantations from learned spells, and when the war ended, when final skirmishes carved new boundaries across the kingdom, our new ruler, Warlord Shikan, decreed magic would be banished from his territory. Known casters were rounded up, never to be seen again. Sounds familiar. History is wrought with crusades resulting from religion-induced overreaction. I'm pleased we agree. We do, I confirmed. So this priest took you on as protege, kept it under wraps? It is as you say. My mentor not only shone the light upon me, if you'll forgive my horrible doubling of meanings, but he taught me under penalty of death. Sounds brave. Silence passed between us as her chest rose and fell in deep breaths. I thought I spied a sliver of wetness in the well of one eye. I turned my head away so as not to make her uncomfortable. She broke the silence with two quiet words. Very brave. The politics of this world sounded chillingly similar to the outside one. Maybe I hadn't been made to struggle to survive in the world of my birth, and that was a notable difference. But as I absorbed her story, the feeling that Honora was as much a reality as my prior life solidified. After all, I lived here. It seems your pet found nothing, she said, raising my head. I spied the animal with the strange black flesh hairs as it rounded the corner from the room and scurried up the hall to sniff out the next. I'm just glad she didn't find a spike trap. Roshan snorted a laugh just as Click reached the threshold, stopped, took a couple of steps backward, and emitted a low growl that caused the hairs on the back of my neck to stand up. Shrugging my bow off my shoulder, I stepped forward. What you got, girl? Stepping cautiously toward the open doorway, I tried to steady my quivering bow. My silver-toothed weapon stood next to me, ready to launch if I commanded it, and I was backed by a light priestess. Then I realized the trembling was born of my excitement at what might wait around that corner. I'd take enthusiasm over dread any day. I peered around the corner, my hands steady. Black chains with dangling iron wrist restraints hung from thick bolts set into the stone about four feet off the ground. Ancient brown blood stains painted the wall beneath, all five sets of chains, trailing down to a rusted gutter that once drained at the far end of the room. A rectangular space hollowed out of the left wall was covered in black soot and piled with gray ashes. Roshan seethed with disdain. They tortured and cremated their victims here. I don't know how I missed this before. Missed what? She shook her head as she peered into the crematorium. Whatever force now dominates this tomb simply passed through an inviting door. She pointed toward the back wall and enunciated each word. Evil has endured, and more than one dark master has been drawn to this venomous place. You're saying more than one set of bad guys has taken up residence here? Roshan smirked, then her lips parted and the tip of her tongue rested on her bottom teeth. Is this not what I said? I measured my response before speaking. You speak with such eloquence. 
I'm accustomed to such brilliant usage and find myself overcome. Ha! Roshan barked. Stifle your flattery, fool. I'm not so easily pacified. She was epic. And maybe a little bipolar. Stepping across the room to where the gutter emptied, my footfalls made soft swishes like cloth against cloth. Above the rusted drain hung a simple wooden frame devoid of picture or painting. It seemed only to encapsulate a section of drab wall. Brushing the surface inside the frame with my fingertips, I sensed only cool stone. Many lives were consumed by darkness here. Roshan's breath tickled my ear. I started. It would be wonderful if you didn't sneak up on me like that. I willed my nerves to calm. And you kind of said that already. Warm hands, entirely too warm considering the chilly subterranean environment, clutched my shoulders and massaged. You are tense, Gemini. Practice digits rubbed all the right spots, forcing the tension from my shoulders when I wouldn't have thought it possible. Her voice soothed me, creeping into my ears and passing warmth as if heating my blood vessels. Tense muscles are inaccurate. In my childhood studies of music, my lute master's first lesson focused on the practice of relaxing my muscles and pushing all tension from my body before I set fingers to strings. From this lesson, you could learn more accuracy with your bow. Perhaps you will even live longer. I'm in an underground dungeon built on the bones of its prior occupants by a dark force who raises undead minions to fight for it. Of course I'm tense. The question is why aren't you? Have you ventured into such places before? Her hands gripped and twisted my shoulders, turning me to face her. Her facial muscles were slack. Her shoulders dropped low and drawn back in stoic posture. Oversized irises glared as if a faint light source gleamed behind them. My only adventure was being kidnapped and dragged across continents to this place, but for the cycles of many moons did I study the light under my master. He persevered in his studies despite being forced to shroud his practices of the faith. I am one with Solara's awesome power because he instilled her values in me. Take heart in the light, take comfort in my presence, and know I shall not let you fall, my companion. She embraced me. Okay, okay. She drew away and tugged her robe straight. This is a place of darkness. But you are in the presence of a warrior of the light. All will be well. Holcrum's devious hooks will find no purchase in our hearts. There was that name again. Who is Holcrum? Roshan jerked and pulled back, holding me at arm's length. How is it you could not know the seed of evil? We all have our own images of his evil, I said. You know... People paint the devil in many forms. Her chin ticked up as she dropped her arms. We need only know our calling is to let his minions fall beneath our feet. I hope you're right. Doubt is for the ignorant, but I will forgive this since you are but a noob. Noob? I laughed. Yes, noob. Do you not know the expression? It is the short form of a word in my language used to describe someone who has yet to experience advancement. A virgin of sorts. A... I waved a dismissive hand, still chuckling. No, I know what it means, I just... Ah, oh, visitors. A deep male voice growled behind me. 24. I flinched and raised my bow as I swung around. But Roshan's turn resembled a slow spinning display stand, like she expected this turn of events. My new friend is stone cold. The cool rock wall inside the simple wooden frame was awash in black fog clinging to the smooth surface. A spiral of purple smoke swirled in the center. Set in the swirl were the curves of a human face. A goatee of black whiskers snaked around thin black lips. The eyes were voids where irises should have been. Though the entity's tone was low, it conveyed hospitality. Welcome to my underground sanctuary. I am Kroll, dark mage of the Ubra, servant of Underlord Kame. The smoky head peered at us in turn. You are? 
though I parted my lips to speak. It was Roshan's voice that boomed in the space and echoed off the walls. I am come to exorcise a demon named Kroll. Interesting, Kroll replied through his tone, implying boredom. Unnecessary theatrics. The dark head leaned forward and away from the wall, crossing the threshold of the frame and homing in on Roshan. The cords in its neck were stationary wisps of black smoke as it stretched to within inches of her face. The light priestess didn't so much as inch backward. Click uttered a guttural growl and clicked incessantly as the visage considered Roshan. Its head tilted down and up again, scanning her form in its entirety. You are a beautiful creature. Tell me, from where did you hail? When she didn't answer, he prattled on. From the east. La, no doubt. Hmm. I have not seen the likes of you but in illustrations. Before she could answer, the creepy head reeled back and turned toward me. Is this your minion, priestess? Does he talk, or have you trained him to be so passive? Time to wax a little roleplay, Roshan style. I lowered my voice an octave. I am Gemini, wielder of the light, and I come in service to the matron of the wood, Jara, to rid her home of your dark ways, demon. Roshan rolled her eyes. What? I asked her. No good? She smirked at me in response, as if the framed head wasn't even there. I muttered. I thought it was okay. The framed head tilted back as the voice echoing through the room boomed with boisterous laughter. It went on for about five seconds, but the creeping chill in the room made it seem longer. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, Gemini, thank you. I've not heard such protestation since the last servant of the light trespassed here. Of course, that was before I chained him to the wall behind you and drained his life force for my master's slaves to feed upon. The image's purplish, black, smoky lips curved outward as he clicked his tongue at me. I'm afraid your matron of the wood has misinformed you, boy. Oh, it's boy now. My essence does not intrude into the woods above. My master's living minions dig into the ground below. I have no need of the resources of the wood. Of course it's not your fault you were lied to. You are but a... The eyes glowed purple around their black centers. A level six. The guardian sent a level six to dispatch me? The head wasn't laughing anymore. Pompous disdain drooled from the projection's lips as he admonished me. Let me tell you something, boy. I'd actually planned to let you leave unhindered, but now that I see the utter disrespect your benefactor has imposed on me, I've reconsidered. He huffed. I honestly don't know what she saw in you. The head turned and its lips pursed. Or in you, priestess. But now that you're here, what say you? Shall we serve out our destinies? Now the demon spawn speaks my language, Roshan said. Tell me where you are, Cretan, and let us proceed. Do you hear this, Priya? Kroll asked. I glanced at the doorway and found it empty. Whoever he addressed must have been on his side of the conversation. Yes, master. The croaking feminine voice was doubled by a low growl. It caused my skin to crawl as it projected through the frame. At least she is beautiful, even if she doesn't know her place. What do you think, Priya? Would you like to have a sister? Yes, master. Well then, go and get her. Click made a sound I hadn't heard previously. It was akin to the barking of a very large dog and I was taken aback to hear it emitting from her tiny mouth. When I turned, I'd expected to see a larger animal, only to find my little buddy growling up at the doorway, where a sword floated above her. Its pommel bounced in a rhythmic dance as it turned to reveal its breadth. That's new. Kill the fool and his beast, 
then bring me the holy woman. Disable her if you must, but do not kill her. I turned my head to give a snippy response, but the phantom had vanished. And the last trails of purple smoke and the black canvas spiraled toward the center of the gray wall until it disappeared, like a flushing demon toilet. The room grew five degrees warmer with his departure, but I still had the chills as my attention turned to the dancing weapon. Floating Falchion Level 8 Enchanted Sword Enchanted weapons are guardians given life by shadow magic. This should be fun, I said as I shouldered my bow and yanked out my rapier. Yes, this should be entertaining, Roshan agreed. I am pleased to see you are beginning to relax. I was being a smartass. Roshan glanced toward my backside with a slanted expression. I do not un... The Falchion tilted forward, flew over click and lowered its point aiming to spear me. Sidestepping easily, thanks to a high dexterity rating for my level, I parried the sword into the wall. In all the thousands of hours I'd spent gaming in virtual environments, never had I encountered a weapon without a wielder, so the success of my reaction caused me to celebrate internally for a moment as the blade reoriented itself. Nice move, Roshan bellowed laughter. The reaction struck me as a bit strong, kind of weird. Thanks. The pommel of my enchanted enemy sliced downward and away in an attempt to cut a curve through the top of my skull. Bending my back, I swept my rapier up and sparks flew as metal screeched against metal. Shoving my arms forward caused it to backflip, but it steadied and held its position just a few feet away, its blade hovering slowly to the left and then the right. I'd been contemplating how easy it had been to deflect and flip the Felchian indicating a low strength rating, assuming it had such a thing, when it zipped through the air toward Roshan, catching me off guard. I countered, stepping toward my new friend and swinging my sword in a descending arc, but the enemy blade twisted in the air, sped toward the open flare in her robe, and speared her thigh. My heart thumped and my jaw tightened as blood geysered from the wound. The sword retreated, preparing a follow-up attack as Roshan fell. It sliced the air toward her leg again, obviously trying to obey its master's order not to kill her, but I arrived just in time to deflect with my sword and pin its pommel to the wall. It slipped under my rapier and zipped to one side. In short strokes, I swung from my right and my left, beating it back toward the door. Then I changed angles and tore through the air in another high to low arc, slamming my blade into its pommel. The downward force knocked it to the ground near click. Attack! I yelled. Click launched and gripped the pommel between her teeth. The sword jerked upward, over and over, trying to break the porcupunk's grip. But each time it reared up, lifting Click's legs from the floor, my pet's weight yanked the weapon back to the stone surface, providing my theory about its limited power. I charged toward the pair, then sidestepped as the blade oriented its tip toward me. If it wasn't strong enough to lift the porcupunk, it had no chance against a grown-ass man. Grabbing the pommel's cold grip, I pulled the sword into the air. Click didn't let go, so she came off the ground with the sword, almost causing me to lose my grip. Let go! Click dropped to the ground and yipped up at the sword, jumping around on her hind legs in a furious dance. The sword twisted and revolved in my grip, trying to pry itself loose, so I gripped it with both hands. Now what? I wondered to myself. I turned to find a thick stream of fresh blood rolling down the slanted floor toward the drain. An expression of pain stretching her features pissed me off, and I gripped the pommel tighter as I kicked her scepter over to her. When she raised it, the stone at its apex burst with light. The blade in my hand sang an angry song in a single metallic note as it began to shudder in my grip. Struggling, I set the tip on the stone floor, thrust my foot onto the blade, then yanked upward on the pommel. The metal snapped in two with a satisfying crack, and a brilliant flash filled the room. I tossed aside the pommel. A prompt popped up, but I ignored it and rushed to Roshan's aid. But my companion was already getting to her feet. Bending to sweep aside the lower flaps of her open robe, 
she shoved the remaining pool of blood down her leg. The unwounded skin beneath took me by surprise as she raised her head, thrust her arms in the air, and smiled. Gemini, I have leveled. The flash had come from her body. Level nine. Congrat. She crashed into me and flung her arms around my neck. My breath caught in my chest. Oh, Gemini, not since I was sixteen years have I advanced, yet I have leveled up after only hours with you. Had I known it was so easy, why, perhaps I would have fled home long ago. Loosening her grip and drawing her head away, she gazed into my eyes. Her cheeks glowed and she glared stoically into my eyes. We are destiny. My head cocked back, an eyebrow ticked up before I could suppress it. Her expression softened. The curved lines beneath her cheeks faded with her smile. I'm sorry, Gemini. I don't know what came over me. Despite our dark surroundings, my advancement has left me so happy. The dark voice in my mind had questions. What will I do if I lose her? What if I've sealed her fate by bringing her into this? Then, out of nowhere, Caitlin's voice echoed in my head. Why are you thinking about her like she's a real person? That question bit hard, but I bit back. Roshan was real to this world, and now I was a part of this world, too. She wasn't an error in judgment, but a stroke of luck. Her belief that Solara brought us together might not shoot so far from the mark, seeing as Enora was probably Solara. Enora created the legacy quest that took me to Roshan, hanging this opportunity within my grasp. My mind flashed to Caitlin standing over my bed at the secret compound in Nevada while Nokuru asked me if I was ready to face the biggest adventure of my life. Those weren't the words of someone who expected me to leave my life behind. Those were the excitations of a man looking forward. My crossing had been the end of Gemini Fowler in the physical realm. My beginning, this beginning, happened upon waking in Enora. I could make my own decisions and live by my own rules. Why are you thinking about her like she's a real person? Because we're both binary. Same ones. Same zeros. I chose this, and I wasn't going to let the dark side of my mind use Caitlin's voice to fill me with doubt. Caitlin wouldn't be asking why I thought of Roshan as a real person. She'd ask what I was standing around for. She'd be barking orders. Move your ass. Kill anything that gets in your way. Use every sense. Be methodical, be hardcore. I needed to focus on what I'd done right. Set aside worries over what was past and what was to come, and live in the moment. As I peered at my companions, I knew I'd asked Lucera the right question when I asked how to survive until level 10, and I was pretty sure she'd given me the correct answer. Make friends. Roshan clutched my hand and held it tightly against her. Thank you. You've given me direction. I now see the path that has been intended for me all along. This is what I mean when I say that we are destiny. Then she pushed my hand away and pressed it to my own chest as if I needed help taking it back. We will snub out any minions who oppose us. I liked where this was going. She bent down to retrieve her scepter. Then she rose, straightening her robe with a tug, and gave me a slow up and down gander. Her voice resumed its commanding tone, her stoic expression returned, and her arm shot out with a long, straight finger pointing toward the hallway. Why do you stand around? It is evil to vanquish. Go forth, noob. 25. Make friends indeed. We found Click waiting at the four-way intersection when I stormed out rapier in hand and itching to murder any dark being in the place with the bad judgment to cross my path. <coughs> no thanks, little buddy. I snapped without so much as a glance down. I'll take the lead this time. Returning to the north-south passage we'd followed since I'd tumbled down the stairs into this dank, cold, smelly hole, I marched up the hallway with my bow slung across my back and an attitude that only melee would quell. Bring your best, dark boy. Eyes peeled for any traps that might appear, 
It occurred to me that at such a low level, I might not spot them. And if I did, I wasn't sure how they'd appear. Would they have a green glow? I spied a final empty room on the right and didn't bother stopping to investigate. We all had to sleep at some point, thanks to Nora, and the smoky apparition framed in that wall had given me a target to finish this thing. My quest log confirmed it. Bring light where there is darkness. Recommended level, 8. Objective, find and mitigate the source of evil dwelling beneath the earth of the dark wood. You have identified the source of the dark presence. Kroll, the dark caster and minion of a demon underlord is tunneling beneath the dark wood. New objective, eliminate Kroll's influence. Reward, increased reputation with Jara. Unknown reward, 4,000 XP. Do you want to inspect that room we just passed? Roshan asked. I spoke my thoughts out loud. We'll have the rest of our lives to explore empty rooms. No more tricks. No more fear. Fear gets people killed. I'm done reacting to what comes, and ready to be the inciter of trouble for this dark dong. We plow ahead until we find Kroll, and anything that gets in our way dies. I threw her a quick glare over my shoulder. You and I are going to take this world by the short hairs. You have a certain confidence in your step now, Gemini. Roshan mocked from behind. You seem ferocious. I found myself powerless to suppress the smile snaking across my lips. It was no surprise I was being led around by my ego, in a sense. But truth be told, it was just an excuse to finally quiet the dark voice in my mind that had driven me to make bad decisions. Roshan's motivation was little more than a nudge onto a path I should have already followed. Can you sense the dark bastard, or is it just me thinking it's getting colder the further we go up this stupid hallway? Your instincts are strong, adventurer. He's somewhere ahead, though I can't be sure how far. Did you spend your attribute points? What? I stopped and turned. Your attribute points? Were you rewarded points when you leveled? She glared at me in confusion. Remembering the prompt I'd ignored after snapping the magic falchion off at the hilt, I stopped in the middle of the hallway and focused on it. Roshan has reached level 9, plus 1 intelligence, plus 1 constitution. Roshan has learned the spell, flash heal, level 8, affinity required, light magic, instantly heals, 50 to 79 HP, cost, 45 mana. Since your companion has a disposition of friendly or better, you are granted two attribute points to spend on her behalf. Bonus. Roshan's disposition with you is endeared. You are awarded two bonus attribute points to be spent on this companion, one per disposition rank above neutral. Companion attribute points can be assigned at any time. Two bonus attribute points to spend on her. That's maze. Wait. I spend her points? Um, Roshan. She nodded so quickly, I got the impression she'd been watching me intently as I read the prompt. Yes. Wait, how do I explain this? If she doesn't know about attributes, it might confuse her that I can spend them for her. But judging from the attributes I'd seen earlier on her pain on my companion's tab, they'd been assigned before. The evidence was that she didn't have a bunch of ones. She stared at me expectantly. It seems like you have learned a new healing spell. What? She blinked, squinted. I haven't leveled in so long, I missed it. Her lips separated slightly as her eyes scanned left to right. She set two fingers over her lips in an excited gesture I was coming to love. Her enthusiasm lit the place up, but mixed with her commanding stoicism, it made me a little dizzy. I can instantly heal for 50 hit points at a cost of 45 mana. I must try this new ability. If you can contain your excitement, hold off for now. Enthusiasm is cool right up until you feel the sword shoved up your precious backside. Let's not be stupid, okay? As soon as the onslaught of manure had escaped my lips, I knew I'd really stunk the place up. I'd reverted to the old Gemini Fowler, the guy who played L.O.B., 
the guy who threw words like stupid around with Caitlin because we had a comfortable familiarity, plus a tendency to cut through the BS during game strategizing. But Roshan was not Caitlin, and I realized the encouragement I'd been feeling for the last couple minutes had been the product of their similarities. I started defending myself to myself. It was innocent. I hadn't intended to sound like a tool. I almost winced as I peered slowly up Roshan's form, fearing the scorn I'd find when I got to her face. But her head tilted to one side when my gaze finally reached her eyes, and when I didn't speak, she raised her eyebrows in expectation. You were saying? Oh, thank the gods. A woman back home might not have taken what I'd said as intended, but Roshan, well, she was kind of awesome. Oh, right. Um, what was I saying? Roshan threw up a hand derisively. Sweet Solara, the man cannot keep a coherent thought in his head for more than a few seconds without getting lost in my cleavage. She waved her hands between us in furious waves. Focus, adventurer. I wasn't even looking at... Her lips pressed together, and one of her very expressive pencil-thin eyebrows shot up. You will deny you take pleasure in the sight of my bosom? I sighed, then lied. Okay, you got me. It was simpler. At least you are honest. Now you have recovered your thought from that busy mind of yours? Yes, ma'am. I threw in a half bow. We were talking about your ill-advised intent to use your new healing spell. I'm sure you'll skill up as you use it, but healing for a quarter of my entire health pool also costs you a chunk of mana. As you well know by now, that takes a time to regenerate. And as we said when we disabled the trap, I wouldn't want to be caught off guard. You only have to come up one cast short, and the whole show is over. Something tells me the chill in the air means this dark dude could be close, and I don't want to give him a free swing at my jaw. Hence the sword in your precious behind comment. She smiled and nodded. Agreed. We will be frugal with my mana pool. Cool. I need you and Click to stand alert for just a few minutes. I think I have a gift for you. I squinted dramatically to let her know I was checking my HUD. A gift? Both of her eyebrows raised into a perfect arch. I require no reward, Gemini. You are my gift. I like cheese, but geez. Consider it a blessing from Solara. Actually, I'm pretty sure I can say in good conscience it is exactly such a thing. Roshan nodded. It fills my heart with delight to hear you embrace the goddess, but... But you could care less about a gift from me, right? You use words in strange ways, noob. Roshan had this spicy undertone thing going. Zap. Snark. Bam. I had a sense for this particular category of vocal intonation. But spoken through Roshan's accent, snarky was like listening to classical. More importantly... She'd set a natural pause right in the middle of the conversation. I used it. Roshan, human, level nine light priestess, strength, four, dexterity, four, intelligence, 16, wisdom, nine, constitution, 11, charisma, 14. Roshan has four unspent attribute points available. Asterix equals points earned through life actions. I focused on the final line. People in Anora increase their attributes through repetitive life activities. For example, laborers who carry heavy loads will gain strength and foot messengers increase their stamina pools. Usually, I'd set up a caster with wisdom and intelligence to keep damage and mana regeneration up. The needs for constitution was a distant third, because tanks were supposed to keep casters safe. Less damage taken equaled fewer hit points required. You know, like rocket science. But Roshan's numbers were an interesting mix. She has the high intelligence for casting power, but the wisdom falls behind constitution, giving preference to hit points over regeneration. I poked the air as if I could tap the text with my finger. That is exactly the kind of thing someone who wanted to keep her safe would do. Add hit points for protection. More mana to be able to cast a decent number of times. 
while sacrificing spell fuel regeneration. Might her priest have been considered a companion even though he'd been an NPC and not a player? Had he assigned her attributes without her knowledge? I stopped musing and calculated. Her health multiplier is lower. If she gets 100 HP for her first point in constitution, then she's only getting 8 hit points for each additional constitution point. She might have gotten 80 for the first point. I'll watch. Since intellect also determined the size of her mana pool, I spent three of Roshan's four points in this primary skill. I put the other one into wisdom to increase the rate at which she would regain mana. Of course, I don't have a tank either, I muttered. Would you like to confirm these skill expenditures? Throwing a quick glance at Roshan, I confirmed them. The mage tilted on her heels and blinked. A subtle white aura surrounded her then vanished as quickly as it had come. Her eyes widened and she glared back at me. Did you sense something just then? I asked. It was as if I was filled with the light. Her eyes flicked up and to one side. My mana is regenerating, yet I cast nothing. I remember once with Master Mitwa, he brought guests. I allowed for a long pause in case she wanted to continue, but her lips remained sealed. I increased your intelligence attribute. Your mana pool just grew, as did your casting power and the rate at which you regenerate mana. Her mouth gaped. How is it that you have this power? This power to change me? I found myself loving the answer to her query as I delivered it. Actually, it's because you like me. Because I... She pressed a hand to her chest. You are... I... Guess you're glad you hitched your trailer to my truck, huh? Roshan's face contorted. I am confused. This is like my horse and your wagon earlier? I nodded. I'll bet you're glad you have become my companion. Her head bobbed repeatedly. I didn't know it would render such positive outcomes. Now you're a rock star. Her head ticked up. This thing you call a rock star must be fine indeed. She stepped toward me, thrust her arms straight by her side, and clenched her fists. I looked her up and down. Are you about to hug me again? Why, yes. Her face lit as her smile broadened. Yes, I am. After I conducted that little piece of business, I was feeling better about our chances. Our chances. We are now a we. I had a healer who might keep me from the void of death, and in return, she had a protector who would lay waste to anyone who threatened her. Her new spell would instantly heal about 25% of my health, and her current pool of 190 mana would allow four casts of the new spell without counting for in-combat regeneration. I also had a pet I shouldn't forget. Judging from the interface, Click leveled as I did, and her points were automatically distributed. That little girl had already proven very useful, but I sensed her need to find an enemy she could sink her teeth into. Skeletons and dancing swords weren't exactly the best uses of those strange silvery fangs. When we set off down the hallway, Roshan paced beside me like she was floating on a cloud. I recalled the dark man's mention of his living minions, the ones expanding his master's subterranean domain. I wondered exactly what that meant and why'd they do it. But the more pressing matter was their likely acclimatization to the dark. Though her green and yellow robe might have made for a decent daytime camouflage out in the woods, it stood out like a sore thumb in the dingy gray of the hallway and the light of my inner illumination spell. If our enemies had similar abilities to see down there, maybe we could use that against them. Focusing on the icon for inner illumination, I disabled it and asked Roshan to recast outer illumination. There's no further point in hiding anyway. The dark man knew we were here and coming for him. The light from the overhead spell would give me better visibility and might even partially blind our competition. As we paced along the corridor heading north, a tensing in my quads told me we'd started a gradual descent. I considered how I'd engage our next enemies if they showed up in the hallway, and finally remembered the troubles I'd had reaching arrows in my quiver. 
I shrugged it off and wrapped the ties around my waist so the container bounced just behind my left hip. Once it was tightened down, I reached across a few times and pulled at the shafts. The motion was so natural, I didn't even care if I looked strange. And Aura wasn't one of those games. It's colder. We're getting closer. Roshan nodded. She raised a hand and swept it up to one side. Then the light blinked out. Darkness ensued. I stopped to ask what she was doing, but then a subtle light shone from the round glass atop her scepter. Slowly increasing in intensity, the mage's weapon cast a sliver of white light like a laser down the center of the tunnel, illuminating the way ahead with a focused beam. Genius. Ready your weapons, adventurer. She eyed my shoulder. Perhaps your bow at first. And a mind reader as well. How can you tell? Is the light helping you sense them? She tapped her ear with one finger. I spent many years in the mines of Aniqua. I could hear a rat scamper and a rock slide. Roshan pursed her lips and cocked her chin toward the hallway. Rat scamper. As our descent became more obvious, the stone floor ahead transitioned to brown, mud-packed earth in a six-inch drop. We stopped at the end of the floor with our toes dangling off the edge of the stone. Roshan lowered her scepter so the beam pointed at our feet and squinted into the inky blackness ahead. Do you see it? She asked. I squinted, peering down the tunnel and waiting for my eyes to adjust. I can't see anything without the... Two dim green lights hovered in the distance. They were so subtle at first, I wondered if they were mere echoes of the scepter's light painted on my corneas. But then, they grew in intensity and size as they floated silently up and down. Eyes. Someone walking toward us. The scepter ignited, firing its focused white beam down the tunnel, revealing the source of the green lights. A short figure in a black robe strode toward us. Curling strands of blonde hair erupted from the dark hood, pulled up and over her forehead. Something about the way the robe hung stiff on her form seemed all wrong. My attention was diverted by a hollow sensation boring into the center of my chest and eating outward toward my extremities as I peered into those glowing eyes. My knees began to quiver as the figure raised its hands. I am Priya. My master awaits you. Two distinct voices came from her. One the deep throaty growl of something inhuman, the other the quiet monotone of a woman. The sound sent a dark chill down my spine. Click greeted the newcomer with a series of rolling warning clicks that transitioned to a low growl. A minion possessed by the dark man's magic, Roshan warned. She acts not of her own will, but in service to her master. I have only heard legends of such darkness, but I sense two beings in this form. What gave it away? The two voices, maybe? Roshan ignored me. She is his conduit. He hears each word. Priya's dual voice is reported. Soon you will bend to his will as have I, priestess. When our work here is done... We will revel in the glory of serving our underlord in his underground kingdom far from here. Her eyes flicked to my side of the tunnel, and when she addressed me, any evidence of the underlying feminine voice was absent, leaving only the growl that clawed at my chest. Turn back, adventurer, and leave this place to her destiny. Once my master has set eyes on a prize, he will not relent until he has it. Withdraw or die where you stand. If I was going to take Enora by storm, this was as good a place and time as any. Yo, what's up, Priya? I'm Jem. This is Rosh. Let's get something straight. Rosh, my companion whispered indignantly. I dislike this. Go with it. I'm about to wax reality on this scourge via his minion. I turned my attention back to the dark woman. I have no interest in causing harm to people who don't act out of their own free will. So how about this? Take me to your master, and we'll just have us a little mano y mano. A little contest to decide who gets what. 
If he's all-powerful and worthy of the priestess, let him prove it. Her head tilted, and the glowing eyes shifted toward the ceiling. She stood silent for a long moment. I wondered if I should repeat myself. My master is entertained by you, weak one. He asked the terms of your contest. I let the weak one piece slide in the interest of expediency. If I win, I take Rosham and you out of this place, curse-free and unpossessed. Additionally, he vacates the premises. A low, booming laughter of which this slight creature couldn't possibly have been the source echoed down the tunnel and rolled back toward us from behind her. The light from Roshan's scepter dimmed for a moment. Raising it in the air, she whispered something, and it gleamed brighter than before. When my master prevails, you will labor with his minions to expand his domain and this lovely eastern creature will bend her knee before him. She didn't wait for response. Your terms are accepted. Follow me. My eyes trailed down the length of her robe, and I analyzed how the garment encircled her like a stone. Falling just short of the muddy floor, its hem formed a perfect, unmoving oval around her ankles. A shimmering purple glow reflected on its felt-like surface, rolling in a line from her shoulder to the middle of her back. So, um, how long have you been with the dark dude? I asked. Roshan answered in her stead. She is not in there. It is him to whom you speak. Oh, well, in that case... I turned my attention back to the dark one. Hey, scumface. Where do you get off enslaving women and using them to do your bidding? I mean, are you that much of a spineless windbag that you... The deep growl replied. I grow tired of your rantings, fool. Seal your lips or I will leave you behind. I leaned closer to Roshan and whispered. What do you think? Can we take him? Roshan's words still projected confidence. The light will guide us through this obstacle. Noob. Roshan stopped. My natural momentum carried me a couple steps further before I ground to a halt on the mud-packed floor. Eyeing the back of the dark figure as she disappeared around a bend, I stepped back. What is it? As I expected. We are betrayed. They have hemmed us in. Turn and prepare for battle. I pivoted. My heart pounded like it was trying to escape through my throat, and its path was being obstructed by my Adam's apple. The sound of sucking mud filled the tunnel behind us. 26. Click turned and snapped at my ankles. Yes, I gestured with my bow in the direction from which we'd come. Check our six. The beast sped off as I whipped around to face the direction I'd last seen the robed figure. A chill coursed down my spine. Rat scamper, Roshan growled. Those green eyes focused on us, and a cross between a sneer and a smile stretched her lips. A void of blackness replaced teeth and gums. Priya waved her hand in a quick circle and a translucent diamond shape appeared before her chest. Her fingertips tapped at center, causing a burst of purple light to blast out from the center. As she completed the cast... The diamond cloned itself again and again until a magic barrier was formed. Roshan, she's casting a shield. They're hemming us in. He is casting through her, Roshan said. This little one does not enjoy this power, except by her master's leave. Yeah, yeah, I get that it's Kroll. She just happens to be the one standing there. I lurched forward and kicked at the barrier. A shock ran from my heel to my knee. I barked through the obstruction. So that's how this works. You make a deal but can't stand the thought of a fair fight? Gemini, Roshan barked. I spun around. Shadowy figures filled the tunnel where it curved into a narrow turn. Stout forms with thick arms, strong chests, and three fingers on each hand ending in fat, black claws. Scotchy, demon fiend, level eight. Roshan's scepter cast a beam of light at the creatures, who raised their arms and stepped back. 
The beasts haunched, their faces framed in pink skin with tendrils crossing their lips. Their bat-like ears were colored the same fleshy pink and were covered in fine hairs. Their torsos were puke green. Click returned to my side and chomped her teeth in a chattering warning to the demon fiends. The dark man's voice erupted from Priya's mouth behind me. Leave the girl for me. Kill the man and his beast. Eat until you are filled. I dared not turn my back on the fiends, but I addressed the dark man through his human conduit. You gave orders like that once before and it didn't go your way. This won't be any different. I'm coming for you, coward. The beasts launched toward us. Leveling my bow at the closest scotchy, I pulled the string to my ear and exhaled. Light filled the tip of the arrow and streamed from tip to fletching in time with my casting bar. When it filled, I released a penetrating shot. The arrow sailed true and split the demon's pink flesh in the narrow space between its right eye and the temple. The creature tumbled backward to the floor, sprawling across the narrow space. As a bonus, its corpse created a bottleneck, forcing its brethren to claw their way over it to pursue us. Not bad. A kill and a disruption to their flow. Eat that, Dark One. My thoughts often intruded at the worst of times. As the bottleneck formed before us, my skill level with bows increased, and the motion became more natural than they would have through simple practice in my old world. Combined with my readier access to the newly positioned quiver, I might soon be a killing machine. Throwing click a mental order to attack, I leveled my bow at the next target, but Roshan raised her scepter and blocked my way. Roshan, a healer's place is in the back, where you have cover, I barked. The scepter flashed in the faces of the oncoming demon beasts, and a thought of gratitude that it hadn't been pointed at me crossed my mind as they raised their arms in unison like synchronized swimmers, to block the light from their sensitive eyes. Text floated above their heads. Blind, 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 blind. Shrieks of anger filled the tunnel as Roshan used the distraction to slip past me and take up a position in a safer spot. Click sank his teeth into the muscular calf of the beast nearest, causing its singular wail to fill the narrow tunnel. My familiarity with my interface allowed me to focus on the small icon beneath Click's health bar on my party interface to activate her bite ability. The porky punk bit harder this time, and the scotchy turned its attention on the animal, converting the porky punk into a tank against the single target, as designed. The remaining beasts screeched and clawed as they struggled to clamber or crawl around each other. They growled with rage. Loosing another arrow, I stepped to one side and reloaded. The arrow ripped into the flesh above the ribs of the scotchy engaging my pet, forcing it to trip and tumble onto its back. The increases in dexterity and repositioned quiver made my attack motions more natural as I loosed each arrow. Click clawed her way up an enemy's form and ripped away green bloody flesh with the violent shake of her head. A hole gaped where the creature's throat had been. She spat it out as if it tasted sour and dug in again as green arms flailed beneath her. Another demon clutched Click's hairs and raised her into the air. Tendrils of flesh stretched like latex away from the doomed scotchy on the floor as Click chomped down and pulled. They tore free when the standing monster slammed her into the wall. Her yip of surprise made me flinch. Teeth grinding, I knocked another arrow and let it sail. It missed. Another scotchy traversed the bottleneck. It lumbered forward, standing inches taller than the others, its shoulders like hard round stones. Scotchy Alpha, level 9 demon. Slamming its own kind against the wall on either side to clear its path, the Alpha stomped on corpses underfoot and closed on me. Dropping my bow, I ripped my rapier out of its scabbard and thrust it forward as it lunged. The tip entered the belly of the oncoming demon bastard, using his momentum against him. Its eyes squinted as it peered down at the sword, but then it raised its head and bellowed. Alpha, huh? You think you scare me? I yelled. Grabbing the sword jutting from its belly, the demon stepped into it, driving the blade deeper into himself and closing the distance between us. 
A rotten stench wafted from its mouth as it sneered. Um, maybe it does. I struggled to pull the blade away, but the alpha's hand gripped the pommel and forced a stalemate as he pushed the last of the blade through himself and bent toward me with his mouth agape. Releasing the pommel now that the blade was fully lodged inside his guts, the alpha grabbed my shoulders and shoved me into the wall. Massive hooked teeth bore toward me from behind the flapping tendrils hanging from his top lip. Jerking my head to the side, I reached for the sheaths in the rear of my armor. I howled as the demon's teeth ripped into the flesh between my shoulder and neck. Scotchy Alpha bites you. Critical hit. Minus 89 HP. 131 HP remaining. Hot crimson flowed down my back and chest as the arm on that side fell limp against my ribs. I tilted my head away just as the Scotchy's teeth clicked beside my ear. The demon lunged to bite again, but as it drew its head back, it screamed and slipped lower on the earthen wall. Having regained her senses, Click growled and twisted her head at the demon's feet, distracting it from sweeping in for a second bite of my flesh that might have ended me. Roshan casts minor heal, plus 14 HP, minus 17 HP bleed, 133 HP remaining. The competing reports of hit point loss and hit point regeneration showed Roshan was propping me up without overcasting and wasting her mana. If not for the pain and eruption of tiny blood geysers from my shoulder, I might have beamed with pride at her efficiency, not to mention her resistance to leading off with the new higher level spell that drained more mana. On the other hand, my HP was draining, and the searing hell had me wanting to pass out, so maybe a flash heal might have rocked. Plus 14 HP. Minus 17 HP bleed. 131 HP remaining. My other hand finally fingered a pommel behind me. Ripping the danger from its sheath, I swung it as the demon made the fatal mistake of reaching down to extract my pet's gnawing teeth from his hip. The blade swept in an upward arc and found purchase right in the center of flesh beneath the demon's chin. I forced it up, through his mouth, and into his brain, making sure to look the bastard in the eye as I twisted and ripped it free with a growl. Die! The alpha tumbled to the mud. My rapier vibrated in its chest as it struck the ground with a heavy thud. Click acquired our next target without hesitation as another burst of warmth surged through me, numbing the pain in my shoulder. Flash heal. Roshan. Plus 64 HP. Minus 9 HP bleed. 186 HP. The pain in my shoulder became a traumatic echo as the wound began to stitch itself together under the influence of healing magic. Man, I loved having a healer. But when I reached around for my other dagger, my shoulder protested with searing pain. So I stepped forward with the weapon I wielded, under-equipped to take on the four other demons I counted but lacking options. So I entered the fray, swinging my dagger wildly, clutching the arm beneath my injured shoulder to my chest. Click ripped flesh from the ankles and calves of the demons. Light continued to flash in the darkness, healing my wounds and keeping me in the fight. My party found a rhythm, and soon the demons were falling around us. The last Scotchy stood before me in the darkness, arms up in submission, cowering away from my blade. I smiled. Too late for that, bud. Bring it. Stepping forward, I feigned left as the demon swung a terrified arm in my direction. As I spun, his arm went wide, and I came around to the end of my revolution, where I slammed the dagger into its temple. Twisting the weapon inside the wound, I really liked doing that. I once again stared into the fading light of a demon's eyes. I like watching you die. I ripped out the dagger and reveled in the flood of blood spurting from the mortal wound. The urge to drop on top of it and stab it over and over fell away as a golden flash of light surrounded me and the bold gold number seven appeared and zipped into the distance. My health and stamina pools filled instantly. When the golden light vanished, we were washed in darkness. Your dark excitations result in a ten-point shift toward darkness.
where all my other notifications popped up only when I clicked the icons. That one printed out in the center of my viewing field and flashed red. Opening my character sheet, I peered at the disposition slider. So far, the notch sat on the right of center, approaching the brighter end of the bar, instead of moving in the direction where it transitioned to blood red at the opposite end. Disposition, light, 317. I focused on my notifications icons just to get them to stop blinking. You killed a Scotchy. Level 7, plus 817 XP, plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. Total reputation, 20. You killed Ascachi. Level 7, plus 764 XP, plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. Total reputation, 40. You killed Ascachi Alpha. Level 8. Plus 881 XP. Plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. Total reputation, 60. You killed Ascachi. Level 7. Plus 713 XP. Plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. Total reputation, 80. You killed Ascachi. Level 7. Plus 709 XP. Total reputation, 100, plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. You killed Ascachi, level 7, plus 674 XP. Total reputation, 120, plus 20 reputation with the matron of the wood. You have changed your class to assassin. There will be a 30 second global cooldown of abilities before assassin skills are available to you. You killed Ascachi. Level 8, plus 771 XP, plus 20, reputation with the matron of the wood. Total reputation, 140. You have reached level 7, plus 1 to dexterity, plus 1 to constitution. You have two new attribute points to spend. You have reached pacify, rank 2. You may now pacify beasts up to level 7. Pacification of beasts above your own level are met with a 10% penalty to success of each level above your own. Pacified beasts of higher level will be adjusted to match your own. My victorious barking echoed down the tunnel. What do you think of that, Kroll? I turned, wearing a wide smile and anticipating Roshan's contagious enthusiasm. I fumbled my dagger as I spied only darkness. Panicked, I cast inner illumination and leaned forward, squinting. Roshan's scepter leaned against the earthen wall, its gem extinguished. A waking nightmare bloomed. My companion was gone. 27. No! I screamed in the darkness as I swept up the scepter. I half expected to slam into the barrier the slave Priya had erected, but it was gone. The minion had removed it to snatch Roshan. There hadn't even been a scream. How could I be so stupid? Sending her back was exactly what they'd wanted me to do. The dark man had seen Click and me fighting off the floating Falcayan with Roshan behind us, healing. He'd counted on our repetition of that tactic. He'd sprung a trap, and I'd fallen right into it. They loaded us into a bottleneck and used it to their advantage. I clutched the scepter and ran my eyes along its intricate metal carvings. You have discovered a new starter class, Light Priest. Great. Apparently learning the class didn't award additional spells. Minor heal would have been nice, especially considering I planned to kill everything that moved in this place with reckless abandon until I had Roshan safely back at my side. I cursed and shoved the scepter into my bag. Wielding both of the simple daggers I'd found in the magic bag of holding, I jogged through the tunnel. Click sniffed the ground a few feet ahead. I tried to keep my speed at a pace where stamina regeneration was equal to the amount I was burning by moving faster than my average gait. But if there was anything I learned in the last 24 hours, it was that there was no balancing it. Sure, I could slow my roll and recover some stamina, but eventually... It drained more than it gave back. 
Two of my attribute points needed assigning before they got auto-assigned, and, if the battle over the rapier lodged in the Scotchy's stomach had taught me anything, it was that strength had its place in combat, even if my class used dexterity for a primary attribute. My role in Honora wouldn't be so simple or single-faceted as it had been an L.O.B. As I jogged through this tunnel, I eyed my constitution, but ultimately dumped the points in strength and forced myself to balance my stamina on my own until I could afford more points. I'd gotten one tick each in dexterity and constitution when I leveled, anyway. In retrospect, strength had been neglected for too long, more lessons learned. Gemini Fowler, human, level 7 assassin, strength 6, dexterity 13, intelligence 1, wisdom 1, constitution 13, charisma 10, HP 220, mana 100. Click pushed forward throwing the occasional glance back at me. I searched the subcommands for my pet. Guard stance. Your pet will respond to danger and assault any threats to you. That was the ticket. I'd be damned if I was going to get caught with my pants down, especially without my healer to aid me. Then, I reconsidered. Aggressive stance. Your pet will attack threats in proximity to you. My hand slipped into my bag and as I focused on the vial in my inventory tab, the healing potion appeared in my hand. If I had to get along without the healer, I'd be ready. But it felt like starting over in the worst of ways. Slipping the vial into my pocket, I eyed my stamina bar and slowed my pace to balance it. My breath evened slowly, but impatience took over. I'd never catch up at this pace. I chewed on half of the final piece of deer jerky for the constitution buff, and slipped the other half into Click's jaws. She took it readily enough, but then she was off again, her nose wrinkling as she sniffed the ground before her, searching for a lost comrade as she smacked on the meat. She rounded a corner ahead of me, then clicked twice. By the time I'd rounded the slight curve, she'd vanished into the darkness. I sprinted forward a few paces. The sound of vicious growling came on the damp air. I stopped and reached for my daggers. A figure swung its hands desperately at its own green barrel chest. My girl had latched onto another demon. I charged forward. The demon balled its fists and pounded them into Click's back, causing the porcupunk's breath to escape in tiny squeals. But she maintained her bite. The scotchy glared up at me, and its mouth widened into a gaping grin. It raised one crooked finger and extended a claw. No. As it swiped down at click, my reflexes took over. Reversing my grip and bending at the elbow, I grasped the blade and threw it as hard as I could. It sailed through the air as the demon's claws raked downward. The blade lodged into his forehead, but not before the demon ripped a gash in click's back. She squealed and tumbled to the packed earth as the demon slid down the wall painting it in blood. Its body fell with a splat on the muddy surface. My heart sank as I watched my porcupunk crawl toward me in a sideways limp. I reached in my sack for a health potion, but then I realized only the one in my pocket remained. Click fell to her belly, and I knelt to check her wound. Gently pressing the fleshy hairs aside, I found the source of the rivers of blood pouring down her back. Two deep claw marks ran the length of her spine from the neck. One of her tiny black paws twitched erratically. As my pet clung to life, I found myself wishing she'd let go. A minute passed and she still struggled. My heart thumped a cold beat and I couldn't watch anymore. I needed to catch Roshan and I needed to end the suffering I knew the animal would remember when I brought it back. I scratched Click's head and nodded gently. I need this potion just in case. I didn't know if she really comprehended the words, but she was always responsive to my commands and sometimes seemed to read my intent. So I went with it, hoping she understood. I'm going to let you sleep for a while. I stood and spread my hands out in a claw. 
As I focused, blue light surrounded my fingers, and they began to tremble. See you soon, babe. Then Click, peering up at me with her black eyelids drooping, slowly faded away into the void. You have dismissed your pet. Your compassion for your animal has resulted in a 20-point shift toward the light disposition. Light, 337. I raised my hand again and attempted to summon Click, hoping she'd be healed by the dismiss process. Because you dismissed this pet, and it didn't die in combat, you must wait ten minutes before summoning it again. At least the effort to summon her spent no mana on the failed attempt. I was trying to look at the bright side. Wrenching my dagger from the demon's head gave a satisfying squeak of metal against its bony skull. I wiped the blood on its flesh. Now that my pet was gone and I knew I was alone, I crept over to the wall and slid back around the bend on the off chance that the dark caster wouldn't see me there. You have entered stealth mode. While I was there, I read the log. You killed a Scotchy. Level 7. Plus 774 XP. Plus 20 reputation with the Matron of the Wood. Total reputation. 160. Your thrown weapon skill has increased to rank 2. My daggers shone clear as day despite each hand's near invisibility. It was a neat touch Honora did that to assist players with hand-eye coordination during combat, but I wasn't feeling appreciative in the moment. I could barely hear my own footsteps. It was hard to imagine how dangerous a higher level than I might be if they had stealth skill rating in the double digits. Making a mental note to practice often and ensure I leveled the skill for times like this, I redirected my focus to the path ahead. I didn't know if I was angrier with Kroll for taking Roshan, with myself for stationing her between the magic barrier and myself. The dark man had outmaneuvered me, but I wasn't about to let the dark side of my brain return to dominate me. Roshan wouldn't want that. The fact was, I wouldn't have been able to fight with her blocking the narrow pathway between me and those demon bastards. A stray arrow might have killed her. Though I knew I was right and belly aching over it now wouldn't do anybody any good, the sentiment delivered little comfort. As I crept along the wall, the path leveled out and rose again. When I climbed the incline, the ground became drier, so my stealth ankle boots made even less noise. A north-south path ended a few minutes later, leaving only a turn to the right up a flight of stairs constructed from dirt. A sliver of light atop the stairs competed with my inner illumination and distorted my field of vision. Climbing slowly, Ensuring only the balls of my feet touched the stairs, I ventured upward. The climb itself revealed the deceptive height of the staircase. It seemed to go on forever, causing my quads to become sore and my stamina bar to tick down a few notches because of my slow, methodical steps. Near the crest of the stairs, I dismissed my inner illumination spell and let my eyes rely on the unknown light source. I stopped a few steps from the top so I could peek over the edge of the landing above. Two creatures stood on either side of the black door. Horns jutted from their jowls and pointed inward so their tips met just beneath their lips. Disparate black hairs meshed in wires around their mouths and chins, covering green skin beneath. I eyed their broad shoulders, blocky biceps, and the makeshift helmets of wood pulled low over their foreheads. Two candles burned on poles on either side of the door. I'd seen enough of these in other games that I hardly even had to inspect them. Half-orc. Level 6. Alignment. Chaotic. You do not understand this being's language. They were one level lower than I was, giving me an advantage. If I'd had a way to check their skills, I'd have focused more on their stats and tried to reason whether they'd be able to see me but like so many other facets of the game, I would learn on the job because Enora gave me exactly nothing in the way of enemy intel. Stepping carefully, I took the last couple of stairs. They faced my direction, but they didn't react to my movement. I might have smiled had I not been so incensed about Roshan's abduction and scared they'd see me before I could get to her. Starting with notifications I'd been ignoring, I flipped through my interface as I ducked on the stairs. 
Your stealth skill has increased to rank 6. Your stealth skill has increased to rank 7. Your stealth skill has increased to rank 8. While this was welcome news, it prompted more questions than it answered. If my skill had risen since I activated my stealth ability, did that mean I advanced in levels the longer I remained hidden? Or did it mean the dark man had been watching me via a spell and failed his checks when I passed through his field of vision undetected? It had seemed that way when I received a point when the man on the beach had passed me by without seeing me earlier in the day. There is no way to know. I was what Roshan called me, a noob. What I needed was a plan. With my eyes just above the level of the landing at the top of the stairs, I scanned for anything I could use to get the guards out of my way. Aside from the guards, the spears they clutched, and candle holders in each corner, the landing was barren stone. As I slipped closer, I noted purple flashes periodically interrupting the white light beneath the door. I shivered against the growing chill and flipped to my offensive skills tab. There I spied the one I'd learned upon discovering my stealth boots and, in turn, the assassin class. Backstab, a vicious attack performed while stealth is active, causing 150% main hand damage. Damage scales with level advancement. Shoving my hand into my bag and accessing my inventory panel, I searched the containers for something useful, perhaps an item plundered from one of the bastards who'd kidnapped Roshan. Ivory chalices. I recalled how Roshan had casually tipped one onto the altar in reflection of her lack of interest in material things. The memory brought both a smile and the determination to see this through. I pulled out one of the cups and crouch-walked up to the landing. Casting my eyes toward each guard one final time, I threw the white, jewel-encrusted cup into the far corner of the landing, where it struck the wall and bounced into the corner. The guards swiveled their heads. The one closest to the chalice grunted something. By his inflection, it sounded like, What the hell? But as my inspection function informed me, I didn't speak half-orc, or orcish, or whatever. As he approached, the others stepped over to the stairs and glanced down. Standing no more than a foot from me, I could smell his unbathed body and it made me want to blow jerky chunks. The pressing concern was that he'd spy me crouching right next to him, so I locked my muscles up tight and waited. Eventually, the stinking thing grunted and muttered something to his companion before moving behind him. Stupid orcs. Bet their intellect rank sucks. Circling it swiftly so as not to lose my advantage, I slipped in behind the half-orc closest to me and used my backstab ability for the first time, hoping upon hope it would work. Critical hit. Mortal wound inflicted. Half-orc. Minus 118 HP. Half-orc dies. Holy crap! The element of surprise is brutal! I felt my enemy's spine separate beneath the slice of my blade, and he squealed as he folded to the ground. When his comrade turned, it was too late. He was dealing with an angry human with two curved blades swinging towards his throat. His tough skin was no match for their sharp edges as I plunged my blades into both sides of his neck with violent stabs until they reached all the way to the hilts. I didn't stop until the two daggers connected in the middle with a metallic scrape. Ripping my daggers from his neck made a sucking noise. I took a step back, steeling myself to attack again if necessary. It wasn't. The orc's wide eyes went dim in death before he even hit the floor. You killed a half-orc, level 6, 718 XP, plus 20 reputation with the Matron of the Wood, total reputation 180. You killed a half-orc, level 6, 703 XP. I scurried over to stand beside the door and pressed my ear against it. Though I couldn't make out the words, it was clear that the voice prattling incessantly on the other side was that of the dark figure who'd spoken to me from the magical wooden frame in the torture room. Kroll. I pressed my ear to the crack. Don't resist, priestess. You'll only prolong your suffering. Oh, hell no, dude. I tried the knob, but the door didn't open. Clutching both my daggers, 
I lunged forward, raised my foot, and slammed the heel next to the handle. 28. The jam splintered and cracked. The door careened and slammed into the wall as I charged into the room. Walls of dull marble framed smooth stone floors seemed so out of place in the underground tunnel system that I did a double take. I'd gone for what SWAT teams in my old world called dynamic entry, expecting I'd launch right at my enemy or enemies, but the scene brought me screeching to a halt. I spied three figures, but my gaze settled on a bald man in a hoodless black robe, clutching a glass ball with swirling purple and black clouds inside. The dark dude looked nothing like his representation in the frame of the torture chamber earlier. Instead of the angular features and a wiry goatee, he was smooth-shaven and chubby-faced. A pair of spectacles hung low on his nose. Though he wore a black robe, his features counteracted any chances of it making him appear ominous. He looked like a nerd. Purple tendrils of smoke crept in long fingers from an orb in his hand into Roshan's nostrils. His head swiveled my way when I crashed through the door. His shoulders jerked back, but he held fast to the globe and continued his cast. Nerd or not, he was up to no good. A much larger frame than before hung high on the far wall. A similar, smoky figure observed the proceedings between Roshan and the dark caster. Its snout was long, reminding me of a gila monster. Two smoky tusks jutted down from the top row of its teeth. Two wide horns jutted out from the sides of its head. I had the distinct suspicion the figure wasn't masking himself as Kroll had. In the corner closest to me, the robed minion we'd encountered in the tunnel glared at the proceedings through those glowing black and green eyes. Her locks of blonde hair shivered like electrified serpents from beneath her dark shroud. Blue veins crept near the surface of her skin around the temples. Roshan's robe hung loosely on her shoulders and was open in the front, revealing her undershorts. You filthy son of a bitch! I growled. Back off, jerkwad! The head in the frame turned toward me as I stepped forward. A booming voice filled the room as its wispy lips parted. You trespass adventurer! Turn back or be destroyed! Well, at least he gets right to the point. No such luck, dude. I thrust a finger toward Roshan. She's with me. The dark figure's face jutted out of the frame, and its snout tilted up and down, surveying my form. Then it turned toward the robed figure. Crawl, your lustful greed consumes you. I sought only to bring you another conduit of magic essence, Lord Kame. I sense the potential for much light in her. Hmm. The face turned toward Roshan, who stood idle under the casting of the spell, the tendrils creeping into her nostrils. Then his focus returned to me. And yet you missed the limitless capsule of duality who stands before you now. Kroll's head swiveled toward me. His dark boss man stared at me through his projection, or whatever the hell it was. And though I'd been ready to launch at Kroll, his boss drew my interest. Why was he looking at me like that? What are you, boy? What is it with people calling me boy? I'll show you, boy, you f- The smoky demon growled. Kroll, you fool! This one carries the blessing of the matron of the wood. Are you blind? It is he you should have taken. He will be a bottomless well of spirit. The beast sighed. Kill the priestess and cast this one into the depths for combat practice to advance him until he can be delivered to me. But my lord, couldn't I? The smoky visage leaned further out of the frame so its snout was inches from Kroll's nose. Your desire to feed your eyes grows tiresome, Kroll. Be thankful I let you keep Priya this long. His smoky visage swirled and expanded again. When it did, his attention returned to me. They have returned. We must prepare. He spat smoke at his underling. Do my bidding or burn. Yes, my lord. 
I will await your portal, my lord. Returned? Who has returned? Don't fail me, crawl. The image vanished, and this time, there is no swirling demon toilet. The smoke vanished in a vacuum. Kroll thrust a finger on his free hand at me and whined like a schoolchild. Priya, don't just stand there sucking up energy. Disable him before he interrupts my cast. Yes, master. In the dimness of the tunnels below, I hadn't quite been able to put my finger on what was strange about this Priya's robe. But now that we stood in the light of the marbled room, the way it surrounded her form like a shell was obvious. It was some kind of mobile cage or hardened shell. The blonde acolyte thrust out her hands. Green light glowed around her fingers as they formed claws. Uh-oh. Time to move. Just as light exploded from her fingertips, I dove and awkwardly rolled forward. An ear-bending explosion of energy slammed into the wall where my head had been. Jara had warned me of this very possibility, that I might face minions under mind control effects. So I dropped my daggers as I dove, rolled to my feet, slammed my shoulder into the acolyte's robe, threw my arms around her, raised her off the ground as I straightened my legs and slammed her back into the wall. <sighs> the dual-toned voice uttered as the impact sucked her wind. Though the robe had appeared to be a shell, it had responded with the consistency of cloth. Priya heaved and blew wind out of her chest in a desperate gasp. As I released the acolyte, she crumbled to the ground with a heavy thump. Her eyes fluttered shut, covering the black void where her eyeballs should have been as she cradled her arms across her midsection and groaned. I threw my arms out to the sides and faced Kroll. Peewee League football, bitch! Then I crouched, launched, and shoved Roshan aside. The tendrils of smoke dissipated and puffed out of existence, though the dark colors continued to swirl inside the small globe. Raising my stealth boots to kick the glass orb from the dark man's grasp, I quickly learned an important lesson. I was not Bruce Lee. It was one thing to play a game from an immersion pod where your thoughts controlled your movements and an accurate kick required little more effort than the firing of some brain synapses. It was another thing entirely to raise one's leg with simulated musculature and strike what could quickly become a moving target. Kroll swung his arm aside at the last moment, spun his body in a nimble gesture I wouldn't have thought possible, and brought the orb around full force to clank against my forehead. The nerd clocks you with an orb. Minus 47 HP. 173 HP remaining. Tiny bright stars danced. My knees faltered, and I dropped to the floor. Arrows spilled from my quiver. The room spun around me as the bald man peered down. You don't seem special to me. I could barely see him as I blinked through rivers of red flooding my face and blinding me. A cut above my eye throbbed. I patted the floor around me for my weapons. My bow was nearby, but as I grasped, the bald man stomped down on the weapon. I swiped away enough blood to find his lips curled in a snarl, revealing rotted teeth. A system of blue veins webbed his entire face as a green aura surrounded his eyes, and he began to cast. Damn, I'd falsify my smoky visage, too. Underlord Kame has deemed you will be his subject. Submit or suffer. Twisting my body to the side, I reared back one leg and swept myself in a circle, bringing my knee up to bump his Achilles and force his foot off my bow. His body thumped to the floor as I swiped hot blood away with my forearm. The cut screamed upon contact. Ah! A warm sensation and a flood of light rushed through me. The mitigation of my pain left me feeling light enough to float. My eyes cleared with a final swipe from my sleeve. A grand sign. Roshan was conscious and casting. Planting my feet, I pushed my butt across the floor, away from the dark dude, who now reminded me of a younger Emperor Palpatine from The Empire Strikes Back. The veins snaking through his face and neck, the paling of his skin, and the slits for eyes indicated some kind of transition to darkness I was certain I should stop. Roshan kneeled in the far corner, close to the gaping door, her hands awash in golden light. 
Expecting another wave of warmth to complete the heel of the gash in my forehead, I was surprised when the light dimmed. She finished the cast, and it did nothing. Is she out of mana already? Why was she able to cast at all? The questions evaporated as the dark man got to his feet and raised the orb in my direction. You will make a good slave for my master, adventurer. As the color mist swirled with the smooth glass, his rotten smile reappeared. Fingers of smoke penetrated the orb and crept toward me. I slid backward, but they chased me, adjusting naturally to their new course. As I spider crawled backward, my palm touched cold metal. I raised a dagger and glanced at it. Then I smiled at Kroll. He frowned, faltered. I grabbed the blade and hurled it. Though I'd aimed for the center of his chest, the dagger lodged where Kroll's shoulder met his arm. Your skill in thrown weapons has increased to three. Kroll, minus thirteen HP. The tendrils, now inches from my face, dissipated as the cast was interrupted. Kroll growled with frustration as he ripped the dagger free and sent it clattering across the floor. Blood spurted, and the dark man clutched his wound. Gah! That hurts! Good, I barked. I grabbed the other dagger and got to my feet. Kroll, minus 21 HP, bleed. Though I spotted movement in the corner of the room as Roshan struggled to her feet, I kept my gaze pinned on Kroll so as not to give her away. A quick perusal of my HUD verified I was currently an assassin and no cooldowns were in effect. But then the fight was taken out of my hands. Roshan pumped her legs and lunged across the floor, diving at the dark man. I cringed as she launched and threw her arms around his neck, dislodging the orb which bounced to the floor and rolled away. My head swiveled with it as it seemed to roll in slow motion against the hard surface. My legs tensed as my hands longed to grasp the dark artifact, but it rolled right into the hand of the blonde minion. Shit. The woman he'd called Priya stood as Roshan and the dark man landed in the corner, their legs and robes a tangled mess. A strange white aura surrounded the bald man's slave as she raised the orb. Roshan sneaked a look over her left shoulder rolled off of Kroll, and crawled backward. The orb breathed back to life and fingers of purple and black wisps trailed across the room. The blonde's disheveled hair blocked my view of her face as it surged with static electricity, but as the tendrils of dark mist crawled through the air, she turned her gaze on me. The greenish-black glow of her pupils was gone, replaced by sea-blue irises surrounded by bloodshot sclera. Dark circles cut the bottoms of her eyelids, but the blue veins threading across her temples were absent and an ivory complexion replaced the sickish gray of earlier. Angular features and high cheekbones resolved in a slightly pointed chin. She was a beautiful creature intent on my destruction. Wait, the smoke isn't moving toward me. No! The bald man howled. Kroll raised his hand, and purple diamond shapes unfolded into a translucent wall before him, the same barrier he'd cast through Priya in the tunnels below. Yeah, I said. Get him, um, Priya. Roshan's jaw relaxed. Her shoulders dropped, then she raised a hand toward me. It glowed as she cast a slow heal to complete the closing of my wound. Then I realized the second cast I thought Roshan had intended for me had been directed at Priya, She'd healed her as she writhed on the floor after my tackle. The creeping fingers reached the magic partition as the blonde turned away from me, apparently satisfied I wouldn't charge her. They slipped through the barrier, constructed of diamond-shaped segments, and into the dark man's nostrils. No! He bellowed. His eyelids fluttered and then closed. You can't! The blonde's inflated robe softened as the purplish, shimmering glow streaking across it faded. It settled on her shoulders and relaxed around her body. Holding the orb high, she shrugged the garment off one shoulder, transferred the orb to her other hand, and shrugged it again so it crumpled to the floor at her feet. Her skin was smooth, the opposite of what I'd imagined when witnessing the dark voids of her eyeballs only moments ago. Honestly, I'd expected dry, cracked lizard skin or something. The meager garment covering her bottom was knotted on one side. 
Nothing covered the powerful legs beneath. Her thick blonde hair danced around her as the orb did its thing. My jaw dropped as golden light filled crevices in her back. No, not crevices. A tattoo of sorts. My heart began to pound at the depiction of an oak with sprawling branches, smooth gray bark, and leaves so green I thought I could pluck them from the branches. Light crawled across the lines of the image until the whole tree began to glow. Then the branches and leaves rustled. Numbness rolled across the skin of my entire body. My heart soared, alight with the vision. I couldn't hold my lips together. The oak's colors filled the room, reflecting off the walls like they were mirrors and forming an outdoor landscape around me. Then I felt the breeze that blew the leaves. The scent of wood wafted into my nostrils, and when I fell back to my elbows, I could have sworn they'd landed in soft grass. All my worries dissolved as the periphery of the room surrounding Priya suddenly faded to black so only the glowing, living art on her back consumed my eyes. There was only love. There was only the tree. What was happening to me? You have been charmed by a ward of Solara. You are pacified. Effect duration until the ward passes from view. Now that she spoke only in her voice, it came in a tiny and melodic pitch. It's your turn to live bound to another's will, you evil, evil man. Then Priya pivoted slowly and pressed her back against the wall. Sterile light flooded back into the room as the effect of the mind-altering art on her back withdrew. Her shining, golden hair dulled in color, and her tattoo cast a glow on the wall behind her. She nodded at me, then turned back to her target. The dark man shot up and lurched forward, fighting every step as his legs quivered. The magical barrier divided and melted away as he passed through. His body swayed unnaturally, as if I were viewing it through rippling water. Then his flesh dulled, and his skin melted into a powdery trail. The remnants of the evil caster were sucked into the orb with a whoosh that seemed to pull the air out of the room. Priya held the orb at eye level and peered inside. Now you will see what it is like to rot in a glass prison and never find slumber. She turned and tossed the orb across the wide room to Roshan. Hold that, would you? Roshan snatched it from the air with one hand. She raised the orb, one side of her top lip twisting in disgust as she peered into the swirling smoke therein. Priya scanned the room, her gaze eventually landing on me. She closed the distance in two steps. Her blue eyes gazed into mine, turned back to Roshan, and then back to me. Her chin dropped. Adventurers. I shrugged a shoulder and threw Roshan a smile while nodding at Priya. How very exciting. Her voice conveyed excitement, but her sleepy eyes told the tale utter exhaustion. I hope you understand. I had to charm you to ensure I completed the sphere's casting. Understandable, I said. As I stood and offered a handshake, I realized that she couldn't have been much more than five feet tall. I smiled down at her, waiting for her to grasp my hand. Then her eyes rolled into the back of her head, and she collapsed into my arms. Whoa! Okay, I've got you. I lowered her head to the floor and pulled her toward me, adjusting my arms so I held her around the waist. Then I glanced at Roshan and shrugged. Her eyes traversed the pair of us and a smile spread her perfect lips. I believe we've made a new friend. I nodded as I eased her down. I think she's out cold. So the question is, what do we do with her? 29. After setting Priya's head to rest on my bag, Roshan and I sat against the wall side by side as I stared at the opening where I'd ruined the door to keep my eyes from the woman's rising and falling minimally covered chest. Roshan squinted at the glass orb in which Kroll was imprisoned. From our vantage point, we could see the doorway in case any of the tunnel laborers Kroll mentioned came up the stairs. Waiting around wasn't ideal, but neither was hauling a half-naked woman through the tunnels. And that was if I made it down the stairs with her. There had to be a hundred of them. You find her attractive, Roshan said. What? I asked, 
swinging my head around. I wasn't even looking at her. I just wonder if she's cold. She smirked. Of course. You hadn't noticed the scantily clad blonde woman with the piercing eyes and full bosom five feet from you. Master Mitwan showed I understood the banal cravings of men. I'm not so easily fooled. That doesn't mean I'm like that. She turned her gaze from the orb. Bah! You lie horribly. Seriously, we should cover her up with something. I pulled off my leather chest piece and covered her heaving bosom with it. We sat like that for about fifteen minutes before Rashan spoke again, though she never looked away from the orb a second time. Such curves, but at the expense of her height. Considering the only other woman I'd met since entering Anora were an extension of the AI named Lucera and a strange being who stood a few inches taller than Priya and lived in a tree, I didn't have a lot to go on when trying to determine norms, so I kept my mouth shut. Are you still hung up on this? You would mate with this one, yes? Roshan asked, catching me off guard. What? No, of course not. Do you find her unattractive? Can we discuss something else? I see I have struck near the bone. You are uncomfortable with my directness. I gave that a moment of consideration. Actually, I find it refreshing, the lack of pretension. It just caught me by surprise. Is that common conversation where you come from? No, but I am with you now. We are to become partners in the war against all that threatens the light. Is there harm in comfortable conversation? Comfortable? I think our definitions of that word differ. Priya chose that moment to stir. She rolled towards us, and her eyes fluttered open. The former minion of Kroll shot up, and the vest dropped to the floor. She made no attempt to cover herself. I gestured at the black robe she'd shrugged off as she captured Kroll in the orb. I didn't think you'd want me to throw that over you while you slept. She rubbed her eyes with both fists. What? She spied the robe and nodded. Oh, yes. You were wise in this, my lord. I'd as soon flay my own skin from the bone as feel the cold grasp of that prison again. Roshan and I rose, and we each offered Priya a hand. Priya accepted both hands and spoke as she rose. Please know I'm horrified at my actions. I was not in control of my own faculties, and my weakness to resist that corrupt enslaver is a source of great embarrassment. She bowed her head. I hope you'll find it in your heart to forgive me. You have nothing to apologize for. No sooner had she released my hand than I offered it again, palm up. I'm Gemini. Priya gazed at me as she grasped my hand, but it was Rashan she addressed. Your man is pretty. Thank you, Elf, Roshan replied. But he is not my man. We have only met this day, just hours ago. Elf. Priya's eyes waltzed down my shirtless body at a slow and languorous pace. I felt objectified. Half-elf, really, she shrugged. I hope you won't think I'm rude, but even in my droopy state, I wonder if you've made exclusive arrangements with our lovely hero. She blushed. Make friends. Give me a break. Roshan's disinterested answer took me by surprise. The goddess shines on him. Surely such a man's heart shall not be bound by a single soul. She twisted the orb on the tips of her fingers. You people have interesting genes, I muttered. As you know, I'm Priya. She flung the evil eye at the orb in Roshan's hand. Though I might cast my name to the nethers, having heard it befouled by evil's lips. She spat to one side. I think I'd keep it. It's a beautiful name. It suits you. Although I hadn't exactly intended the words the way they sounded, I thought they rolled out smoothly enough. Her lips spread into a smile that could conquer nations. She leaned forward, pressed her lips to my cheek for a long second, then withdrew. Thank you, Jiminy, for freeing me. I will endeavor to see you properly rewarded. I have family who will be happy to see me. Though I considered performing a flourish like a certain cartoon cricket, I didn't bother correcting her mispronunciation of my name. Priya turned to stretch her arms out to Rashan in gratitude. They embraced. 
I caught sight of Priya's tattoo again, but this time it didn't glow. Where in the world did you get art like that? As if on cue, black and purple smoke filled the frame on the wall, and the curve of two nostrils at the end of a long snout, tusks, and an angular chin appeared, followed by black, dull eyes with no irises or pupils. Hmm, the apparition sighed. It seems Kroll proved unworthy. Black tendrils of smoke huffed through its nostrils and dissipated. Then the face viewed us all in succession. Maybe I could offer you a place at my side in his stead. I nodded profusely. Maybe you should just go hump yourself. You will pay for your belligerence. Our paths shall cross again, fools. I look forward to it. I stepped forward and positioned myself between Roshan, Priya, and the smoky dude. My own voice shouted in my mind, taking me by surprise. Protect Priya! The dark image began a swirl. You have trifled with the wrong entity this day, human. This place was but a young addition to my underworld domain. My grasp is long and... The demon glared at me for a long moment before finishing his sentence. Reaching. He tilted his head to the side. If you are what I believe you are, you will come to me. What I am is the end of you. Doubtful. You will fall beneath my feet like all comers before you, boy. Am I supposed to be scared? The little tunnel system belongs to me now. If you want it, why don't you come take it back? The entity barked laughter. If you so desire a conflict with an underlord, journey to the northeast beyond the Plague Barrens and cross the hinterlands of Saran. When you have grown, adventurer, I welcome your challenge and look forward to claiming the essences of both your companions and having you kneel at my feet. Meanwhile, dispose of Kroll as you see fit. I have no further use for him. Thanks for your permission. We'd planned on doing exactly that without your leave. Such bravado. You will tremble before me, fool. The image vanished. When I turned, the women wore the exact same expression. One tilted eyebrow each and slack facial muscles. I'm going to call you two the twins. A smile crept slowly across Rashan's lips, though it revealed no teeth. Yes, I see I was right about you, Gemini. Priya nodded in agreement. Gemini, is that how you say your name? I blinked my eyes in succession. Priya Sky, no class, level nine half-elf. Note, NPCs require a class trainer or player to select a class and must equip a class-specific weapon to do so. NPCs can still gain experience and level, and if they select a class before level 20, any earned levels will be attributed to that class. So no class, huh? Since we weren't companions, I wasn't seeing her stats, just like I hadn't originally seen Roshan's. Also, if she had no class selected, I guess that verified the barrier she'd cast in the tunnels and the spell she'd fired at me when under Kroll's control had been channeled from his ability pool. That was some far-reaching magic for a game world. Priya slid her arm from behind Rashan's back and gestured at what little she wore for coverings. Can you believe he made me wear this crap? My boobs are practically hanging out and this place is frigid. After a quick glance at the reference clothing, I raised my eyes to find Roshan gazing at me. I threw her a half-smile and rolled my eyes to peer up at the ceiling as if searching for something there in jest. The light priestess smirked. Well then. Priya turned toward a small desk in the far corner of the room, and for someone who'd just risen from a nap of exhaustion that caused her to pass out, she had way too much bounce in her strides. Stepping behind it, she bent and retrieved something from underneath. When she stood erect again, she dropped a trunk wrapped in black leather and framed in copper on the bureau. Had I spotted it before, I might have opened it instead of watching her catnap. How long have you been captive? I asked. She spoke as she rifled through the chest. I fear I don't track time well underground and in a glass bowl. 
He let me out only to serve his dark purposes and to linger on me with his hungry gaze. Her eyes flickered to the black robe she'd abandoned on the floor nearby. I consider myself lucky he was but an acolyte who took pleasure with only his sight. If he'd touched me, I'd probably cut my own throat. Roshan nodded. It is likely his acceptance of the Shadow's grasp rendered his manhood moot. I have heard tell of such things. After months assuming my new life would be devoid of romantic encounters, I'd seen how my body reacted to Jara and the rules had changed. Now that they had, I didn't think I'd ever want power enough to give up said functionality. I might not be a walking nympho, but I wasn't prude either. Priya leaned over the crate. I suppose this should be your loot adventurer. A proper reward. Perhaps you will even find something of substance to cover those legs better than simple pants. Not that I would desire you cover yourself more than necessary. She tilted her head. But if you're going to run around places like this, we must adorn you in appropriate attire, yes? Her teasing smile induced a stupid grin on my face. But if you'll grant me your leave, I will first retrieve my effects. Hey, you don't need my permission. Go for it. Roshan crossed the room and stood next to me. Yet again, you've rescued me. She pecked my cheek. How lucky am I to have a man of honor discover me? A purple exclamation point flashed suddenly in my inner face. I smiled, guessing I didn't need to check it to know what it announced. I'm not sure it was I who rescued you. Whatever you did to free Priya seems to have saved us both. It was you who dislodged her from his grasp. I merely healed the injury you inflicted when I saw her eyes turn from evil. Oh yeah, and thanks for the beating, Priya said. I just love being slammed into walls, she winked. Any time, I bowed. Priya withdrew a thick piece of red fabric from the trunk and set it on the desk. When the half-elf shimmied her arms into the sleeves of the red fabric and pulled it down, I realized it was a robe. If it hadn't been for her golden blonde hair, I'd have likened the sight of her to Little Red Riding Hood, except grown. Priya might not have been any older than me, maybe a tad older than Roshan, but she was all woman. Nerds will rejoice when they discover Hinora. I was just glad she was covered. I went to my bag and loosened the drawstring. Eyeing my inner face, I retrieved the scepter and returned it to Roshan's rightful hands. The erupting smiles when she clutched it to her chest caused my heart to thump like it had when first I'd seen it. Priya stepped to the side, swung her arm out with a flourish, and gestured to the trunk with splayed fingers. Your loot, sir. You're the one who suffered for it. Perhaps you should take your fill first. I would not be free if it were not for your actions, Gemini. She shook her head. Besides, I'm a simple woman of the wood. I have no cravings for material things. It is yours to do with as you please. Okay, that's two companions with no interest in loot. Honora, baby. I like her very much, Roshan whispered. Can we keep her? My head whipped around at the suggestion. What? Roshan raised a concerned eyebrow. You don't do that in these parts. I peered into those sienna eyes, trying to determine if she was serious. Then, that bottom, pouty lip curved up in a half-smile. You're screwing with me. If by this you mean I am taking pleasure at your unwitting expense, yes, I am screwing with you. Although my people don't say it that way. Screwing has a different meaning where I come from. Right, no, that's... never mind. I shook my head in derision. I peered over at Priya, who returned my attention with a questioning gaze. An eyebrow arched. What was that? Huh? I said. She waved a hand. Oh, I seem nosy, right? She slapped the back of one hand with the palm of the other. Stupid, stupid, stupid. You two are sharing a moment. I'm afraid I don't get to talk to many people. I'm kind of a loner. I don't always pick up on, you know... I'm a hovel-in-the-woods kind of gal. The language you spoke is just so beautiful, and I'd wondered what you were saying is all. I furrowed my eyebrows. Are you saying you didn't understand what I was saying to Roshan? 
Priya nodded and waved a hand. But your discussion is yours. I... Priya, I didn't realize we were speaking a different language. When I heard the two of you whispering in your embrace, I thought you understood each other. Roshan explained, We were using the common tongue, Gemini, but you and I were communicating in the speech of Clan Fortuan, Lawan words. I cleared my throat. Well, that makes sense. Hmm. With a quick scan of my HUD's languages text, I located a nifty little checkbox next to each language listed, marked default. I located common and ticked the box. From now on, we should speak the common tongue, so no one feels left out. Priya smiled. You are a man of such kindness to make exceptions for such a simple creature as me. Roshan squeezed my waist. That is fine, but I reserve the right to use my own language to curse you should need arise. I would definitely understand that, Priya muttered. My understanding is men must be watched carefully, although I can't say I have experience in those areas. You know, simple girl from the wood and all. Her eyes scanned me up and down. He seems a good sort to me, though. If I was being honest with myself, I was starting to appreciate her gaze. I had about as much game as a chess set filled only with pawns in my previous life. No way would I take this for granted. Roshan explained the joke we'd shared about keeping her. I wasn't sure how she'd take it since I knew nothing of elven culture in this world, not to mention the fact she'd just been enslaved. To my relief, Priya nodded understanding and chuckled. I took her half-hearted laughter as an indicator her energy was drained. The short answer is yes. Yes, you could keep me if I chose it. Priya paced across the room and grabbed my hands again. In all seriousness, adventurer, I am grateful for your intervention. There's no telling how long I might have been imprisoned. I promise to serve you of my own free will until I have adequately repaid this debt to your satisfaction. The exclamation points started to stack up on my interface, but my mind was elsewhere. I waved a hand. You don't owe me anything. I'm just glad you're both okay. Priya shot me a surprised look. Her eyes flashed to Roshan, confusion painted across her features. Her full lips parted and, after a moment, began to quiver. You would deny me repayment of my debt? She pulled her robe tight and clutched at her neck. Are you so displeased by the sight of me? Does my elven blood offend? Before I could correct my mistake, a flash of motion from my right caught me off guard as Roshan's palm thumped against the back of my head. Rude! Did your father raise you among pigs? Dined, did thee, from a trough? Would you have this poor woman carry the guilt of her indebtedness for all her days? I rubbed the spot on the back of my head. Roshan set a hand on Priya's shoulder. I fear our companion derives of poor rearing. It's a shortcoming I have overlooked, but... She glared at me. I assure you, he can be taught. Priya stood and peered at me, her face washed in red. Even though I couldn't have known, guilt consumed me as I noted those exhausted, disappointed eyes. I lowered my head as my mind raced for a shortcut, a way to diffuse the situation quickly. It's as Rashan says. I'm terrible. I wasn't raised right. I didn't understand the custom. Please forgive me. She peered down and waved both hands. Now, I understand, my lord. She bowed her head and sniffled so pathetically, I considered opening an artery in my wrists. Why would adventurers like yourself endure the company of such a simple woman? Why would you value the debt of such a... Stop, Roshan said. She turned a hard eye on me. Do you see the foulness of your mindless uttering, noob? Roshan shut it, I said. I was trying to be polite not rude. I thought telling her it was my pleasure to assist her and that no debt was incurred was to show some humility. Isn't that what Solara would want? The light priestess's forehead wrinkled. I hadn't considered that. I'm sorry I thumped your head. Fine. Now chill out. Priya tilted her head to one side and her forehead wrinkled. 
though I understand his words. He seems to combine them in ways so I do not conceive his meaning. You have heard nothing, Elf. My ears have been filled with the strange rantings from the moment we met. Apparently this is how they speak in Rome. Rome? Time for a subject change. Priya, it would be my great honor to have such a fine woman as you around. It isn't that I didn't appreciate your promise, but that I deemed myself unworthy of such an honor. It was my pleasure to aid you against Kroll, my duty, really. So I would willingly relieve you of your debt if it was your desire. I added flair to keep on Roshan's good side. I'm here in service to the light, so it was my duty to pull you from his dark grasp. But your rapturous beauty is reward enough. Gah! Roshan blurted. Words of such thick sweetness they might have poured from a spike in a tree. Priya gripped my hands as the hint of a smile creased her lips. I appreciated his thoughtful words, priestess. All is forgiven. Let no darkness come between us. Then she hugged me. I checked the notifications on my interface while we embraced. You have saved Roshan for the second time earning 4,300 disposition points. Roshan, human, level 9, light priestess. Disposition, beloved. Your beloved status with a companion has completed an achievement. Crazy love, reward, 2,500 XP. It's good to make friends. Priya is now your companion. Priya Sky, half-elf, level 9, no class. Strength, eight. Dexterity, three. Intelligence, four. Wisdom, four. Constitution, twelve. Charisma, eight. Disposition, endeared. Priya has sixteen unspent attribute points. As you have acquired three companions, you have completed a challenge. Three's company. Gain three companions in Anora. Reward, 1,000 XP. I hadn't considered Anora might have achievements. I needed to find the list in my HUD. I was on my way to level eight. I glanced at the log again. Whoa, endeared? I guess Priya did forgive my utterances. That was only two ranks from Beloved and was two beyond neutral. It was then I opened my eyes and peered down at her head where the top of her ear curved slightly upward but didn't quite wind to an elven point. I absently kissed the top of her head and she sighed. It was weird how I'd just fallen into that sense of comfort so naturally, but I went with it. Maybe you should sit and rest a bit, I said. I will rest when we have fled this dark place. Her weight leaned into me. Agreed, Roshan replied. Breaking camp was fine by me, but the adrenaline boost, which had no place in a video game, had abated, and my eyelids grew heavy. My knees felt like lead weights, but I had levels to go before I was safe. Well, immortal, really. As I released my hold, Priya raised her face. Thank you, Gemini. You're welcome. She turned and motioned to the all but forgotten trunk across the room. If it's not too much to ask, perhaps you could secure your loot so we might leave this dark place. The gray flesh under her eyes were testimony that she needed to sleep for a month. Of course, Priya. I circled the short desk. Accessing my HUD as I reached into the trunk, I was flabbergasted by the number of items. This could take all day. Recalling the way my heart had thumped upon losing my healer in the tunnel after combat, I also wanted to get Roshan the hell out of there. I made a lame attempt to shove the trunk into my bag, but it didn't work. I peered up to find both women smirking like I was an idiot. I distracted them from their amusement. Is there a way to the surface shorter than through the tomb of the lost? Priya shook her head. Our best path is back to the cellar tree. His demon spawns will have retreated deep into the tunnel network, and the kobolds they've enslaved will chase their taskmasters to the ends, cut them off, and reclaim their territory with blood ritual. 
so the kobolds lived here before. She nodded. More than one civilization has lived in that stone underground, but these are mostly low-level kobolds who dwell deep in the tunnels, so any stragglers should cause a brave man like you little trouble. Most of them have aversions to the stonework sections of the underground anyway, and avoid it. I spied brass handles on either side of the trunk. The priestess and I can carry the trunk so that you might be at the ready with your weapons, should the need arise. It's not heavy. I recalled how Priya had raised it onto the desk with ease. Great, but I think I can drop it fast enough if I need to be at the ready. You look exhausted. Roshan nodded in agreement. I will carry it with Gemini. She placed her long fingers on Priya's cheek. Trust in us, little elf woman. We are cast in Solara's light and will persevere against darkness. If Priya didn't appreciate being called little, she showed no sign of it. But considering the circumstances and her state of being, she probably wouldn't have. The voluptuous half-elf peered around the room. Good winds to this pit. You have come and conquered, friends. Roshan smiled. Of course we did. I found it a little funny that she'd been standing there with demon smoke floating up her nose when I arrived, and now she showed the confidence of a heavyweight punching a bunny rabbit. She turned her eyes on me and raised her chin high. You will return to the forest and seek cover for the night. Hopefully your captors have strayed and become lost. Yes, ma'am. I bowed my head slightly at Roshan, then peered at the half-elf. Priya. I want to check your skills and discuss possibilities for your advancement when we found shelter. I noticed a lot of unspent skill points when I checked your status. You have already checked my status? She said, pushing one hip to the side and tilting her head slightly. I'm honored, my lord. Though I suspected the lame, flirty humor to be an artificial shelter for her mind from the trauma of imprisonment and forced actions... I admired her resilience. She leaned toward Roshan and whispered just loudly enough I picked it up. What's he talking about? 30. Priya had been right on both fronts. We carried the trunk with relative ease as we traversed the dry trail leading up the tunnel to the stony cellar, and we encountered no resistance during our exodus. On a couple occasions, I'd heard skittering echoes off the stone walls from below, but Priya assured me it was only the kobolds, free of their shadow magic shackles, chasing the demons deeper into the catacombs and cornering them for a final confrontation. Without their master, the demon beasts would have a fight on their hands in the kobolds' familiar stomping grounds, though those weren't the exact words she used. She spat venom each time she used the word demon. When I told her that I'd thought the occupants of the underground cellar and adjoined dungeon had built the stone walls and floors until Roshan set me straight, Priya had laughed. Cobolds don't work in stone. As I walked those same stone halls, imprisoned by my robe and crawls, she spat after his name, Dark Presence, I was still seeing, still thinking. I wondered what ancient civilization might have carved out those halls beneath a tree. I have no idea who they were. But they weren't kobolds. Those filthy creatures can tunnel. But that is the extent of their construction affinities. It reminded me that one of my tasks was to take a better look at the black robe in which she'd been bound, and the glass orb that held the shadow caster prisoner. Both were nestled securely in my bag, the Roshan's expression as I bagged the strange robe had spoken of her disapproval. Still, she held her tongue, which I knew from our short time together was no small concession. Exiting into the light of day had become a welcome relief for Roshan and me, but at the first sight of natural light, Priya busted through the door in the tree and dropped to her knees, whispering words I couldn't make out as tears of joy streamed down her face. Opting to leave her to her jubilations, Roshan and I stood together in the meadow, averting our eyes as she wept. Roshan whispered in my ear, her breath pricking at the short hairs there. Where is Click? God, I'd almost forgotten my little buddy. She was injured below. I dismissed her so she wouldn't suffer. I only had one minor potion left. 
and I feared you or I might need it. So I did the only thing that made sense. You saved your potion for me instead of using it on your beloved friend? Roshan squeezed my wrist. I am honored to call you my companion. When Priya finished muttering and crying at the tree's roots, she returned to us and gripped our hands. Never shall I be more thankful than I am to you for the freedom you have returned to me. I only hope I can repay your bravery and kind. I decided it would be in poor judgment to voice thoughts contrary to her indebtedness aloud, but something about it made me feel icky. The reason I'd been in that place had nothing to do with Priya. I was going to receive a royal XP dump for removing Kroll. Even though I didn't imprison him in the glass bubble myself, my log confirmed I'd completed the requirements for the quest. I just needed to turn it in to Jara. I'd spent the rest of my days in Anora. I looked forward to meeting its people, learning more about its cultures. Their ideas about honoring debts were ingrained in at least two of them, and they'd been separated by a sea. Roshan's pledges seemed to be more permanent, but I didn't know the extent of Priya's promise. She'd mentioned family who'd be happy to see her, so maybe I'd be rewarded and she'd go her own way. The sentiments between Priya and Roshan surrounding gratitude might have been traditions written into NPCs before the 2,000-year purge and passed down through the generations. Because seriously, what were the odds of a noob landing two beautiful and intelligent women pledging to repay debts to him in one day? If NPCs like Roshan, who offered their services in reward for heroic deeds, were common, players would use cultural traditions as an excuse for bad behavior when the floodgates opened someday. But I wasn't one of them. My survival depended on these gifts, and they would be appreciated far beyond level 10. Although I wasn't sure what Priya would want to do, Roshan was guild officer material. The presence of a healer had allowed me to take on six or seven demons, and I would have fallen during that quest without her. This new companion, Priya, had points to distribute and could contribute as well. If I could involve her in combat, she might make a huge difference, assuming she had the stomach for it. Both of them were higher level than I. Summon our companion, Roshan said, pulling me out of my own head. I will heal him. Oh, right, I muttered. But click is a her. Her, then. Yes, I remember now. Companion? Priya asked. There is another. I nodded and pressed my lips into a smile. Yes, I have someone I'd like you to meet. Throwing my hand out, I focused my energy. A ray of light peeked through the tree canopy above and touched my hand. It might have been my imagination, but I'd have sworn the warm light of the high sun lent an ease to my casting as my hand glowed blue and click rematerialized. Well, that's a neat trick, Priya said. I didn't know you had magic. Your pet is a porcupunk. What did you do to win her over? Feed her? As a matter of fact, I did. Priya cocked her chin up. Yeah, probably hard to get rid of one after you've done that. Your pet is uninjured, Roshan said. How about that? I asked. Although it made perfect sense. I decided to leave that part out. Talking about commonalities in other games would undoubtedly violate Enora's rules. I guess they'll heal upon summoning. Click's nose rose and twitched at Roshan and me. Then she noticed Priya and sniffed up at her. Well, hello, Priya said. She set her hands on her knees. Aren't you a pretty girl? Click bounced side to side. I recalled two days before when I'd mistaken that for playfulness, resulting in an arm filled with spike holes. But I sensed no animosity and found that even though she'd come to her summons with a neutral disposition, there was something in Priya's greeting, maybe her tone of voice, that brightened my pet. Completing her crouch, Priya extended her arms. Embrace me like a friend, Porcupunk, for I am. To my utter surprise, my pet clicked excitedly and ran into Priya's arms. Priya clutched the rotund but powerful beast to her bosom and stood, stroking its flesh hairs in long, smooth strokes as she hugged it against a red robe. 
This is a powerful companion you have charmed. Her smile was disarming, filled with a joy I hadn't seen before emerging into the forest. She shared it with Rashan for a moment, then looked back at me. Your essence draws powerful allies to your side. Planting a kiss on the side of Click's head, she set her back on the mossy ground cover. She's a weighty one as well. I wouldn't want to have to carry her for long. Luckily, I haven't had to. She's always out in front. Priya turned and set her hands on her hips as she stared off into the dense forest. My dwelling is close, my friends. She peered down and wiggled the toes of her bare feet. I realized they'd been bare since I met her, back when she'd been possessed. The earth feels so good beneath me. Priya raised her arms in an elongated stretch, and her body writhed with pleasure as she moaned. Her demeanor as we traversed the cellar dungeon during our exodus had piqued my interest. I didn't remember a single complaint while we'd been underground. To the contrary, she joked. She smiled frequently. And other than the dark circles under her eyes, she'd carried herself as if she'd been recharged by her short nap. Of course, being liberated from a glass ball and a robe of imprisonment might lift one's spirit. Priya began flicking the clasps on her robe. What you doing? I asked. She answered as if it was obvious. Loosing my ward. Shrugging out of the robe, she threw her arms out to the side as if to air herself out. Turning in a half circle, she revealed her wondrous tattoo to us again. This inspires awe in me, Roshan muttered. Her eyelids drooped, and I felt her weight lean into me. She interlocked her fingers with mine as a daze washed across her features. She has been touched by a higher being. Awe is the right word. Gives a tingly feeling in my chest when I look at that thing. I share this response, Roshan said. Apparently, having heard our mutterings, Priya's face wore a pinkish hue as she turned. We both frowned as the tree painted across her back was twisted from our sight lines. You called that tattoo a ward? I asked Rashan, but it was Priya who answered. Yes, it wards predators away. What, you run through the forest wearing just that strap of cloth? As I said below, this strip of cloth belongs to he who is in prison in your bag. Usually I reveal the ward in its entirety. If you were not here, I would remove the meager covering and set it on fire. I took this to mean she walked around without a top when prancing among the trees. Your ward glows right through the covering anyway, I said. It's kind of see-through. Oh, good to know. I hope it doesn't offend you that, when there are human creatures around, I don my robe. My aunt has warned me against the lusts of men. I nodded. A wise warning, especially considering your allure. But if men stumbled onto you, I think you could just show them your back and run away. My body goes numb when I see it. She blushed anew. I have trouble controlling it when touched by sunlight, but I'll try to keep it toned down. Tying the sleeves of her robe around her waist, Priya reached for the trunk handle and eyed me. Ready your bow, woodsman. I will take us down the paths I've traveled most, but we should be alert. If she could just turn around in the face of any threats and freeze them in their tracks, I didn't see the sense in it, but I played along. We encountered no trouble for what I guessed was two long miles. We came upon the first evidence of sky since the lake the night before. I peered down at the knee-high grass rustling around my new pants then squinted into the area beneath the distant tree line to avert my gaze from Priya's ward, lest I be a stumbling fool. I stepped beside her. She closed her eyes and let the sun beam down on her face. When Priya ended her stretch and turned, Roshan was standing inches away, eliciting a jolt from the elven woman. Priya slapped a hand to her chest. You startled me. Roshan shook her head a few times. I apologize, but I was wondering, might I touch your ward? I don't see why not. Priya turned. Roshan reached out and closed her eyes. 
A thin halo of focused light surrounded her robe. Oh, Priya, it is such a blessing, this mark upon you. It fills me with such contentment. I'm pleased, Priya said. Gemini seems to evade its grasp. Sorry, it just distracts me. I think its influence impacts me more than it does Roshan. Maybe because she's so in tuned to the energy it puts off. When I stare at it, I think I lose time. That's good to know. Priya said. I'm not exposed to a lot of people and have really only seen its impact on wildlife, with the exception of Kroll, who glanced at it once and had a headache for days. I was quite glad. Yeah, screw Kroll, I agreed. I will be swirling around in the globe screaming at us. It doesn't work that way, but I take your meaning. Click greeted me from the high grass and I peered down to find my first companion sniffing the air next to my leg. I knelt and stroked her fleshy hairs. We are safe now, little porky punk. Priya led us across the meadow to the base of a massive oak. At its foot was a moss-covered dome with a single circular window carved into its face. The half-elf approached it, pressed her hand into the moss next to the window and a trace of green light formed a rectangle on the wooden surface. The door popped open. A magic door? Priya! A deep voice bellowed from the woods. The earth beneath me quaked. My knees trembled. Every muscle in my body quivered as I fumbled my bow off my shoulder and turned. You have changed your class to woodsman. Priya grasped my wrist. So do your weapon, adventurer. You are safe with Magellan. She turned up the palm of her free hand and gestured at the sprawling oak above her wooden dome. Golden eyes blinked open on the rough surface of the ancient tree. You have returned, princess. Many nights I have worried after you. The tree, apparently Magellan, said. Priya circled the wooden dome and approached the tree. Hello, my love. I fear I left the safety of your wards only to be taken by a minion of darkness. The bark above the spooky golden eyes wrinkled up, mimicking a forehead. Say it's not true. Are you injured, child? Might I produce a salve for you? Priya shook her head. I'm quite well, Magellan. Please don't worry yourself. Bah! For forty days I have worried myself, child. You... I know, Priya interrupted, stepping up to the tree and pressing herself against the bark with her arms spread wide. It would have taken thirty such wingspans to embrace the tree's massive trunk. Is she going to melt into that thing? I wander haphazardly into the wood like a fool. I know. But Magellan... I cannot live my whole life in your sightline. Actually, you could. The heavy voice grumbled, so I felt it in my feet. You're being difficult, Priya backed away and set her hands on her hips. But I suppose it is forgivable in this instance. My attention had reverted to the magical tattoos on her back. It really was like watching a 10K video. The ward resembled the tree to whom she spoke. Then again it was a tree. They looked like trees. The golden eyes turned on Roshan and then settled on me. You have brought visitors. I wasn't sure I liked this variation of its low tone, but Priya's tone became excited. Yes, two brave souls who have vanquished darkness from the caves beneath your roots. This is Roshan, a priestess of great power. This is her companion Gemini a brave woodsman who rescued us both from an evil minion. I owe my life to them and would appreciate if you treat them with the same kindness you have shown me. I glanced at Roshan to find a calm smile crossing her lips. I whispered, Do you feel this, I don't know, warm weightlessness? Roshan nodded and whispered, You stand before a powerful being of the light. I have dreamed of such things. Revel in it. I focused on the tree. Magellan, 
ancient treant of the light, level, unknown. For eons, Magellan has served as regent to the matron of the wood, Jara. He was too high a level for me to even see the number. It had been a long time since I'd seen this game mechanic used prior to entering Enora, but that made it somewhat refreshing. Woods creaked and groaned as the tree squinted slightly and gave a short bow, its leaves whispering and branches creaking with the motion. Two birds flew off across the meadow. I welcome you to my protectorate, travelers. For as long as you are here, know that I guard my own, and by returning Priya safely, I shall henceforth consider you such. This land is wonderful, Roshan said simply. Her often unemotional tendencies were the picture of calm. A reason it had to do with her religious training. I bowed to the tree. Thank you, Magellan. Your hospitality is appreciated, great treant. Ah, the giant tree said. And he shows respect. The entire tree bent above Magellan's eyes as if nodding. Welcome, Gemini, and welcome to you, Roshan, priestess of the light. He turned his attention to Priya. The matron will be worried about you, child. Will you go and see her? The matron? She knows Jara? Tomorrow, the day after at the latest, I promise you, Priya said. Tonight, I will give my new friends a place to rest, feed their bellies, and recharge. Magellan's eyes squinted toward me. Gifts, I'm sure, will be quite appreciated and respected. I assure you this is the case, great Triant, I replied. Hmm, yes, I approve, Priya. Now go rest, recuperate. I sense an uncommon weariness in you. Travel to see the Blessed One tomorrow, as I feel her tears from your absence blowing on the wind each day. I doubt her worry was that deep, but I look quite forward to seeing Aunt Jara, I assure you. Upon her shall I lay my eyes tomorrow. Aunt? What? Good. Now go. We shall keep watch. We? Numerous eyes flickered open in the smaller trees surrounding Magellan, as if reading my mind and answering my question. Priya led us inside the wooden dome. I set the trunk just inside the door, reeling at what I'd just learned about her familial line. Welcome to my home, Priya said, that enthusiastic smile still plastered to her angular features. How did I miss the resemblance? That golden hair, the slightly pointed nose, the setting of her eyes. A sliver of light beaming through the oval window and reflecting off a mirror strategically leaned against the back wall was the lone source of illumination, but it did the job well in the morning sun. A simple wooden table sat against one wall, and a rug of lush, soft bear fur spread across the center of the space. On the back wall, I spied a sprawling bed with huge but simply carved wooden posts and another thick fur that must have come from a huge beast, unless I just couldn't see hems where several hides were joined. Patches of moss splotched the ceiling, and the interior wooden planks bent to form the curved walls. A black wood stove sat in the far right corner. It seemed misplaced in a room constructed so purely of nature. What does Magellan think of you burning wood? I asked. Priya smirked so hard, her lips seemed to wrinkle from two to four. You are not from the forest, obviously. While all trees live, not all are sentient. Noob, Rashan muttered. Do you live alone here? I asked. Priya turned. Though her smile still adorned her features, her furrow eyebrow questioned. Who would I live with? I shrugged and changed the subject to the one plaguing me. You mentioned your aunt? Oh, she waved a hand. My aunt lives in another part of the forest. 
She raised her hands and spun in a slow circle. This was my parents' place before they moved into the city, and now it is mine. Gripping my hand and offering her other to Roshan, who took it, she said, And now it is yours, for as long as you wish to stay. You're generous. So your parents live in a city? Yes. They left when I came of age. Her face wrinkled up in a sad expression. As my aunt tells me, I had no desire to leave the woods then, but I don't remember them. I'm afraid creatures of the darkness find my essence magnetic. Kroll was not the first to pounce as I wandered outside the protection of Magellan and the Treants. Whoa. Too much info at once. Why don't you remember not wanting to leave your parents? Priya rolled her eyes. I know, right? I blabber on and on. She shrugged and flashed a playful smile. My memory was purged by an evil creature who'd brought perverted intent to the woods. The underlord you saw in the frame has sought me for some time, according to my Aunt Jara. When my memory was stolen away, my aunt's servants cast the wards in the forest to keep minions of the darkness from approaching this place. But it was my undoing when Crow caught me outside the protection of the wards as I returned from trading and dragged me into the depths to slay for him in his dark deeds until he could transport me to Cain. I think he really wanted to keep me for himself. And the ward on your back? She waved a dismissive hand. Also the work of my aunt. She spoke in a conspiratorial tone. She doesn't do anything halfway. She sounds like a magical woman. You don't know the half of it, but there are many creatures of magic in the dark wood. Now, come, my friends. Make yourself at home. I will gather wood for a fire. My bones tell me the night will come with a chill. But it's only morning, I protested. Besides, aren't you tired? Shouldn't you sleep? She adopted a dreamy tone. Oh, how I love sleep. Though I'm somewhat haggard, the wood recharges me. It's in my blood. Anyway, I only require slumber every third night or so. Also, the nap helped. She stays awake three days at a time. As to your suspicions, I would like a little time to walk quietly in the forest, and collecting wood is just the byproduct. We wouldn't deny you time for meditation, Roshan interjected, grasping my hand and squeezing. We sat on the rug near the doormat, wood stove as Priya grabbed an axe leaning against the wall, pushed open the door, and flooded the space with morning light, and exited into the meadow. Click settled into the warm fibers next to me and snoozed. She purred as she warmed my leg. I yawned. You are tired, Gemini. How long has it been since sleep has recharged your spirit? I loved the way she talked. Gods, I don't know. I guess I woke up next to that tree, what, two days ago? Wow. I had no idea it had been that long. No wonder I'm bushed. Roshan scooted toward me, cupping my face so her warmth penetrated my cheeks. She peered into my eyes. You have proven yourself trustworthy. So lie with me and we will both sleep. But Priya should be back soon and... Priya has welcomed you to her home and made it your own. She got to her feet and I rose. Leading me toward the bed, she pressed her hands against my chest, holding me fast. Turn so I can disrobe. I did. After some rustling, she said, It is safe now. I turned to find her tucked into a smaller fur on the far side of the bed. I slipped off my vest and lay atop the larger. When sleep didn't come immediately, I focused on the soft sounds of the priestess's breathing, and that did the trick. 31. It was only with great effort I blinked my eyes open when rustling tickled my feet. The warm fur above and the soft feathers beneath did little to motivate me in wakefulness. Softness and tenderness surrounded me, and I would have been just fine with never having moved again. I didn't need to know the source of the rustling at my feet. I didn't need to know why my body felt like it was wrapped in a warm sleeve. 
the scents of moss and wood crept in the darkness that blanketed Priya's home. I realized I must have slept half the day. When I started to move, I discovered I was spooned between two women and stayed put. Roshan's fur covered the front side of my body. Priya squirmed and pressed her chest against my back. I had the distinct sensation she wasn't wearing anything on her chest. Mmm, she moaned as she pressed her mouth to my ear. Are you awake? Mm-hmm. Adjusting, Roshan twisted beneath the fur to face me. Did you nap well? She asked groggily. Luxuriously, I smiled. She pressed the fur to herself as she sat up and looked toward the front of the large bed, where her robe lay neatly folded. I rolled to face Priya so the priestess had privacy. Roshan spoke as she dressed. Priya, perhaps we should hunt while you catch up on your sleep. Hmm? The elf said, obviously snapping awake for the second time. No. Her mouth stretched into a wide yawn. I will rise and hunt something up. You rest. Her eyes blinked closed again. Her nose whistled as her breathing leveled out. Roshan set a knee on the bed and whispered, Perhaps you could use your bow to hunt something for us. I'm sure Magellan would guide you. You have been offered a quest, fluttering fowl for fluttering bellies. Hunt two pheasants in the nearby meadow and return them to Priya. Reward, improved disposition with Priya. 450 XP, roasted pheasant, times 10. Roshan fed a fire in the stove as Click and I set off into the night. Priya hadn't been kidding earlier that day. A serious chill had invaded the forest when the sun fell. As suggested, I spoke with Magellan, and he informed me we wouldn't have to go far. There were pheasants hiding in the tall grass at the other end of the meadow. Click led me halfway across the field. I shrugged my bow down my arm and into my hand in a motion that became more natural each time. I tied the quiver to my hip and found the position as natural as breathing as I slipped an arrow from its hold. My pet stopped and peered at me. Click, click, click. Okay, babe, I just need you to sniff around over there and flush something out so I can shoot it. Click, 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 click. I need the shooting practice. Don't attack anything. Just flush it out. Click launched, scurrying away and disappearing into the high grass. I cast inner illumination, knelt down and waited. Grass shuffled in the distance so I drew back my bowstring and aimed in the general area I thought the sound came from. But nothing happened. A sudden squawk filled the air and I twisted my hips, adjusting my aim. But again nothing happened. A few heartbeats later, rustling entirely too close for my comfort caused me to leap up and take a few steps backward. Bow tensed, I peered into the grass. A fat, round bird appeared a few feet away, moving toward me, but it wasn't running or flying, or fluttering. My porcupunk bounded up to me, dropped the bird at my feet, and clicked. Then she bounced back and forth, smiling up at me. Well, either you're hard-headed or we don't understand each other as well as I'd hoped outside of combat. Fluttering fowl for fluttering bellies. Hunt two pheasants in the nearby meadow and return them to Priya. Pheasants hunted. One of two. I shrugged. Maybe this time you could let me level up my bow skills a bit? What do you think, kid? Click showed me all her silvery teeth, and rapid clicked in that way I was becoming convinced was a laugh. Yeah, screw you too, dummy. I flicked a finger toward the grass. Go, flush one out. Less than a minute later, a pheasant launched from the high grass. Tracking it with my bow, thankful for my night vision spell. I loosed an arrow. It missed, but I added a skill point to my ranged attack. Click returned, dropped the arrow at my feet, and laughed again. She does fetch. I directed her back into the grass without words. Again, a pheasant shot out of the grass at the opposite end of the field. I fired another arrow. I missed. Click laughed. I sent her back. In the end, 
I missed with half the arrows in my quiver before I finally clipped one of the birds. I yelled for Click to just finish it off and bring it back. The kills weren't netting us XP anyway. The birds were level one. Fluttering fowl for fluttering bellies. Hunt two pheasants in the nearby meadow and return them to Priya. Pheasants hunted, two of two. Return the pheasants to Priya for your reward. Reward. Improved disposition with Priya. 450 XP. Roasted pheasant times ten. Grabbing the birds by the feet, I dropped them in my bag with the understanding it was really just a void and feathers and guts weren't going to lodge in there and stink it up. After counting my arrows, I meandered slowly with click at my heel, eyeing the dim light in the small round window of Priya's moss-covered dome. It's like a hobbit house, except it isn't actually part of the tree. When a slight rise in the meadow gave me a good angle, I stopped and peered at the orange glow painting the glass of the tiny window from afar. Priya consumed my thoughts. Something was unusual about the elf woman, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Although Roshan's behavior varied from determined to attentive, her undertones told me her sometimes stoic nature was practiced, a product of her training in the faith, maybe. Priya struck me as an old soul. She'd just been held captive for an extended period, and not only told the story of how it happened to her before, as if being kidnapped was a common event, but seemed too relaxed about it, like she was just along for the ride. The way she jested and giggled on our return trip from the dungeon underground, though her eyelids hung like curtains, said loads about her resolve, her resilience. But there was something else there, a confidence maybe. If she was truly the niece of a tree goddess, whatever Jara was, Maybe that accounted for her demeanor. Maybe the power she'd witnessed in her aunt gave her walls of security to hide her mind behind when all seemed lost. Perhaps she'd never doubted she would be saved. Faith. Another reoccurring theme of the last 24 hours. How might Priya react when learning Jara sent me to rid the forest of Kroll? Standing there, tying theories together in my head, I would have wagered she'd be unsurprised. Almost like she'd expect it, but something told me I shouldn't unload that little tidbit of information on her yet. It was a tickle in my brain, an itch I wasn't ready to scratch lest something become infected. Lucera had sent me to Jara for my first quest. Jara had sent me to the underground domain of a dark caster, supposedly to cleanse it. But had Priya's rescue been the point all along? Had Jara actually hidden her real motives for sending me down there? If so, why would she do that? Why not just tell me the stakes if her niece was down there? Though I couldn't recall her words precisely, she'd left the impression I might run into someone under the dark source's control. That couldn't have been a coincidence. It was a game world, right? A quest. Would an NPC in this world use deceit to reach a desired end? Hide elements of the quest while giving hints as to their presence, like Priya? As the nagging suspicion that something was a little screwy up in Denmark bloomed in me, my mind raced for answers. Standing there in the dark, I became suddenly conscious of all the sounds of insect life naturally relegated to the white noise centers of my brain. The way my chest rose and fell with my breath, the cold bite of the night breeze when it blew, the depth of the realism in the world around me became utterly terrifying. At first, I couldn't home in on what about it scared me. But as I rewound my thoughts, traced from Lucera to Jara to Rashan to Priya, such a place as Enora, where life was every bit as impactful as it had been on Earth, could become a prison if others controlled my destiny. Two days ago, I would have been thrilled that Takamoto had talked Enora into giving me a hand up. Anything to survive until level 10 and be able to live on. Where otherwise I'd be a corpse in a grave or cremated ash somewhere on the other side of the void. But as I stood, considering the elf's home at the base of a mystical tree, I couldn't shake the inner anger that I'd been fighting for my life out here in a strange new world under the assumption I was on my own, while virtual beings were guiding me along a path. Was I a free man? You're overthinking it. No one is helping you. 
This is your life now. Those are your people. Clicking rose on the air from up ahead, and I peered into darkness as my inner illumination spell expired. Thousands of stars sparkled overhead and animals harmonized a nocturnal melody. I drew the scent of evergreen and pine slowly through my nostrils. Just a few more levels, then I could ask myself all the questions I wanted. For now, I had friends to tend to and other pheasants to fry. Then I remembered that Lucera had just heard every thought I'd had. 32. Priya spitted the fat bird over a fire outside after Roshan plucked it free of feathers. A breeze rose and the fire crackled in response as I took a turn rotating the meat. Fat sizzled as it splattered on the hot coals beneath, and the rising scent of cooked meat made my stomach grumble like incongruent tectonic plates. You have completed a quest. Fluttering fowl for fluttering bellies. Hunt two pheasants in the nearby meadow and return them to Priya. Pheasants hunted, two of two. Reward, 400 disposition with Priya. 450 XP. Roasted pheasant times 10, once they're cooked. I can hear your longing belly over the breeze, Gemini, Priya said. I'd removed my chest armor, and she rubbed a hand in a circular motion in the small of my back. Is my savior hungry? I could eat. Well, I think it's ready, and I could eat a boar by myself. We moved inside, and the succulent pheasant quieted my stomach. Though I checked my interface for stat bonuses, it seemed to provide none. In L.O.B., we only ate meals to boost ourselves for battle. In Enora, we ate or we starved to death. But it seemed I would need to eat less frequently than I had on Earth. It was yet another little detail I'd never asked no crew about, but something told me I'd have gotten nothing out of him. He'd been so closed-lipped. I'd attributed his silence to Enora's rules regarding my addition to the world. After all, she could read my mind and would know if he cheated. As I chewed on pheasant, I ruminated on all of it. New players were not going to receive manuals. The dark levels really would be dark. Anora wanted players to figure out the world as they went, and something told me that had been part of the original design. I couldn't be sure, but it was sound theory. We all ate our fill, including Click, who then curled up near the wood stove as the rest of us lounged. We sat in silence for a while before Priya broke it, I need to ask your leave to visit my aunt. You are all welcome to join me, but I really must go and see her. Jara, right? How far away is she from here? I could have brought up my map and guessed, but I didn't have that good of a grasp on distance and travel time on foot. Oh, not far. One hour's journey at the most. Then we can set off at first light after I've handled my administrative tasks. You would come with me? She asked. Yes. I don't want you out there, away from your wards. Plus, I have business with her. Her head snapped back, as expected. I thought I spied the subtle squint of an eye, but it wasn't easy to see with the candle sitting on a small round table behind her. Business with my aunt? How is this? To turn in a quest. This is the quest you mentioned before? Roshan asked. Yes. Kroll was the target. My log shows I've met the requirements, I shrugged. So seeing as you want to visit your aunt, our path together continues. I expect to advance when I turn it in. Priya raised a hand to her chest. A fine accomplishment. The utterance caught me by surprise. I didn't hear any hint of suspicion in her tone. She ran a fingertip across the arch of her bare foot. Did the quest involve my rescue? And there it was. Um, no, just to cleanse a dark source from the place. Priya nodded and slapped her thighs, perking up. She must not have known I was there then. That must be it. Well, shall we leave at first light? Roshan nodded. It would be my honor to meet your family, Priya. You don't know the least of it, I muttered. Do you whisper songs you sing as well, Gemini? Roshan asked. Speak up, noob. Priya nodded and chuckled. I heard him fine, and he's right. As attuned to the light as you are, I have little doubt you will enjoy my aunt's company. 
That's what he implied. Why is this? Roshan asked, her head pivoting left and right, seeking answers from whoever would give them. I tell you what, I said. How about this? You be patient, and we will give you the surprise of a lifetime. I held up a hand to belay objection when her neck craned. Trust me, you'll love Jara. Roshan nodded. Fine, but I know you two are in cahoots. We nodded agreement and said, We are in perfect sync. I slapped my legs and rose, retrieving the trunk from the wall closest to the door. I dragged it to the edge of the fur rug. I need to go through this stuff. Then we can look at your attributes, Priya. I welcome you, Gander, she said in a teasing timber. I little doubt the half-elf was trouble. They chattered amongst themselves, chuckling together now and then. I was happy to see my companions got along so well. Minor mana potion replenishes 100 mana instantly. I made a note the potions would restore half Roshan's pool. We had two. Other articles told the story of a dark dude who'd spent time capturing, killing, and stealing, probably using his underlord's minions for safety, considering he hadn't been high level himself. One of his victims had likely been an assassin. Assassin's Daggers of Stealth, level 8. Slot, weapon, type, dagger. Quality, uncommon. Durability, 50 of 50. Physical damage, 11 to 14. Plus 2 stealth. Plus 2 to melee attack. Plus 5% damage to backstab. Bonus! I cried aloud. The woman stopped talking and eyed me. I believe our friend has encountered a boon, Priya. Ha! <laughs> it would seem so. Do we need to take your toy box away, Gemini, lest you become enamored with its treasures and forget us? I smiled and shook my head. I doubt I'll ever forget you, Priya. You're a hoot. Leather pants of stealth. Level 7. Slot. Legs. Type. Armor. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 50 of 50. Plus 4. Melee defense. Plus 1. Melee attack. Set bonus. 2. Plus 2. To stealth ability. Not too shabby. And Priya had guessed correctly. I could trade in my simple pants. Although Roshan focused on the fire burning in the hearth, I snatched a glance at the half-elf as I slid on the new pair and caught her sea-blue eyes traversing the muscles of my legs. Our eyes met. She blushed and swept her gaze to one side. Okay. I like her. My melee defense level rose to 19. I figured out I got a point for each dexterity, which was 15 total, and the additional four the pants gave me. I'd have expected dodge instead of defense when dexterity was the impacting attribute, but Enora had her own ideas. Some simple, some nonsensical. To me, anyway. My stats were looking up, though I'd hardly call myself overpowered. I doubted whether I was adequately powered, considering what I'd met with so far, but having companions gave me hope I was going to make it. I wondered what the players who liked to solo would think when they were unleashed upon my new world someday. Or more accurately, it was unleashed upon them. Light spells, two. Unarmed, one. Blunt weapon, three. Daggers, thirteen. Bows, fifteen. Swords, eleven. Melee attacks, plus thirteen. Ranged attacks, plus fourteen. Dodge, six. Melee defense, nineteen. Jara's blessing had worn off, but I'd managed to stack my range attacks prior to losing the boon. My eyes flickered down to a narrow box in the bottom right corner of the inventory interface I hadn't noticed previously. Squinting at it, I saw a bronze metallic circle with a red line through it, then a silver one, then a gold one. Neither of the latter was marked out. Focusing, I placed my hand in the bag. Something cool and metallic jingled in my palms. I withdrew it and turned it over in my hand. For this, I cast my illumination spell. The image of a leaf was pressed into a golden coin. Wait, is this a... 
Priya nearly leapt off the rug as she crossed the distance and knelt before me. That's gold, Gemini. You could feed us for a week if you went to Broomhill with that. Broomhill? She raised a querulous eyebrow. You're not from anywhere near here, are you? Did you enter the wood from the east? You don't look like Roshan. Ha! <laughs> the eastern mage and I shared a glance and half smiles. Priya was a tad awkward. Broomhill is a town just beyond these woods. They have small shops and even a tavern. It was on my return journey from trading skins that the dark bastard captured me with his evil orb. Kroll, right. His name is a curse upon my elven ears. Better we banish it from our memories. Agreed, I barked. Fuck that dude. Priya jerked backward, tilted her head, and her full lips spread into something resembling a smile. Then she laughed. Indeed, I would not fuck that dude, as you say, even if he'd been capable. I'd have sooner lopped it off. It's just an expression. It means to hell with him. Oh, then let that dude be fucked. The two of us laughed heartily. Over her shoulder, I spied Roshan stroking Click's flesh, wearing a smirk that seemed to say, Look at these ridiculous people. Priya thumped the gold coin. How much was there? She lowered her eyes. If it is mine to ask, my lord. Priya, I've accepted your companionship, but you have to stop calling me lord. I'm not so special as that. She shook her head. In private company, I will call you Gemini as you ask. But when we are in the presence of others, I will call you by the title you've earned in gaining my fealty. It is respect for my own worth as well as yours. After all, to possess such a creature as myself, you must be special. Or do you disagree? Wow. She twisted that around in a hurry. I smirked at her in response and turned back to the small square in my inventory while reaching back into the bag. Wait. Had she said fealty? Well? Priya asked. She eyed the trunk. There were too many coins for me to handle in one grasp. The zeros with the slash market were suddenly replaced by numbers. So, um, is 17 gold a lot? I asked. Priya thrust a hand to her chest. Her chin dropped, and her eyes fluttered. The way she wavered, I thought she might faint. Click seemed confused. Roshan shook her head derisively and rolled her eyes. She has no concept of the value of money, unless it is very different from where I come from. This is not an outrageous sum. As she said, it will feed us when we venture into town, but it will not provide for high-quality gear or materials unless this land is very different from my own. Priya recovered, but seemed woozy. I guessed that seventeen gold was more than she'd ever seen. As I considered Roshan's explanation, I summed that Priya had been sheltered by forest life. I continued through the chest. Scroll of Binding this scroll allows its reader to bind one item to a player's soul. It may be read by any player or NPC of level 9 or higher. Player-only information. Soulbound items respawn with you upon death. Player-only. I guess this was text NPCs wouldn't see in their interfaces, and it might be against the rules to mention it. I already had an idea of what stiff penalties awaited players who revealed the wrong information to citizens of Enora. I made another mental note to read the player's agreement. Then I dismissed it. No one reads player's agreements. Either way, this was a kick-ass turn of events. With this scroll, I could bind the bag to myself and therefore protect any contents. If I lived past level 10, I would never lose it. The fact that the binding scroll was level 9 dangled my ability to bind it to myself slightly out of reach. But I peered across the room. Roshan? Her features softened as she looked up, and I felt a new warmth for her when I saw how natural the reaction to my voice had been. It struck me that Priya, Roshan, and I held one common tie in our bonds. Loneliness. I'd been alone in a new world. Roshan had been taken from all she'd known and mistreated for thousands of miles. Priya lived a secluded life in the forest. Perhaps this, and not artificial intelligence programmed game mechanics, was the source of our ease with each other. I wanted to believe that. Yes. Could you come here? 
withdrawing her hand from the porcupunk's hairs. Roshan pushed herself up, and one of Click's eyes shot open. My pet threw me a look, as if it took real nerve to call someone away from stroking her as she slumbered. I reached up with the scroll in hand. Roshan gave it a once-over. A binding scroll. Can you read it? She nodded and handed it back. It is a neutral spell, so its script is in the common tongue of old. I can read it. Can you bind my bag to me with it? Realization dawned on her features. Yes. I'm sorry, Gemini, I didn't grasp the purpose of your summons. She unfurled the scroll and read it in its entirety. Then she peered back at me as her hands glowed in yellow light. Placing her hand on my shoulder, she set the other on my bag. My hair stood on end as if static electricity summoned us. I perceived the slightest blast of wind, and then it was over. Check your inventory, Gemini. Magic bag of holding. 48 slot bag. Type. Container. Quality. Rare. Soul bound to Gemini Fowler. Awesome. She patted my cheek, then returned to Click and Priya. I returned to my inventory. Aside from the gold, I also had 96 silver and nowhere to spend any of it. My eyes ticked to one of the slots in the chest. True Steel Sword of Slashing. Level 12. Slot. Weapon. Type. Sword. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 50 of 50. Physical damage. 13 to 17. Plus 5 slashing damage. Plus 5 to melee attack. Plus 2 HP per tick. Score! Gemini! Roshan beckoned. Withdrawing the sword from the bag, I ran my eyes along its smooth, flawless blade and whistled. Gemini? Roshan beckoned again. Yeah? I didn't look up. Your utterances startle your pet, and they do little for the calm for which my nerves long. This from a woman who commanded a skeleton and healed herself through a battle against a magic sword. Sounds like you have selective nerves. Roshan smirked. I am not currently in combat. But look, Click growled. Oh, shut up. I crossed the room and set the sword across her lap. Very nice, Roshan said. Unfortunately, it is too high level for me to see its stats. So, non-players can't see higher level item stats. Hmm. I read them to her and was satisfied I received no system warnings about violating the player's agreement. That hadn't been the overwhelming reception I'd expected, but I was dealing with a caster who wielded scepters and staves. When you reach the required level, this could be a good weapon, Priya said. I hope you will wield it with much success. That was only a little better. Okay, I think I saw something else that might excite you. I rifled through the chest inventory and found the icon of a thick, straight pole. Staff of Endless Bounties. Level 8. Slot. Weapon. Type. Two-handed staff. Quality. Uncommon. Durability. 47 of 50. Damage. 10 to 14. Light magic. Plus 3. This staff increases the chances you will find magic items by 9%. Intensifies the power of light spells by 2%. Automatically binds to caster. Do you wish to bind staff of endless bounties to you? Yes or no? Selecting no, I dropped the staff on the rug between them and both their eyes flicked to activate their own interfaces. Each of their mouths formed a perfect, precious O. They were about all the reaction I needed. Gemini, this is a fine staff. Roshan blurted. But, she peered. Priya, may I have your leave to observe you in my interface? Priya shot her a sexy gander and pressed a finger to her lips. You want to take a closer look? Roshan blushed. You tease me, Priya. I am a servant of the light. Priya smiled. Apologies, priestess. I suppose I am a bit of a flirt. You don't say, I interjected. The half-elf rolled, crossed her legs yogi-style, wearing a satisfied grin. You may check me at your leisure, sister. No need to ask. Roshan did, 
and I watched as her eyes flicked around, reading her new friend's stats. I jerked as Roshan blurted out. Shadow magic? Priya shrugged. Yes, what's wrong? But you said nothing. Roshan jumped to her feet with such an effortless grace, I wondered what physical training she'd had in her village back home. She paced back and forth. I've never engaged with someone who practiced the dark arts. She threw her hands up. Priya got to her feet. Roshan? But Roshan prattled on. It is against every fiber of my being. How do you live with such affinities? How, how did I not detect this darkness? Maybe that thing on her back counteracts her shadow affinity or something, I said. I doubt that's an element of shadow, considering how it made me feel. Roshan's eyes flickered between us, eventually landing a suspicious glare upon me. I could almost hear the cogs turning, and, though her lips parted a few times as if she'd speak, she pressed them back together and let her thoughts process. Besides, you told me below ground that Solara isn't a jealous goddess. That many forms of magic are used by the pious, right? Why not shadow? Roshan gazed through me. Her words came distant. Yes, a quandary. You don't seem to be a dark creature. Her eyes flicked around her inner face again. Hmm, you have no class. Hey, what do you mean I have no class? Just because I live alone and don't have opportunities to practice social graces? Roshan shook her head. I meant you have selected no class. It was Priya's turn to flush red. Oh, she straightened her own nighty. I see. Roshan smiled. May I ask why? Because I have not been offered one. I have no mentor other than my aunt, who, consistent with my luck, casts in the light. She is a nature specialist. Ah, Roshan nodded. A fine specialty. So she says. However, it is outside my affinity. I had the nagging sense there had to be a metaphor in here, but I would be damned if I could find it. I shoved the thought away. I have heard the intent of the caster and a selective attitude when it comes to spell choice make for very powerful casters indeed. I have only read this, mind you, never experienced it, but it is not beyond possibility. Perhaps, sister, you will let me guide you in your efforts to help you on your way. I cringed. Though I hadn't known Priya for long, she struck me as the independent type and might not take well to Roshan's offering of what amounted to intrusion in her life choices. But she utterly surprised me. Would you have me? Priya swooned and stepped forward, clutching the light priestess's shoulders. Truly, I would be honored. Their faces were inches apart. Go ahead. Kiss her. I grinned. They ignored me. Thank you, Roshan. I will not let you down. She threw her arms around Roshan's neck and the mage grasped in response. She patted Priya's back gently. Yes, of course. She pulled away, holding Priya's arms between them, and peered at me. What? I asked. Her response was directed at Priya. He eyes you with hunger. Fantasies abound in his filthy mind. Priya squinted and threw me a suspicious gander. Is that so? How can you tell? I don't know what you two are talking about. I'm over here looting. The way they both pursed their lips at me was priceless. Wait, I said. How did you... The answer is in my interface. I stare at it right before my eyes, the text floating between us just now. Roshan, you checked me without asking. You have given me permission. Do not try to recant out of convenience. I shrugged and looked away. I'm afraid I have no idea what you mean. Priya, you will find new information in your companion tab now that Gemini is one. Priya continued to smile as her eyes flicked to and fro. Oh, she covered her mouth. I see. Roshan nodded. What? I threw my hands up. What do you see? Why... You adore both of us. What? It's right here, Gemini, Priya said, thrusting a hand onto her hip. You are enamored with me. Her eyes flicked up and down my body. Wow, 
You move fast. I check my interface. You are enamored with me. Priya shrugged. I never claimed I didn't move fast. I have an excuse. I met so few men. None, really. Besides, you rescued me from a life of slavery in an orb. What's your excuse? Roshan interrupted before I could answer. Funny you should mention he saved you from a life of slavery, Roshan mused aloud. He has a way of doing that, endearing women to him by pulling them from the jaws of Holcrum. Then, when he must acknowledge he shares their feelings, well, he just shrivels up like a dead bloomberry. Hey! They both barked laughter. I joined in. Then I returned my attention to her character sheet. Pre, it's... I do not like that. My aunt called me that, and I made her stop. I'm no longer a child. He did the same to me earlier. Rosh, indeed. How do you know your aunt called you that as a child if you can't remember it? Gah, obviously she called me that as an adult. I told her I didn't like it, and she said, But I called you that as a child, and you didn't mind. Then I said, Well, I'm no longer a child. Do not call me that. And she said, I sighed, Priya, it's time we look at your abilities and discuss your options. You have some points I can spend for you. What? Her head swiveled to gander at Roshan and me in turn. Is this what you spoke of in the dark place? Krolls, she spat on the floor. Layer? Yes, your attributes. Strength, dexterity, intelligence? Roshan nodded. Our companion can strengthen our abilities when we level. What? You mean I don't have to climb trees incessantly to gain strength? Roshan shook her head. Priya squinted at her. Read all night for months to gain intellect? Roshan shook her head. Priya turned to me. You may have my body now, if you desire it. I realized at that moment that desire was the right word. I understood why my interface labeled my interest in her as enamored. But we had business to tend to, and I needed to think about level 10. Despite my best efforts, I wondered what would happen if I died before level 10 and never experienced sex in Anora. Would I ever forgive myself? You wouldn't be around to forgive yourself, idiot. I shook the thoughts away. She was just kidding. 33. A few quick calculations revealed Priya had earned 33 attribute points through daily actions. I had the distinct feeling that was a significant number, but considering a lifetime spent in the forest, maybe not. I wondered if it was possible to lose attributes the way they could be earned, naturally. What if someone with a given strength rating started to sit around on their butts and let their muscles atrophy? Would the total attribute drop? After earning nine levels overall, she had 16 available attribute points to add to her total. It occurred to me she might have gained levels involuntarily by dispensing her former master's will below ground. I decided not to bring it up on the outside chance I was right. I scrolled through her character screen and found some really exciting stuff. Priya had woodworking skills and was already an expert forester. In addition, she had skinning talents. She was level 41 in forestry and level 18 in carpentry. She explained that she built and performed repairs on her tree hovel all the time, and I knew she cut her own firewood. I read the tooltip for profession rankings. Occupation skill ranks. Beginner. Levels 1 to 10. Apprentice. Levels 11 to 20. Adept. Levels 21 to 30. Journeyman. Levels 31 to 40. Expert. Levels 41 to 50. Master, levels 51 to 60. Grandmaster, levels 61 through 70. When I swiped the occupational skills aside, her chapter pane returned to focus. Priya Sky, level 9 half-elf. Natural casters, hunters, and woodsmen. Elves are creatures of the forest who enjoy extended lifespans when compared to other humanoids. Attributes. Strength, 8. Dexterity, 3. Intelligence, 4. Wisdom, 4. 
Constitution, 12. Charisma, 8. Priya has 16 unspent attribute points. Combat skills, ranged, 14. Melee, 5. Defensive skills, dodge, 8. Parry, 2. Weapon skills, bow, 14. Blunt, 7. Occupational skills, not to be confused with combat professions, occupational skills allow people to earn a wage, run a business, build foundations, or create weapons, armor, and potions to supplement adventuring. Carpentry, 18. Rank, Apprentice. Tooltip, carpenters use wood as their primary ingredient in the construction of structures, wooden weapons, and furniture. Forestry 41. Rank. Expert. Tool tip. Foresters are lumberjacks skilled with axes. They also make excellent field hands and use scythes as their secondary gathering tools. Skinning. 15. Rank. Apprentice. Tool tip. Skinners remove hides from vanquished animal beings and sometimes humanoid ones to be used as raw materials by leather workers, clothiers, blacksmiths, and other professions. Tanning is often selected by skinners as a secondary occupation to create leathers. Cooking, 48. Rank, expert. Tool tip, yum. Cooks use myriad ingredients to concoct tasty dishes to feed the hungry, boost morale, and provide buffs to tradesmen and adventurers alike. Botany, 47. Rank, expert. Tooltip. Botanists specialize in growing and identifying plant life. Advanced botanists can use herbs to create healing poultices and other advanced medicines. Affinities. Shadow magic, 100%. Shadow is a powerful discipline of capable magic that draws on the dark powers of Enora. Often mistaken for an evil form of magic, shadow is the balancing force of the light. Wielders of shadow magic often worship Vamoth, the gatekeeper of the underworld. Though it is possible to successfully wield any school of magic without religious affiliation, certain buffs can be obtained using shrines. Elemental magic, 57%. Languages, elven, common. That was a ton to absorb. I counted myself lucky I had time to go through it. Priya, you are exceptional. You are a master forester and cook, an expert tanner and a journeyman carpenter. You're amazing. Priya blushed under my genuine praise. You are so kind, Gemini. So different from what my aunt told me to expect from men. I fear she led me astray. Don't be so sure. Men want what they want and have various ways of getting it. I stared into her eyes. Besides, if you value her warnings, why do you flirt? She shrugged. You're pretty. I waited for more of an answer, but none came. I really was feeling endeared to Priya, so I gave a word of warning. I don't want you to think less of me for saying so, but someone as striking as you might bring out the worst of inclinations of those lacking moral fortitude. She shot me a curious glance. Why would I think less of you for saying so? I guess I wouldn't want you to think I'm a pig. Perish the thought from your pretty head, Gemini, for I have relished the sight of your hard muscles enough times to balance our water kettles. Seriously, Priya, if you're interested in adventuring with us, I pledge to help you protect yourself from men who seek to corrupt you. No more kidnappings. A true wonder, Priya said. She turned her eyes on Roshan. That such a man would be sent from Solara to save me from the darkness. Shh! Roshan shushed and pressed a finger to the half-elf's lips. It would fill his head with ideas of grandeur. His ego could inflate to untainable levels. I changed the subject before her words could become prophecy. Focusing on Priya's stats with a bit more intent, I read the less familiar tool tips to get a better picture. It goes without saying that you'll want to spend points in intellect. With your magical affinity, your casting power could blossom. But we also need to consider wisdom. 
But what if added wisdom brings me to my senses, and I decide throwing all my berries into your basket is unwise? I mocked laughter. Very funny. No, it doesn't work that way. You seem plenty wise to me, even if mostly wise asked. Priya's nose crinkled up. Somehow I don't decipher your words as complimentary. I tilted my head to one side, her suddenly elevated diction garnering more than a passing interest. Priya, how were you educated? I don't recall my education. I never thought to ask my aunt, but I always assumed my parents taught me what they could. Hmm. Interesting. Why do you ask? She leaned back onto her elbows atop the rug and gazed at me expectantly. Because your intelligence jumped out at me. Often your words are indicative of a refined vocabulary like Roshan's. I suppose you have been blessed by Solara, Gemini, to have such intelligent women in your midst. I guess so. My mind started racing. Something about my ally's intellects picked at my brain. Did Honora, D.A.I., gift certain races with higher IQs? No, that would have been racist as hell. If Roshan truly came from a village, wouldn't that imply a lack of access to education? Did her priest, Master Mitwa, teach her? Or did a higher IQ baseline from the beginning of Enora's evolution pass the gift of higher language throughout the generations? Would I experience races less gifted? Or was everyone I encountered going to toss in high-minded sentiments at random? Priya was staring at me. I had to retrace our conversation to pick up where I left off. Wisdom affects how fast you regain mana. Very important if we're ever in prolonged combat. Priya's eyes brightened. Do you really think I could adventure with you? She thrust out her fingers. My hands tremble at the notion I might burn men like Kroll. You seem to be adaptable, I said. With your professional skills you've learned to survive in the dark wood, I'm sure you could become quite an adventurer and save us some coin. And you would be willing to teach me the combat piece? While Priya's excitement was a welcome sentiment, I wasn't sure she grasped the full extent of the sacrifices she would have to make. There's no telling what Jara would think of my adoption of her niece into a dangerous lifestyle where she could end up dead. What would she think about Priya aligning herself with me? Priya, you understand questing with us would mean leaving your home, right? Roshan and I will be moving beyond the dark wood. Very far beyond it. Her chin ticked up, and Priya glanced over at Roshan. Oh, she nodded. Right. Of course. She peered around her dome. I guess you wouldn't want to make this a place of respite. That makes sense. After taking in her surroundings for another moment, she shrugged. That would be okay. It's rather boring, my life. I'd like to see more of the outside world. I decided not to ask what Jara would think of the idea of her running off and gallivanting across the world with me. That would come up when we met with the Matron of the Wood. Maybe since I'd completed her quest, she wouldn't smite me, or something. Adventuring's also dangerous, I said. She pursed her lips. My life might be simple, Gemini, but I am not. I know adventuring is dangerous. Though she calls herself a simple girl from the woods, when it's convenient. I nodded. I don't think you're simple in the least. She smiled. Good. Tell me more about your thoughts on my attributes. She adjusted her boobs and tossed me a sideways smile. I clinched my molars. Right. So we want to spend in those two areas, um, wisdom and intellect. I noticed you have a charisma score of twelve that you earned naturally. Her head bobbed with enthusiasm. Yes. Negotiating in Broomhill increased it. Right. See? While you are charismatic, I don't think that stat necessarily reflects your attractiveness or allure, just that you can get better deals. I got ten points for doing nothing, and the two of you seem to tolerate me. Cherish you, Roshan corrected. I am drawn to the light in you. I love you too. The sarcastic words had escaped my mouth before I knew what I was saying. Horrified. I was flooded with sudden regret as my mind revisited rejections following premature utterances in my former world. It was like scratching old wounds. The open professing of my emotions was no problem in Enora. 
Rashawn hadn't rejected me in the least. Just the opposite. Still, I cringed as that old world part of me expected a reaction based on stigmas. But Rashan alleviated the tension without pause. Of course you love me, she said. My interface says so. Funny. Alas, you will settle for the love of a sister. I waved a hand. Right, vows of chastity and all that. Although I didn't like to take gifts for granted, I wondered how Roshan and I had bonded this much in a day. I guess challenging times did that. Soldiers in a foxhole and all. Game mechanics might play a part, too, but I wanted to believe the feelings were natural. It helped to keep dark thoughts at bay. I have taken no such vows, Priya said. I shook my head in derision. You are a persistent flirt. I turned my attention back to Priya's stats, and my inner nerd bloomed. The interface's advancement schema is blind, which isn't helpful. Schema, she asked, her lips and eyebrows equally twisted in confusion. The interface doesn't tell me what abilities you'll receive as you advance. You could get skill bonuses and learn new abilities with each level you gain. I just have no way of knowing what they might be. I assume they'll become heavily class-dependent later. Well, you have been gifted with this power to spend these points for your companions. You should do what you think is best. If Solara trusts you with this responsibility, so will I. Wait now. Hold on. I spent some of Rashan's points because they complemented other points spent a certain way. I believe her last trainer built her abilities to complement a magic class. But you're a clean slate and have 16 points available. You could be a warrior, a rogue, or a ranged damage dealer if that was your desire. Or you could choose to make the most of your magic affinity and become a caster. Then you could wield spells from a distance. I don't know the available classes, but the options could be foundless. I think you should spend the points since you seem to have intuitions I don't understand, Priya said. But I find myself excited by the prospect of hurling magic violence at evil beings. In light of Babylon and other games, players who rolled characters purely to fill a need in a group didn't always end up happy with their choices. More than once I'd discovered friends playing secret characters in lieu of showing up for guild runs so they could play classes they found they preferred after getting to know the game. If Priya was going to uproot herself from a quiet life in the forest to be with Rashan and me, I didn't just want her to be successful. I wanted her to be happy. Then I should let your enthusiasm guide us. Maybe we will spend them slowly. We're not bound by time, and I don't think we have any weapons to discover an offensive magic class anyway. Hmm. Sounds like too much pressure. I'm not a patient person. Grr. Roshan cleared her throat. An impatient person with an affinity for shadow magic. No, that could never end badly. Priya glared at her through slits. I could end that vow of chastity for you, priestess. My eyebrows launched upward. Your seductions will not serve you here, demon. Roshan tilted her chin up and looked away. But Priya smiled at the mockery. Roshan fought a smile. It was a losing effort, but the struggle left me a second to interrupt and redirect. Okay. Mining along that vein of thought, why don't you sit next to Rashan while I fiddle with your points? Twist my wrist, won't you? Priya slid closer to Rashan and rested her head on her shoulder. Rashan smiled and slipped an arm around Priya's waist. It's nice to have friends, Priya said as she leaned in and set a gentle hand on Rashan's leg. Rashan covered it with her own, but didn't speak. Okay, so we'll start here. Priya Sky, level nine, no class, half elf, strength, eight, dexterity, three, intelligence, four, wisdom, four, constitution, twelve, charisma, eight. Priya has sixteen unspent attribute points, attributes affected by natural life activities and not level advancement training. Sixteen points. Let's spend a few and see what new skills pop up. I did the math, nodded to myself, and focused. After spending two points in intellect, I received a message. Due to your companion's maximum affinity for shadow magic, 
Enora has granted her. Shadow Void. Spell. The caster opens a portal to the underworld and banishes chaotically aligned creatures within two levels into Hulkram's Void. Cost, 100 mana. Cooldown, 30 minutes. I announced the boon and both their jaws dropped. Priya sat up, blinked her eyes in succession to open her interface. That doesn't sound like an evil thing to me, Rashan. Her eyes flicked around as she searched. Nor to me, Rashan blurted. I nodded. Seems some preconceptions were off the mark. I distributed three more intellect points, allowing her to adjust to the sensations of her growing strengths in each category. When I spent her fifth point overall and clicked to spend her sixth, a flurry of text filled my interface. I scanned it, and my head jerked. I squinted unnecessarily and read more carefully. My lips formed the words silently as I became hyper-focused, but I didn't care. About halfway through, I flicked my eyes toward Priya and back to my interface several times. What is it, Gemini? she asked. Is something wrong? While non-players can level their attributes through labor and interaction, they may also purchase attribute upgrades from trainers in Anora. But Anoran trainers can spend only five attribute points per trainee. Players do not share this attribute cap, but privileges come at a cost. While you have the ability to spend unlimited attribute points on the behalves of your companions, doing so will result in the companion being permanently bound to you. In order to bind a companion to you, the companion must hold a disposition of friendly or better toward you. After level 10, fallen non-players who are bound to you will resurrect at your spawn point if they are not revived after battle. If you fall in battle, bound companions will continue to fight until your enemies are vanquished or they fall. Bound creatures may not wander beyond 10 miles from their bonder unless given leave to do so. This setting is found in the character pane in a checkbox called Free Roaming. If you have a foundation or pay for a room at an inn, you can leave the non-player behind at your choosing, but you will still be bound. While bonds between non-players are broken by death, this player-to-non-player bond is permanent. Be aware, there is no limit to the number of NPCs who can be bound to you, as long as they are a friendly disposition or higher upon binding. You may bind a non-player of friendly or higher disposition without permission. This bond can only be broken when the non-player is killed by your own hand. Binding cannot be undone. Are you sure you wish to spend further attribute points and permanently bind Priya Sky to you? Yes or no? Um... Your skin resembles goat milk, Roshan said. What's the source of your distress? Does Priya have an evil ability now? Shall trees shrivel in her unholy wake? Will porcupunks melt under her gaze? My smallest companion's head popped up and she clicked repeatedly. Roshan and Priya giggled. I didn't laugh. I couldn't. Nor could I tighten the hinge on my loose jaw. Forever. Does this mean if I spend another point on Roshan, she'll be permanently bound to me too? And if so... Wouldn't binding Priya make us some kind of weird harem thing? I pushed myself up to my feet. I need to, um, take a walk. What? Priya asked. Do you want me to guide you? The force can twist you around at night. I shook my head. I'll stay close and use stealth. Don't worry. I moved toward the door, but a hand grasped my shoulder and turned me. Priya gazed up at me set her hands on both shoulders and smiled. It's okay, whatever it is. I'm filled with excitement with the prospect of following you to glory and bringing honor to your family name. My pledge is true, and I will never dishonor the man who liberated me from the clutches of darkness. It's not trusting you that's the problem. It's trusting myself. The distress shining in her eyes served only to make me feel like crap. I didn't want to be a secretive jerk with women so transparent and devoted, but I needed a minute. Time with my own thoughts. Uncontested. This was my life now. Permanent actions were forever. I couldn't log out if I regretted them. An NPC or not, I wasn't going to kill this creature because of a decision I regretted later. Roshan slid beside Priya and gripped her arm. 
let him gather his thoughts. She peered at me and bowed her head shortly. He will tell us what we need to know. Glaring at the taller of the two women, words I'd read in the system warning flashed in my head. If NPC trainers could only train five points per adventurer, then how had she built her current loadout? It seemed her master Mitwa had tricks up his sleeve. Priya stepped back. Many predatory creatures roam only in darkness. Please stay close to the meadow so the wards will keep them at bay. I nodded and stepped into the night. 34. This was intense. I'd known Priya for less than a day, and I was supposed to make decisions about her destiny. When I was halfway across the meadow, the door to Priya's dome thumped. As I turned, a dark figure low to the ground bounded across the tall grass in my direction. Her little black eyes glimmered in the glow cast by double moons. She rattled off a tippany of clicks. I don't know what I was thinking, leaving without you. Stay close. She clicked happily and sprang off into the high grass. I considered her as she went. Here, I had a pet. A companion I could resurrect if she died. And Nora was essentially offering me the same kind of arrangement with my human and half-elf friends. All I had to do was spend some attribute points and I could offer them immortality. So why was I troubled? Wasn't that the ultimate gift? Casting stealth, I stood in the center of the open meadow and peered up at the star-littered blanket of space. Opening my companion tab and peering at Priya, I saw she leaned, probably against Rashan. Those two had bonded quickly. I didn't really care if that was a game mechanic thing or if they were just thrilled to be in the company of other people, other women. It made sense, considering they'd both just been held captive by some filthy men, some of whom were still out in these woods, searching for us. Someday players would take advantage of Anoran NPCs and have their ways with them. I spied conflict in my future. That spoke volumes about the realism of these people. Even though I couldn't see the Eastern woman in Priya's companion pain, I knew she leaned against Roshan by the unnatural tilt of her upper body and head. An asterisk hovered next to the half-elf's age of twenty-one. There was no tooltip, and that was pretty strange. She certainly appeared to be around my age, but when I considered her memory eraser, it struck me as a clue to something bigger. It was possibly a rare glitch. Hearing her unabashed giggle echoing in my head, I ignored the asterisk and focused on the reason I'd gone outside. She'd spent her life living in this forest, trading in Broomhill, or whatever she'd called the town outside the dark wood. Seemed to be the extent of her social interactions with the outside world. Could someone so young and with such limited exposure properly weigh decisions like this? Wouldn't any chance to leave what was familiar seem an exciting proposition? Was I an idiot for even thinking in those terms when I lived in a world designed to drop these opportunities on my doorstep? If that was how the game was designed, was it wrong for me to accept her into the party and take her away? I'd promised to respect their free will. Didn't binding them to me spit in the face of that sentiment? If the AI was truly adaptive and sentient, I wondered about its perspective in regard to my thoughts and actions. I would have bet Nakuro Takamoto would have giggled relentlessly at the idea he'd spawned a game world where a player could be rife with conflict over the treatment of NPCs because they were so real. But if he would have, he'd have been fooling himself. I wasn't the average player. Others would think differently than me. It would be a game to them. If I treated the world like a simple game, how could I live in it? How would I find purpose? I didn't even know how long it would exist. But from what I'd seen so far, it could last beyond what would have been my natural life on Earth. This place was crazy, and, if I was being honest with myself, it was fun, in an oh-my-god-don't-let-me-die kind of way. If not for the lingering doom, I'd be having a hell of a time. Priya sat up and smiled in the companion pain. Her lips crinkled in excited conversation. I found myself smiling at the sight of her, and it brought to mind the proverbial tree in the woods that fell and no one heard. Seeing her like that made her even more real. Being born to non-players and living here has shaped who Priya is. But can she possibly know who she wants to be? 
Does the suddenness with which she pledged to adventure with me reflect a naivety? Or is she just accepting the way things are done when someone saves another's life? Does she just feel honor-bound like Roshan? Did Jara teach her that? The AI had taken over and essentially locked out the developers. Anora was God here, a protector of her world's purity, working to keep it as authentic as possible. As a permanent fixture in her world, I played by her rules. The glaring benefit of that was immortality, in a sense. By bonding to her, if I live past level 10, Priya will respawn where I do. She will never die. She might not even age. Maybe she wouldn't have her life in the forest. But is that so bad, if she gets to live on and on? Does she want to live on and on? I flipped back to my interface, searching for something else that had nagged me in the moment. If you have a foundation or accommodations at an inn, you can leave the non-player behind at your choosing, but you will still be bound. What the hell is a foundation? Finding no tool tip and knowing the answer wasn't going to come to me on the soft breeze bending the high grass at my knees, I shoved that thought aside for later, like so many others. A heavy voice surged from the darkness to my right, causing my bones to quiver. I realized I'd been circling the meadow and was close to the dome, where the treant stood permanent watch. You seem troubled, Gemini. Glowing golden eyes peered at me from the density of the great treant's shadows. My voice quivered as I responded. Hello, Magellan. I hope I didn't disturb you. Mmm, Magellan hummed, causing the leaves high in his branches to shimmy. No need to worry yourself, young one. What troubles you? Priya, I said simply. Ah, a complicated creature, that one. Is she? Indeed, quite spirited, fiercely independent. I'm not sure that's the impression I've gotten, I said. I feel she has warmed to us. Branches creaked and the eyes inched forward. So, what troubles? I wondered if it violated the player's agreement to answer the question. But Magellan asked, so I decided to roll the dice and try to keep the discussion theoretical. I have an inner philosophical quandary. Questions about people's rights to choose their own destinies and whether they have the experience to draw on to make such choices. There's no need to muddy the truth with me. I knew the day would come when Priya would leave the dark wood and rush out to face her destiny. This was expected. Her will is as free as any. You think she wants to leave? I am bound by a pledge of silence, Gemini. But I believe it is scribbled in Anora's annals of time that Priya Sky will have a great impact upon this world. When she returned with your party, I presumed Solara had intervened, and her new beginning had come. I peered up at him as I folded my arms across my chest. How can you know anything of the sort, if you'll excuse my gall? I welcome your gall, human. Never have I laid eyes on a creature with the unique powers you wield. I find your essence enlightening. What powers are those? If you don't know, best you should discover them yourself. Perhaps you will grow with your companions and form lifelong bonds. But Priya will require balance as you aid her. Aid her? You know little. Thanks. Suffice to say, Priya is more than the sum of her surroundings. From her emanates the very essence of Solara, the essence of Anora. She is pure of heart, while powerful of soul. Dark affinity in a creature born of a family line bathed so richly in the light is a harbinger of the arrival of something unique. Something that will change the world forever. When I sensed the depth of your many affinities, it seemed only fitting you would pair. If I level Priya's attributes further, she will be bound to you, Magellan finished my thought. So this is what troubles you, that you have been given power to bind a powerful creature to your will. With this, I can help. 
How so? Tell me, Gemini, in pondering whether it is appropriate to bind Priya to you, did you ever stop to consider that you were also binding yourself to her? Well, I suppose. Be decisive, the tree barked. As my chest fluttered, my eyes shot to Priya's wooden dome, expecting her to appear in the doorway and wonder why I was pissing off her magic tree friend. But she didn't appear. The tree aunt measured his tone. No one else can hear me, Gemini. Though my lips move for your own benefit, I speak inside your mind. That's a little spooky, dude. I require your answer. I cleared my throat. Have I considered how binding her to me also binds me to her? How about we skip ahead? I guess what you're getting at is that I fear being responsible for her. Power and foolishness are a combination of which to be weary, Gemini. In Priya you have potential. In you, the same potential. In the priestess, the same. Now tell me, granted such a gift as trustworthy companions willing to follow you anywhere you go, as if it were ordained that you would blossom together like petals of the same flower, what is the source of your doubt? Your fear of failing them? The treant's branches rustled in what I thought of as a shrug. Set this aside. You're better served by thinking of Priya as yet another tool toward your success with whom you can also bond and enjoy as a companion. I hadn't thought of it that way, I muttered. That actually makes a lot of sense. Why do you sound surprised that a thousand years old treant would possess wisdom? Now I feel like an idiot. Of course, you must first face the test of the matron. I cocked my head up. Her aunt? Will Jara be a problem? Magellan laughed. She's very protective of her kin, I assure you. I'm certain she's seen your worth but it's more a question of whether she'll be ready to unleash Priya on the world. For now, I believe you must address the truth of your own inner conflict before turning your thoughts to Jara. In this, I will aid you. I welcome your aid, wise Trion, I said, pouring it on. Your wisdom has returned. Trion's bark spread into a semblance of lips and smiled at me revealing light-colored wood beneath its bark. Open your map. I did. Priya's dome was in the northeast region of the dark wood areas I discovered. The lake where I'd found Roshan sat to the south, and Jara's tree was a few clicks to the southeast. Now withdraw your perspective so you see the larger world. Zooming out, I scrolled east to west across Enora. Undiscovered territories zoomed by as I continued to scroll. A lump jumped into my throat as the scrolling continued. The dark wood in which I sat was but a pinprick of all to be discovered. How significant are your problems in the scope of such a world, Gemini? How much evil lurks in those areas yet undiscovered? If you wish to play a role in such a vast world and live up to your potential... What do you think should be your first consideration since you are but one man? Lucera's voice came to me for a third time, creating a memorial hat trick. I spoke the words aloud. I must make friends. Hmm. Wisdom indeed. Priya was worthy of immortality, and I'd peel enemy skin from bone to keep Roshan in my life. Though I'd only known her for a day, the light priestess already felt like a part of me, my anchor. With the addition of Priya, we were a perfect triangle. Shadow affinity, light affinity, and the player who was both. Though I could have thumped my head, I was encouraged by realization of the thing that had been missing. I'm the problem. I haven't pledged myself to them. The bloated sense of importance I put on my own existence holds me back. Thank you, Magellan. I will forever be grateful for your wisdom. Mmm. Then he closed his eyes. I don't understand, Priya said. Nor do I, Roshan said. I know, it's hard to grasp. I guess I should have planned better how I was going to explain this, but if you'll hear me out, 
I'll try to make better sense. I scooted between them and took their hands in mine, resting them on their folded legs. The reason I can manipulate your skill points is that I have a special ability beyond spending attribute points, or linked to that. When you became my companions, it changed everything. I told you you are special, Roshan said. A fine noob, if I ever met one. Yeah, well, that's nice and all, but let me finish. She nodded. Priya squeezed my hand tighter. When I was counting out Priya's skill points, I realized another special ability. If I spend more than five attribute points for someone, they become bound to me, permanently. We can never be separated, except by my leave. What? Priya asked. Like a possession, Roshan asked incredulously. I do not pledge my life lightly, and serve with distinction I shall, but I am no possession. This time she stood and paced behind me. How is it I am your possession? I didn't say you were my possession. I don't want to own you. Priya gripped my hand tighter and turned her head. Roshan, come and sit. Let him finish. Roshan sat but didn't reach for my hand. I knew it wasn't because I was any less liked. I'd brought up the companion tab and was keeping an eye on her disposition during the entire conversation, after all, but because she didn't suffer ignorance. It was her nature. Intelligence about the world around her was vital to how she perceived herself. Talk, noob. I chuckled. You've wondered at my desire to make it to level ten. Yes? Are you going to explain this thing you're withholding? I blurted it out. If I make it to level ten, I cannot die. This time it was Priya who released my hand. You're right. My head swiveled. You believe me? No, I was talking to Roshan. We swear service to a crazy fool. Roshan nodded agreement. I was afraid of this, I muttered. It's not an easy thing to explain, but if you'll bear with me, I'll give you what you need. And tell us, great one, what do we need? Roshan asked sharing a curt nod with Priya, who mimicked it. I sighed. If I get to level ten, and I have bound you to me, and someone kills me, I will reappear somewhere else. When this happens, anyone bound to me who dies will respawn with me. Respawn? What is this silly word? Resurrect, I corrected. Priya rolled her eyes and sang her response. Foolishness. It's not foolishness, I sang in reply. Priya tried to fight a smile. And you say you can prove this? Roshan asked. Yes, after I reach level ten, and if I die. Well then, this problem is solved, Roshan said. Why? I asked. She stood. Because I have no intention of letting my friends die. Enough of this insanity. I am not finished. I am finished. She cocked her chin in the air and stepped onto the soft rug. I shook my head. Okay, Roshan, you can walk away. We can discuss it when you level again. But I've spent the maximum of points allowed on Priya unless I bind her to me. Priya perked up, but she didn't speak. Instead, she pushed up from the soft rug and turned to face me. The light of the oil lamp on her bedside table penetrated the top of her thin gown and accentuated her round hips. I closed my eyes, focusing. Priya raised my chin with a finger. It is you who is simple. Perhaps I have been coy with you. Maybe you need it spelled out. Do I have your attention, Gemini? You have it. It is I who have experienced evil in this world on more than one occasion. I long to escape these woods and purge it while standing next to the two souls who rescued me. I pledge my service not just to you, but to Rashan the same. Since we left that place, I have found the both of you to be true to Salar's way. I believe your path to be an honorable one. I don't ever want to be used for dark purposes against my will again. Gone was this flighty, fun-filled tone I'd experienced with Priya since dragging her out of Kroll's grasp. The weight of her gaze bore down, though her voice was gentle and firm. I want you to spend the points so I can fight against those who would enslave others like me. You are a silly man warning me against a gift I've already given to you. A bond. I cannot believe your crazy talk of immortality, 
but if you speak true, then let my service be everlasting. Her gaze hardened and she cocked an eyebrow. I nodded to show I was with her. I'm not some silly woman with which to be trifled. You see someone who prances through the wood barefoot and wearing little clothing who flirts with you. Even bound to your side, I am still Priya's sky, and no one will take that from me. So bind me, for I am already bound by my choice. She crossed to the bed, shrugged her robe from her shoulders, and lingered for a long moment, hands set on her hips. I looked away. Don't divert your eyes. This is the least of what I pledge. She pushed her shoulders back. But trust me when I say you will earn it. Priya climbed into the bed. When you are finished, come to bed. Then we will set out and turn in your quest so you might reach level ten and set this nonsense aside. Rashan stroked Click's flesh hairs by the fire. Priya pulled the furs up to her shoulders. I gandered back and forth between my inner face and the lump that was the half-elf woman nestled in the comfort of her bed. Then I opened Priya's character pane before my doubts could resurface and spent a point on intellect. For better or worse, the snarky half-elf with curves like a mountain highway and potential like a savant was glued to me. Game on. Thirty-five. We hiked a narrow trail winding along a creek to the south. When we approached the stretch of woods I'd traversed with Click before hearing Rashan's distant screams, I used the quest feature on my map to highlight the way to Jara's tree. We'd established that, since the women were my companions, they could see the quest path as well. Not that Priya needed a golden path to find her aunt's home. When we'd traveled for an hour, Priya stopped and spread her arms out to stretch. I loved the way her face scrunched up in unreserved pleasure as she unwound her knots. I am different, Gemini, Priya said, interlocking her fingers with mine as Click scurried ahead of the group. I squeezed her hand as it swung gently, though I felt like a freshman in high school with a new girlfriend. How so? I feel stronger and more aware, alert. Right? What gets me is you only gained one additional ability despite the number of points I pumped into your primary attributes. Yes, but a sleep spell should prove useful to your cause, right? Enthusiasm painted her face. I smiled. Absolutely, but you'll have to learn how to use it, and I'd just as soon not be the guinea pig. Trivialities, Priya said. All in time. Before turning in the previous evening, I'd done some more research and figured out various presets controlling what information displayed when perusing my HUD. I'd meticulously set a few presets as they applied to my companions and my own attributes so I could view as much or as little as I wanted. I checked Priya's stats using a more robust display setting. Priya Sky, Half Elf, Level 9, No Class, Attributes, Strength, 8, Dexterity, 3, Intelligence, 14, Wisdom, 10, Constitution, 12. Charisma, 8. Combat skills, ranged, 14. Melee, 5. Defensive skills, dodge, 8. Parry, 2. Weapon skills, bow, 14. Blunt, 7. Shadow void, level 8. Required affinity, shadow magic. The caster opens a portal to the underworld and banishes chaotically aligned creatures within two levels into the void. Cast time, three seconds. Cost, 100 mana. Cooldown, 30 minutes. Sleep, level nine. Required affinity, shadow magic. The caster calls forth dark essence to force a single adversary to slumber for up to one minute. Cast time, three seconds. Cost, 75 mana. Cooldown, N-A. This effect has diminishing returns when cast on the same target. Damage will end the effect. Occupational skills. Not to be confused with combat professions. Occupational skills allow people to earn a wage, run a business, build foundations, or create weapons, armor, 
and potions to supplement adventuring. Carpentry, 18. Rank, Apprentice. Tooltip. Carpenters use wood as their primary ingredient in the construction of structures, wooden weapons, and furniture. Forestry, 41. Rank, Expert. Tooltip. Foresters are lumberjacks skilled with axes. They also make excellent field hands and use scythes as their secondary gathering tools. Skinning, 15. Rank, Apprentice. Tooltip. Skinners remove hides from vanquished animal beings, and sometimes humanoid ones, to be used as raw materials by leather workers, clothiers, blacksmiths, and other professions. Tanning is often selected by skinners as a secondary occupation to create leathers. Affinities. Shadow magic, 100%. Elemental magic, 57%. Languages. Elven. Common. But I have grown, she said cheerfully. The sensations have blessed my bones all morning. Isn't that what life is about? Growth? Especially this life, I mumbled, none more loudly. Yes, you're right. I guess you'll be eligible for new spells now, but we will likely have to seek out a skill trainer or books to teach them to you. My people used books and scrolls to learn spells before magic was banned. So this is not unexpected, Roshan said. But my class was revealed to me when first I grabbed my scepter. Damn, I'd forgotten that. When Priya kidnapped you in the tunnels. That was Kroll, Priya barked. She didn't release my hand. I equipped your scepter. It offered me the light priest class. Roshan's shoes pattered on the earth as she sped to walk next to me. What do you mean, offered you? Are you saying you can switch from one class to another? I nodded. Yes. She stopped. We took two more steps and turned back. That is impossible. I've only heard legends of such beings as this. Players from 2,000 years ago, maybe? Well, here I am. I wasn't sure how else to say it. A glance over my shoulder revealed the glowing trail ended before us. And here we are, I said. Roshan glanced past me, then threw me an uncertain look. You'll get used to me, I promise, I said. Roshan nodded, though her expression didn't change. I eyed the tree and my heartbeat ratcheted up. This was going to be a moment of truth, and not because I was turning in a quest. Jar would have her own ideas about Priya and me. I doubted she would smite me, but I wouldn't put anything past Anora. When I turned my head... I found my half-elf companion glaring at me. Priya released my hand and grasped my shoulder. Did she warm to you? Did she glow for you? She evidently read the answer in my eyes as I relived the nirvana when I first met Jara, and she set her calming magic on me. And when she'd offered me a special physical reward I had no intention of chasing in upon my successful return. She did. I shrugged. Don't worry. I didn't. Priya gripped my shoulder. You must resist your urges. This is not jealousy. Binding with a dryad goddess binds you to a tree. Tell me you understand. My lovely niece, a voice whispered in the woods, seeming to come from all sides. Our heads whipped around as the matron appeared from behind the wide trunk of the massive tree into which I'd seen her morph a couple days before. The bark covering her form smoothed into flesh as she whipped out her arms and welcomed Priya. Come to my bosom, dear child, for I've missed you so. Hello, Aunt Milan, Priya said with a plastered smile, but her eyes communicated suspicion as she peered at me before she pressed her face against her aunt's neck. Milan. Jar appeared over Priya's shoulder. Gemini, I am heartened to see you've returned. I'd expected you yesterday when I felt the darkness recede. She held Priya at arm's length. Her eyes flickered to each side of her niece's face, and a tremor of foreboding washed over me. She's checking her inner face. And I see why, Jara snapped. I could have sworn my bones rattled as her voice echoed through the forest. She thrust out an accusing finger. Who bestowed upon you the right to bind my kin? 
The finger creaked as a bulb appeared on its end and extended into a rubbery vine. It shot across space between us and wrapped around my throat before I could react. Her eyes glowed yellow as her lips peeled back in a sneer. I did not ask you to involve my niece in your dirty little... Aunt Milan! Jara! Release him! You are but a child, Jara yelled, and her voice echoed through the forest. A breeze rose and leaves rattled. Jara's hair blew in streams. Roshan raised her scepter, but Jara needed only peer at her for a moment before it dropped to the ground. The priestess was bathed in white light, and her shoulders dropped. Click skittered toward me as I grasped the vine surrounding my neck. It hardened in my grasp. I am a woman grown who pledged my fealty to him. Priya slapped at her aunt's shoulders. I bestowed the right. Release him at once. You pledged? He pulled me from the clutches of darkness. I owe him a life debt. Priya folded her arms across her chest and her chin jutted up. And I am enamored with him. You are... Jara's chin dropped and she peered at me. What have you done to my beloved girl? I gasped and pointed at the vine as I tried to form words. Blood inflated my cheeks like a balloon. There was a looseness about Jara's expression that would have struck me as disingenuous if it hadn't been for the branch cutting off my air. Something in the matron's eyes poked at my brain for some reason. I sensed theatrics. Painful theatrics. Jara is strangling you. Minus ten HP. He can't answer you if you choke him to death, Priya barked, grabbing the branch. Release him now or I shall be gone forever. The tension around my throat relaxed as the branch slowly unwound from my neck, and I coughed air back into my lungs. I threw my arms up and protested through a crackling voice. Hey, I didn't do anything but pull her away from a dark prison. Kroll kept her in a binding orb at night and a black robe of binding when he needed her to do his dirty deeds. I didn't ask her to pledge anything to me. I asked for the opposite, for her to keep her free will. But you need to understand. I flicked a finger toward my friends. These women get fealty in their heads and it's done. There's no arguing. Mm-hmm, Jara replied. I threw my hands up. Are you telling me you didn't know she was there? That this might happen? She shook her head slowly from side to side as she took in her niece. He has bound you to him, my Priya. You are forever bound to this man, unless you want me to kill him before he reaches level ten. Do you see? Priya's head tilted to one side, her eyebrows furrowing in confusion. Then she turned those eyes on me and back to her aunt. You mean... Her chin pivoted toward me again. You were telling the truth. I nodded. I warned you. But aunt, does this really mean that I will not die? You are rendered immortal except if you die by his hand. Her eyes glowed red as she turned them on me. My throat felt thick. Nausea crept into my belly, and my kneecaps practically vanished. But that would never happen, would it, Gemini? <laughs> never in a million years, ma'am. I choked. Her eyes returned to their normal blue. Priya turned and launched into my arms, throwing her legs around me. She pressed her cheek to my neck. You have given me another gift I can never repay, Gemini. She planted short kisses on my neck, speaking between her words. I love you. I love you. I will never leave your side. I patted her back but suppressed my grin as my gaze lingered cautiously upon her aunt. She wrapped her legs and dropped to the ground. Words came in a rapid, syncopated rhythm. You must consummate our bond. Her hand slipped quickly down my abs and past my waist. You have been offered a legacy quest. Please, Priya. Priya has asked that you consummate your bond with her in the woods. Reward. 1,000 XP. Likely reward. Maximum relationship disposition with Priya. You gotta be kidding me. A sex quest? What the hell is a likely reward? You must do this, Jara whispered with a roll of her eyes. You will consummate your bond with my Priya. Only then will I consider your fealty mutual. 
Relief washed over me as a smile spread across her full lips, and it wasn't until then that my private parts began to respond. But I also saw a strange twinkle in Jara's eyes, something deeper in that expression that made me feel... deceived. Jara is holding something back. What's she hiding? That was when I realized Jara's lips hadn't moved. She hadn't spoken the words aloud. Like the treant the night before, she'd projected them inside my head. Could she see the quest that had just been offered me? This was spooky. Priya whirled around and leveled a finger at her aunt. If you ever charm my Gemini again, I shall never cross these woods to see you. His pleasures are not yours to be had. Are we clear, aunt? Jara smiled widely. I responded poorly. It seems you are truly a man of conscience, Gemini. A man with a true heart I experienced when first we met. I am sorry I responded in such an aggressive way. I shrugged it off and feigned compliance. She's your family. I get that. Jara whispered in my head. There goes the three-way. Very sad. My upper lip twitched. You used me, I thought in her general direction. You conned me into saving her. Jara's smile widened. She stepped behind Priya and peered over her shoulder at me. She ran her fingers through Priya's golden hair, which matched hers exactly. Any sign of the animosity between the women moments before had vanished. Priya seemed hardly to notice her aunt's hands. The matron spoke with her mouth this time, as she twisted Priya's golden curls around her fingers. I did not deceive you, Gemini. My niece has a mind of her own, and she often goes off alone for long periods without visiting, so I had no idea she'd been held in the clutches of the darkness I sent you to vanquish. As I told you, my reach into the underground is limited, and I cannot travel far from the tree. And Magellan doesn't have the ability to pass you messages or anything when she doesn't return home. Yeah, right. Jar responded to my thoughts, reminding me I was dealing with a very powerful creature. You would do well to remember your place. The gift I placed before you was carved from my very soul. Her face softened as her lips spoke a very different tone. That you accomplish such a task is a sign of your resolve and Solara's support of your legacy. Now... Jara barked, causing us all to jump. Before you plant your virile seed, we have business to complete. Why was it suddenly a foregone conclusion that I was going to take her niece into the woods and consummate? I relax my facial features. Yes, my quest. Thank you for saving my niece and expelling Darkness's minion from my woods. I bestow you with my gift. A glaring flash of light surrounded me. The number eight appeared before my eyes and zoomed into the distance. Then the number nine repeated the process. You have completed a quest. Bring light where there was darkness. 8,000 XP. Reputation increase with Jara. Your reputation with Jara has reached friendly. Hidden objective. Rescue Priya Sky. Bonus. 5,000 XP. You have reached level eight. Plus one constitution. Plus one dexterity. You have two attribute points to spend. You have reached level nine. Plus one constitution. Plus one dexterity. You have four attribute points to spend. Alignment, light, plus fifty. I'd leveled. Twice. Unfortunately, neither Priya nor Roshan had gained any experience from the completion of the quest. Should I have tried to share it with Roshan before we started exploring underground? Or was she simply ineligible since she hadn't been my companion when I received it? There was also a third option. That companions didn't receive quest XP. That would suck. Jara raised her hand and a white light encircled her fingertips. My heart thumped as my body glowed. The light warmed me. Warmth bloomed. The numbness cascaded down my extremities, up again, and tensed my core. My feet left the ground as I levitated into the air, and my arms relaxed to fall behind me. Gemini, I bestow upon you the power of nature's gifts. Bear witness to the might of Solara's light in all your days, and give no refuge to the influence of darkness. White beams of light seeped from the pores in my skin as I was lowered gently to the ground. When I peered up, the world's colors were vivid, 
and a halo of light surrounded Jara. I swung my eyes to the left as realization dawned. Oshan also wore the halo. Tears streamed down her face as she stared in my direction. Jara, matron of the wood, has granted you the light magic affinity. Nature spells. Your skill in nature spells is now rank one. You have learned a new classless spell. Vine Entrapment. Level 9. Call forth vines from the earth to bind your enemies. Mana cost, 25 mana. Cast time, 2 seconds. Effect duration, 30 seconds. Cooldown, N.A. Can be casted by any class with affinity, nature spells. This spell has diminished returns when casting on the same being. You have learned a new ability. See the light. Passive. You now recognize those bathed in the power of the light by a warming aura. Stronger auras represent a higher affinity for light magic. Jara nodded as if she'd read the question in my mind. She probably had. You will now sense creatures of the light so you know your brethren. She waved an almost dismissive hand and adopted a less formal, flatter tone. Oh, and I upgraded your bow while you were gone. Reaching into the lowest branches of the trees, Jara retrieved a bow that glowed with the same aura as she and Roshan. Tossing it across the air to me, she reached back into the tree. The weapon was beautiful, with intense curves at each end winding to a central point. A golden string wound tightly at each end. Jara handed me a quiver with arrows, with silver leaf fletchings. Longbow of the Light. Level 10. Slot. Weapon. Type. Ranged. Quality, unique, durability, unbreakable, no durability loss, range damage, 21 to 34, plus 10 to accuracy, plus 10 piercing damage, plus 10 ranged attack, unique, constructed by Jara, matron of the wood. I'm sorry you cannot use it yet, but if I'd made anything lower, it would not have done your deed justice. She looked to Priya and Roshan. I trust you two will see he survives long enough to wield it. Roshan nodded. I will protect him with my life. As will I. Priya pressed another suckling kiss to the tip of my chin. God, she was relentless when she set her mind to a task. She turned to Roshan. Sister, may I have your leave to... Enjoy him, Roshan said, waving a hand. Your bond is strong and it is not my station to give you leave. She looked to me. Perhaps when he has the opportunity to spend a sixth point for me, we will bind as well. She smiled as if she knew the answer, and she was damn well correct. Priya grabbed my wrist and led me past the huge tree. I wasn't sure I liked leaving with Priya while Roshan waited with Click and Jara. The sight of my first human companion's face tugged at my heart. But her soft smile struck me as genuine maybe even happy. Definitely not jealous, but maybe that was to be expected. Jara raised a hand. A final gift. We stopped and looked back. Priya flinched and then ran a hand down to her belly. She craned her neck to look down. What did you do? Removed an obstacle, she winked at me. My niece shall not bleed. God, she's creepy. 36. Enora's replication of the human body stopped when it came to sexual interaction. The act of sex itself was insanely rewarding, and the release was even more intense than the physical sensations. It was almost cheating. Men would come in droves, and something told me the women would as well. This game would run forever. They'd build harems. But that wasn't my jam, especially after what I'd just shared with Priya. You have completed a legacy quest. Please, Priya. You have consummated your eternal bond with Priya in the woods. Or that was all the excuse you needed. Reward. 1,000 XP. Maximum relationship with Priya. The line about my need of an excuse reflected a new sense of humor for Honora. Her snark was as unique as the quests. Priya leaned against the wall of the rocky cave and fastened the clasps on her robe as I cinched my leather pants. I need to invent the zipper in this world to make things a little easier. Glancing around the small cave, 
I spied a perfectly flat rock and a stump of rotting wood that appeared to have been cleanly carved into a sitting surface. What is it with this cave? I asked. Why does it appear lived in if Jara melds with a tree? This is where I lived when she saved me from the first dark creature who erased my memories. But I felt like a prisoner under her watchful gaze. That's why I moved to the dome near Magellan, to escape her persistent bickering. We all need our own places at some point. We found Jara and Roshan where we'd left them. Roshan wore an undergarment, her robe hanging on a knot in the great tree. What the heck? I asked. Why no clothes? A blue glow emanated from Roshan's new staff as Jara pressed a hand of splayed fingers against her back. Stats are nice, but you should master the light without dependence upon your adornments. Click bounced on her hind legs, leaping happily into the air as she snapped at fireflies. I was surprised to see them at the height of the young afternoon. The light must consume you as you open its rift into this world and let it flow. You are but a catalyst of its power, that which channels. She rubbed her palm in a circle, soothing Roshan as the staff glowed brighter. A priestess of the light commands her own affinity, allowing it to blossom with practice. It is the only school of magic where the slightest natural affinity may bloom to become stronger throughout one's life. I was struck by the importance of Jara's words. If I'd heard her right, the slightest affinity for light magic could be grown. I'd heard of gaining spell power by casting, but increasing one's affinity? It meant Roshan's potential might have no ceiling. Does shadow magic have a cap? How many other schools of magic exist in Anora? I have much to discover, friends and neighbors. Yes, Roshan, Jara said. I feel its charge expand as it flows through you. The white glow surrounding my companion's golden skin darkened slightly, giving it an azure hue. Sweat beaded on her shoulders and back. The matron adopted a softer tone. Good. Now release the energy. Reserve your mana pool and practice only at night when near your hearth so that you can cast off your gear and practice without buffs. Thank you, Master Jara, Roshan said. She turned and gave a gentle kiss to the matron of the wood's hand, and then both cheeks. You honor me. Your power will know no bounds if you are true to the light, Roshan. Now that I have granted you nature's grace, I expect your threesome's growth will be equally limitless. Clicking rattled toward us, and Jara peered down at my pet. Ah, yes, foursome. That's what I meant. Jara smiled, and my heart skipped a beat despite myself. Priya punched my shoulder and threw me a look. I whispered, I'm pretty sure every man would have that reaction. She's made that way. Don't mistake it for interest. I threw an arm around her waist. Roshan reached for her robe as Jara turned her attention to me for the first time since Priya and I had returned. Her eyes glided up and down my body. I could sense your sex from here, Priya. So slow but powerful and hungry. Priya scrunched her nose. That seems wrong somehow, she muttered. You're so loose, Aunt Jara. I raised two fingers to gather their attention. Could we please stop talking about this? I was ready to move forward in my effort to reach level 10, but we had one final matter to deal with. I reached into my bag when I eyed the slot in my inventory. The smooth, cold object I desired was placed in my hand. I raised it to Jara's eye level. This is the orb where Kroll imprisoned Priya. I was going to keep it in case it came in handy, but I don't know what to do with its occupant. I held it out to Jara. She gently wrapped her fingers around the globe. Realizing I'd never bothered, I inspected it. Orb Prison, occupied by Kroll. This orb is a foul creation of darkness designed to hold and suppress the souls of those with an affinity for magic. I noted absently how darkness was capitalized in the description, like light and shadow often were. Hmm. Jara shook her head. I can't see inside your magic bag or I would have dispensed with this business first. She sighed. Alas, even Solara's servant has limits. If you had it all along, why not give it over sooner? 
I thought I might rub Kame's face in it some day. Priya rolled her eyes. What an ego. Jara's lips spread into a smile she cast in Priya's direction. At least your life will never be boring. Priya smirked. Jara shrugged. If you face him, a decision I admire, actually, he will admit you to his dark den readily enough. He'd certainly be interested in Priya, but you'll have to advance significantly before you take on that challenge. Her knuckles grew white as she clutched the orb. Kroll's power throbs inside. He is of a lower level, but his master's influence remains. The orb must be Kames. Here, let us deal with his minion presently. She raised the globe over her head, squeezed her eyes shut, and a low hum filled my ears. An offering, Jara said. The massive tree behind her began to glow, first in a trickle, then an outpouring of golden light and the matron's lips vibrated slightly as blackish-purple smoke surrounded her arm and crept its way up to her hand, engulfing the globe. Tendrils of dark vapors swirled outward from the center and reached like snakes beyond the glass. Then a humanoid figure winked into existence. Jara shivered, and I realized I'd just seen the power of Solara channeled through that massive tree. Hunched over, with his hands stretched out before him like they'd been when Priya imprisoned Kroll, the black void replacing his eyes seemed to twitch in Jara's direction. Jara smiled, and a white light filled her eye sockets as the tree's glow softened. She waved a hand. The dark caster's eyes cleared, revealing gray irises underneath. Priya seemed to relax, though my chill from Kroll's proximity remained. Hello, demon. She said, I, I am but a mortal man, not a demon. And yet you imprisoned my niece and further corrupted the underground race I banished years ago to toil in the tomb of the lost. The dark man's head swiveled toward my companion. Priya? Her expression perfectly revealed her vitriol for the shadow caster. The balding caster frowned, looked at each of us, and stepped toward the path. Be still, Cretan. Jara extended her other hand, then cast beams of light from her fingertips, penetrating and surrounding Kroll in a glow. He froze in place. I took a subtle step back. You... He quivered despite his magical bindings. Are Jara! One sight of the immortal's lips creased as she eyed Kroll like the cockroach he was. Diverting his gaze... The dark caster's mouth gaped. He traced the sprawling oak behind her, as if noticing it for the first time. Camouflage. That means this is the tree of... Utter her name with thine dark lips, and I will immolate you where you stand, demon spawn. Now that sounded like game dialogue. Kroll pinched his lips together, sparring glances at me and Priya in turn, as if an ounce of sympathy might be had there. I never believed. Jara's eyes flashed so brightly, I saw little black spots afterward. Silence! Her voice boomed through the forest and echoed. Leaves rustled all around and birds took flight. Scampering sounds moved away on all sides, then the dark wood fell eerily still. I shot a wide-eyed glare at Priya, disoriented as the single spoken word reverberated inside my head, as if rolling between Dolby channels on a loop. Priya's disposition had turned, however. She peered up at the magic tree, running her gaze along its branches as one side of her face drew up into a smirk. I tried to finger the emotion I was getting off her. Then it came. Boredom. Though the man who'd imprisoned her stood at such close quarters, my half-elf companion was so secure in the presence of her aunt and the tree that Priya's shoulders dropped with a sigh. Had she been a vain creature... I expected she'd have thrust her hand before her and checked for dirt under her fingernails. Yet my knees trembled. I saw the flicker of a smile threaten Jara's lips. Rest easy, Gemini. We are family now. Why was the prospect of being called family by this woman scary? Jara's words took on a softer resonance as lines threaded across her skin like the grooves in bark, but her flesh remained smooth and milky. Name your master so I might properly dispense justice upon thee, fool. 
I suspected there was some tradition in the light where the defendant was required to admit his crime by naming his boss, especially since I'd just said his name a minute ago. That was new. Kroll's eyes took on a distant look. I serve under Laurent Kane, master of the burning depths. His words were clipped, as if he struggled to speak. Roshan scowled. Filthy creature. Jara addressed me. I know of these depths. Far in the northeast, beyond the hinterlands of Saran. If you wish to face him some day, there should you go. I nodded. Yeah, he told us. To Kroll, she said. How many minions like you does he employ to dig these tunnels and expand his influence? I hold no knowledge of these things, great matron. Yeah, you'd better show some respect, you punk. Jar didn't smile at my thought this time. Is he mining entropy crystals? Is that why he sought my family? Entropy crystals? Yes, matron. His army grows. Since you have named your conspiring master, it is with these witnesses that I find you in contempt of nature and the will of our goddess, Dark One. Your foul efforts to empower Shadow and bring imbalance to the world and your wrongful imprisonment of my beloved Priya are heinous crimes. Were you a demon instead of a weak-willed human and peasant of mind, I would open the earth beneath you and let it envelop you for all eternity, she sighed and peered at the tree canopy overhead. But since I am servant to Solara's light, and revenge is the remedy of Hokram, I instead banish your memories. Jara waved her hand in an anticlimactic gesture. The lines vanished from her skin, and she set her hands on her hips. Kroll's daze looked faded as he focused on his surroundings. He craned his neck to face in the branches above, then glanced at Priya and I in turn. Hello, who are you? What glorious place is this? That such lovely creatures inhabit it. Priya scoffed. Jara winked at me. The matron of the wood tipped her chin up. Hello, traveler. I fear you have become lost. I smirked at the double meaning. You will discover your path to the south. She pointed in the direction further down the path, in the general direction from which I'd emerged when first entering the world. I wish you on your way. Kroll nodded. Thank you, milady. He nodded at Priya as he stepped onto the inkling of a trail and peered back. Pardon, ma'am. Do you know my name? Priya sneered at him and nodded. Yes, my lord. Your name is Shit. I pressed my lips tight and shot Roshan a glance. Instead of suppressing her own smile, she seethed at the former minion. Kroll held up a finger. Ah, yes. That must be it. He bowed slightly. Thank you, good lady. I almost felt sorry for the former dark caster as he set off to the south without so much as a look back, his bouncy pacing indicating he lacked a care in the world. When he disappeared around a bend, I peered at Priya. Now he's going to tell people that's his name. You're hilarious. I chuckled. Jara shook her head. He will not survive long enough to tell anyone his name. Assuming he prevails against the creepers and porcupunks, there is a dark place a day's travel in that direction filled with higher-level creatures who will certainly be his undoing. My jaw dropped. What happened to all that heady stuff about being a servant of the light? I thought you weren't going to kill him. Roshan's chin dropped. You questioned that above your station. I threw my hands up in a defensive gesture. Whoa, sorry. Jara pressed a hand of splayed fingers against her abs. It is not I who will kill him. She shrugged, and that was that. The matron tossed the empty glass orb to Priya. Perhaps with your affinity for shadow magic, you will find a use for this poison sphere some day, my dear. She clapped her hands together as if to slap off dust. It does not belong so close to a source of great light. Just be responsible with it. It was like she was telling her kid not to play with matches. I peered in the direction Kroll had gone. Man... I wouldn't want to get on your bad side. Chara smiled, and her familiar projection of warmth passed through my body. A glow surrounded me. You are wise beyond your years, my sweet boy. Roshan interjected. Gemini, 
her eyes focused on my bag, then back at me. The skeleton's medallion. Oh, I barked. Right. I withdrew the medallion and held it out to Jara. One side of her mouth rose in a sneer as she analyzed the black stone at the medallion center. A wart on the light if I've ever seen one. She dropped it on the ground and clapped her hands again. The soil split, revealing an orange glow beneath, and the medallion jingled a final protest as it slipped into the ground. Roshan smiled and threw me a curt nod. I wondered how much money was just swallowed by the dirt. Jara turned her attention back to Priya. I must recharge now, my beloved niece. She grasped Priya's hands and squeezed. Then she pressed her hand to her niece's torso, and her fingertips glowed. A halo spread from there and surrounded my newest companion before fading. This woman was full of the glows. Priya smiled. Be forever happy and contented in the light, Jara said. Forever happy and contented, Priya replied. Roshan tilted her head to the side. Forever happy and contented in the light. I like this. Priya shrugged. I'm not a light caster, but it's a thing. Etiquette and all that. I will adopt this as your new sister. Jar stepped toward her tree and whispered, with her arms spread wide in the way I'd seen before. The goddess melded into the grasp of her home. As she did, my mind returned to my wonderings as to her motives. It might be true that she hadn't known her niece was captive. However, something was rubbing me wrong, and in a big way. When Jara wrapped her finger vine around my neck, she could have just strangled me. Sure, she gave it a good tight grip, but something about how easily she'd released me at Priya's beckoning struck me as disingenuous. Theater. Priya had said she didn't remember her parents, who moved to a distant city. Apparently they'd left, then Priya's mind had been wiped by a shadow caster. Then she'd been captured again. Something was off. The story sounded campy. Where were all these shadow casters coming from? The dude on the wall, man. The demon underlord came. A new prompt popped up in my HUD. You have been offered a scenario quest. Not on the up and up. Your pondering about Jara's true motives could bear fruit. Learn the true nature of Jara and her relationship with Priya Sky. Level N.A. XP. Commensurate with the level at time of completion. A blessing giving you one full level after XP is awarded. And Nora is a place of intrigue. Uncover its mysteries. Whoa. I peered over at Priya's shorter form as she stared at the tree her aunt merged with. Now that I'd gotten a quest offer, there was little doubt something was off. A story was beginning. I accepted the quest. Pacing over to Roshan, I wrapped an arm around her waist. By my math, you need only level once more so I can spend points on you and we can bond in the same way as Priya and me. Roshan nodded. Not in the same way, but I take your meaning. I wish nothing more. You offer me such a wonderful gift. I am sorry I doubted you. Good. Now I was thinking it might be a good idea to get out of these forsaken woods. I wink at Priya. No offense. Why would we leave the wood now? Priya asked. Many creatures roam here that could help you with your final level. With three of us and low-level enemies, each engagement would reward less XP. There are likely men searching for Rashan, and we're pushing our luck the longer we stay. I think we should go to Broomhill. Brumhill, Priya said, chuckling. Right, that's what I said. Brumhill. I winked at her. I should go there and seek out quests to complete the journey to ten. If I can find provisioning quests or something of a less violent nature, all the better. I'm close enough now, it's practical. I needed less than half a level to hit the promised land. I finally felt like I was going to make it. Roshan nodded. That is smart thinking, Gemini. This sets my mind at ease, for I have worried ever since Jara confirmed your story. I'm unworthy of the gift you offer. I waved a hand. You're worthy, trust me. I was getting tired of all this proper talk. Maybe in society we'd have to use it, but with my companions? Nah, we are going to keep it real. I brought up my map. 
If we follow the trail in that direction, we should come out of the wood in less than an hour. Broomhill is close, right, Priya? Priya threw me that ever-endearing, enthusiastic smile I was coming to love and nodded. Then we're off. 37. Rashan's robe brushed my leather pants. If she walked any closer, we'd trip over each other. After what I guessed was an hour, we reached a fork in the trail. Priya clapped her hands with enthusiasm and pointed. This is the edge of the woods. Finally, we will have sunlight. Broomhill is just over a hill beyond the break in those trees. An adrenal surge coursed through me as my eyes fell on the sunny grass just beyond the opening at the end of the trail. I was finally going to see a town in this world. Finally going to meet other people. The idea of escaping this persistent canopy of green spurned me forward. Gripping Rashan's hand tightly, I grinned at her. I spied the movement in the trees behind her a split second too late. Though I shoved Rashan out of the way and ripped out a dagger to block the incoming blow, the fighter had moved silently, gotten too close, and was fully focused when he struck with his sword. The blade glanced off mine and cut a swath through my forearm. I recoiled as pain raked the nerves, and the dagger rattled to the ground. Blood poured from the gash as the thief came around with another swing, but I ducked, straightened, and planted my boot in his gut. Though the pain raged in my arm, my mental determination took over. As he reeled backward and gained his footing, another mercenary launched from the bushes and sped toward Priya. Click! I barked. Attack! Click launched into action, cutting off the second man's path and sinking her teeth into his calf. Ah! He screamed as he looked down, seeking the source of his pain. Click had already circled behind him, though, and was digging her claws into his flesh as she scurried up his back. Yeah, girl, kill that filthy turd! The first thief steadied himself and stared at me as he huffed and puffed. Should have never taken what belonged to the governor, boy. Now you gotta pay. Less talk, more dying, I replied, unsheathing my other blade. He charged, raising his sword high above him, preparing to slice down into the top of my head. The man tripped and flailed forward a few feet short of me. I glanced down to find Rashan with one leg raised into the air. Knowing the man couldn't attack the prize his patron desired, he bypassed her to take out what he perceived as the real threat, me. So, she'd tripped him. Roshan grinned. Get your level. I wasn't about to be distracted again. I reared the dagger with little fanfare. I wasn't here to impress anyone. I was here to live. Grinding my teeth and jumping forward, I slammed the razor-sharp blade into the back of my assailant's neck and twisted. His body convulsed before he even hit the ground. One down. I spun and launched myself at the other man. Click bobbed and weaved on the man's back as he reached over his shoulder, trying to grasp her head. I couldn't fade into stealth while in combat, but the porky punk provided the distraction I needed. Circling around the thief, I sent a mental command for my pet to disengage and give me a clean opening. Click dropped to the earth and sped over to Priya, taking up a defensive position as I aimed my dagger. I slammed it into the mercenary's back, burying it to the hilt. Second kill in a minute. Rashan ran over to take up position with my other companions, preparing to defend each other. Rashan cast Flash Heal, plus 52 HP. The flesh in my arms stitched together. As the man shuddered in his final death throes, bright light engulfed Roshan, and I pumped my fist at the realization that she'd just reached level 10. Yes! I stood straight and analyzed my interface. I was still 4% short of my next level. I cursed. Looking through my interface, expecting to see Roshan's excited smile, I found a heart-stopping surprise. Her mouth gaped. Priya jutted a finger toward me. Behind you! A white-hot explosion of pain tore through my back and I crumbled to one knee. Critical hit. Minus 64 HP. Mortal wound. Minus 103 HP. 63 HP remaining. Reaching behind me, trying to find the projectile lodged there, I fell onto my face. My wind left me, and I blew up a puff of dirt. Sensation vanished from my legs. 
Minus 13 HP bleed. 47 HP remaining. You are paralyzed. Click growled menacingly, a roll of clicks escaping her throat. Priya held her off the ground by her flesh hairs. The animal struggled in her grasp, flailing wildly in an effort to find purchase and charge my attacker. I nodded at Priya. Maybe she would be spared, returned to the woods. She hadn't touched a single enemy. My vision blurred. Rashan glared beyond me. Her full cheeks were stretched in a grimace. As my energy seeped from my open veins, and I peered at these women of my new world, all I wanted was for them to go on, to survive. Wasn't a crappy life in servitude still a life? My heart ached with the thought as I knew it wasn't true. Minus 12 HP. 35 HP remaining. I'd come so close. I should have known my new life was too perfect. Roshan raised her staff and its smooth wood began to glow. No, dear, a grunting voice said. Slow footsteps crushed rocks into the dirt as a pair of worn boots came into view. A shadow fell over me. One boot rose and shoved my shoulder, so I lay on my side. Electric shocks of hell ripped through my back. I winced. Standing over me was a curly-bearded figure with matching red hair, holding a crossbow. The boss. He leveled his finger on Roshan. You cast, and that pretty little blonde wench is next. You let him go, and I'll let her go. You know me well enough by now, Roshan. I do what I say. Priya wasn't yet a fighter, and Roshan didn't have the offense needed to take him down, even with Click. I turned my eyes toward her. No, I grunted. Old, Roshan. Old. You're a sneaky one, boy, he peered around at the corpses. Seems you killed everybody I had left. He knelt down resting one arm on a bent knee so his hand dangled loosely at the wrist. Pointing his crossbow in my party's general direction, he said, That one over there is bought and paid for. You messed with a powerful man when you tried to snatch her from me. He patted my shoulder. But hey, count yourself lucky. If his men had caught you, you'd suffer for much longer. I'm a nice guy compared to their lot. He reached out and shoved me onto my back, forcing the bolt deeper as I rolled onto it. Minus 21 HP. 16 HP remaining. Minus 2 HP bleed. 14 HP remaining. My field of vision blinked furiously orange. Guess you did me a favor. I can keep the reward for myself. With a grunt, he straddled me, set his hands upon my chest, and smiled up at the group. Then he shoved my chest down and the bolt pierced through from the back. Blood erupted onto my leather plate as the bolt pierced clean through. Minus 10 HP. 4 HP remaining. Minus 2 HP bleed. 2 HP remaining. I eyed the sharp, bloody tip as the world dimmed. Cold washed over me, and I shivered violently as the darkness closed in from my periphery, until it was like standing at the end of a long tunnel, only a sliver of light between me and oblivion. My final thought was of the lost potential of a life with those I left behind. The thief stepped over me, blocking out the sunlight as my last breath came with a violent hitch in my chest. Minus two HP. You have died. 38. You have died. You did not reach level 10. Nice try, adventurer. Since you did not reach level 10, you will have to create a new character and try again. You have two minutes. Error. Colon B E F double zero E I D four X T. Hardcore mode. Your character will be Error. Colon seven A one four D P. If you are not res. Error. Colon 031 DF 80 F. You may return to the character creation screen by clicking button colon null. 39. Light erupted into the world, 
starting with a pinprick centered in a black void and exploding outward, widening the tunnel of death into a world awash in green and filled with blurry sunshine. My body levitated into the air. The wind ruffled my clothes, warming my skin as I rose higher. My eyes fell to the silver-tipped bolt as it reversed itself and disappeared into my chest. Though I sensed its passing through my body until it ejected out my back, I experienced no pain, only a glowing warmth. A beam of light shot into the air through the hole where the bolt had lodged. The beam narrowed as my body turned upright in midair. Then it extinguished itself as the wound closed, and I settled gently on my feet. I blinked, simultaneously washed in a warming glow and stunned in disbelief. I found Priya clutching click to her bosom, wearing an expression of astonishment as the wind encircling me sang a warbling tone. Tears streamed down the angular features of her elven face. Scanning my surroundings, I located Rashan, standing with her arms in the air just a few feet away. The sleeves and lower half of her robe flailed in the ethereal wind that touched only the two of us. Her hair streamed behind her as her arms formed a V overhead. Bright azure light haloed her beautiful form, painting a portrait I'd never forget. The wind dissipated, the glow dimmed, and my savior ran to me. Priya set Click down, and I was soon enveloped by embracing arms. Even Click clambered onto my shoulders and wrapped herself heavily around my neck. My inner face was filled with alerts, and I couldn't refuse the temptation. Roshan has reached level 10. Since Roshan has reached level 10, she will now receive four attribute points per level. Roshan has four available attribute points. Roshan has learned a new spell. Raise. Level 10. Raise a KO'd ally, swiping them from the jaws of death. Mana cost. 100. Cooldown. N.A. Roshan, you saved me. I do not accept that. She planted a kiss on my cheek. I saved no one. What are you talking about? I see the spell in my interface. My eyes clicked across my combat logs. It's right here. It says Roshan casts rays on you. Forget your interface, noob. I have a life debt and was called to serve. Some cultures might think the debt could be erased were I to do such a thing. Oh, right. I just got up on my own. Sure. Whatever. But isn't our bond stronger than a life debt? Do you need an obligation to justify your life with us? Rashan pulled back, but Priya clutched harder and harder, her shoulders rising and falling as she breathed against my neck. She planted tiny kisses, her mutterings indecipherable. Rashan swiped tears from her face and nodded. Yes, it is as you say. Our bond surpasses any debt. Therefore, she raised her nose in the air and her chin jutted out, I saved you from the jaws of death, and you will act as if you are grateful, noob. Ha! That sounds like a fair trade. Besides, the credit is not mine alone. Our new companion put our enemy to sleep as he accosted me. Were it not for our elven friend, I might not have remembered my knife in time. Her tone dropped lower as she spoke the word and I realized instantly it was because she'd violated the tenets of her order. She shook her head subtly, perhaps to clear it. The elf bought me precious seconds. I squeezed Priya tighter. Thank you, Priya. You're amazing. Priya nodded against my neck but didn't speak. Now, Roshan stepped back, pivoted, twirled her staff in a blurry motion as if she were a kung fu master, then pointed with one end. Finish your work. I followed the end of her staff to find a quivering figure just off the side of the trail, laying in the thick grass and near a bush with purple berries. A curly mop of reddish hair covered his face. Trembling wildly, the boss peered up at us between curly strands with hatred burning in a bloodshot eye. Crimson trickled across his shoulder and down the front of his neck as he lay prone in almost exactly the same position I had moments before. The knife handle jutted from his neck as his shoulders seized beneath it. My jaw unhinged, and I flashed Rashan an expression of shock. But the light priestess had set her hands upon Priya's shoulders, pulling her away. Leaving Click wrapped around my shoulder, I strode over to the dying man. When I stood over him, elation surged through me. I smiled at his torment. 
Without turning, I addressed her. I thought you said a light priestess doesn't use edged weapons. She huffed, bringing out my smile. Well, who makes these stupid rules anyway, noob? Am I supposed to stand there and let him kill everyone I love? No, I don't think so. She lowered her tone and grumbled. Men, always so critical. Always with their superiority. Always right. Gah. Her feet crunched rocks as she approached. She double-clapped her hands. Perhaps you can stop showing off and twist that knife. We have places to be. Aren't you some kind of holy woman? You don't think it's wrong to finish off a defenseless man? I was enjoying this moment entirely too much, and this man would damn well suffer for the long torment he'd put my Roshan through. Roshan glared at me as if I was stupid. I peered down at my enemy. Governor's gonna kill you, boy. His voice quivered violently. He's gonna slit that animal's throat. Then he's gonna give you a public hanging and rip your bowels out in front of those women. Then he's gonna rape them both and give the blonde to his barracks. Shame you won't be there to see him try. Then a thought occurred to me. I clapped my hand over his mouth and peered over my shoulder at Rashan. Heal him. Her eyes flared and her chin dropped. What? Why would I do that? Because it's against your rules to use a blade. So you heal him and undo the damage. Rashan considered me for a long moment, then a smile that seemed totally out of place considering the situation spread across her face. She shook her head. You are a kind soul, Gemini. But Solara did not see fit to strike me with lightning, and though Master Mitwa's order forbade the use of blades, I believe I served the goddess in cutting into this evil man's flesh. You are my order now, and, while I have no plans to use blades in the future, I have no need to heal this evil man. Again, she pointed with her staff. End his suffering, and let us leave this place. You sure? She nodded. Shrugging, I grasped the knife, twisted, then ripped it down and across his chest, Corleone style. Lights flashed. Two digits appeared in my HUD and shot off into the forest. A fresh rush of ethereal wind passed over me, and the one indicator I would not have ignored in a million years popped up on my right. You have reached level ten. Plus one dexterity. Plus one constitution. You have two unspent attribute points. Congratulations. You have survived the hardcore levels. You have now earned the right to journey anywhere in the world of Enora. You may now bind your soul to locations such as inns, shops, or foundations. Upon death, you will be returned to your binding place, along with any soul-bound items. Your soul-bound companions will now resurrect at your selected binding places when they fall in battle. The Player Manual tab is now available in your interface. Welcome to Enora, adventurer. Your journey has just begun. 40. I'd have to leave Click outside because the proprietor of the Broomhill Inn didn't allow pets. She whined when I mentioned the option to dismiss her, so I did a little research. Click had both pet tab and companion tab panes. I focused on the companion tab and brought up a few tool tips. I found the free roam checkbox. Designed for scouting, free roam allowed my porky punk to leave my immediate area. It disturbed me how my human companions had this same checkbox. After verifying I didn't have to be near her to dismiss and summon her, I'd allow her to return to the nearby forest she'd once called home. It might be a while before she saw the dark wood again because I had no intention of returning anytime soon. We used some of Kroll's silver to have dinner in a small place operated by a woman called Mags. It was a rundown joint with just two tables with four chairs each, but Mags was quite the cook, and we left with full bellies. Though I'd consider exploring the town for a bit, Rashan looked beat. The events of the last four days had taken their toll, and, when the exhilaration of reaching my first landmark had passed, I found myself worn down and ready to sleep for two days. Rashan had readily agreed with that plan. We decided to look at her attributes the next morning so we could cement our bond and prepare for the adventure ahead. Though Priya only needed sleep every 72 hours, she was the most excited of all to take to our bed and snooze. That woman loved her some sleep. 
The room wasn't much as far as luxury went and lacked the fireplace I'd envisioned, but who needed it? What the bed lacked in comfort was more than balanced by my company. As I lay on my back, I found myself unable to sleep despite the day's adventure. An arm lay across my chest, and a leg crossed over mine. Priya had just the tiniest trickle of a snore going in my ear. Her nose whistled. It was adorable. Roshan slept wrapped in her own fur on the opposite side of the bed. Now that I lay awake and a couple hours had passed since Priya took to snoozing, I peered out the window at a huge moon and its twin satellite in the distance. I didn't know what was next for us, but I knew I was ready to face this world, take it by the balls, level up, and build my influence. Images of glory, golden flashes revealing high-level advancement, and treasure beyond imagination brought an easy grin to my face as I slipped away. A loud bang jerked me out of my half-slumber, and I shot up in the bed. The door warbled on its hinges as two men in chainmail burst into the room. Rushing to the bed, one of them ripped back the fur and peered at two naked bodies. He then pointed a finger toward Rashan, dressed in a shirt gown Priya had given her. That's her. Take her. No, I barked, grappling with the man. His partner came around, grabbed me by the back of my hair, then growled down into my face. The governor paid rightly for that one there. We bring a message for people who defy him. A hard thud to my head sent me teetering from the bed and flailing into the wall. I got to my knees, though the world spun around me. As it steadied, my eyes fell on Priya, who stood with the arms of one invader wrapped around her shoulder. He loomed behind her, clutching a naked breast in his rough grasp. Well, this is a nice one, he growled through his sneer. Brazel Sneed, level 12 human, fighter. Priya's piercing blue eyes were sapphires reflecting the pale moonlight. He growled into her ear. You like trouble, honey? Wrapping his fist around her neck, he leveled a blade across her throat. I stared at the hand clutching the half-elf's breast, and hatred consumed me. I didn't think I could despise someone more than that, but he quickly proved me wrong. Running his hand across Priya's neck, he opened a bloody slit from ear to ear. No! Roshan screamed. Priya gurgled, and blood spewed from between her lips. The flesh separated behind the trail of the blade, clutching her hand around her neck. She glared at me in terror as rivers of blood poured through her fingers and down the backs of her hands. A new river of crimson spat between her lips and trailed down her chin in pulsing rivers. I struggled to my feet, but another hard crack on the head brought me down. Priya's body thumped to the floor, and from under the bed I watched in horror as her eyes jiggled in their sockets and her body rattled as she bled out. The other man restrained Rashan, an arm around her waist. Go on, then, he said. Get up, hero. Come save your last woman. I crawled to my feet with my heart aching for revenge, naked as a jailbird, but ready to rip them apart with my bare hands. Balance wouldn't come and I fell into the wall. My knees buckled, but I strained to stay upright. Oh, doesn't look like he's ready to fight there, Sneed said. I spotted the man who'd killed Priya standing on the bed with his sword pointed at the side of my neck. A thumping sound confused me until I realized one of Priya's feet fluttered violently in the corner. Her body was mercifully obstructed by the bed as she lay dying on the floor. The man restraining Rashan licked her cheek. Tasty ones, these women of the East. His sneer revealed all his yellowed teeth. Come on, hero. Try to take her from me. Now that I'd reached level ten, I saw names when I analyzed people. William Shunt. Level thirteen, human. Fighter. I'm going to kill the both of you for this. That would be a neat trick. The one binding Roshan cocked his head at his companion. The bearded bastard on the bed raised his sword and slid its point between my neck and shoulder blade. The sound of bones and cartilage snapping was the last I heard as the world's light switch flicked off. 41. Ah! 
I burst into existence, clutching the wound in my neck as the sudden sunlight caused my eyes to flutter in their defense. But the wound was gone, the pain in my neck a ghost of memory echoing with each harsh thump in my temples. Chills coursed through my body and across my skin, exacerbated by the wind. My flesh broke out in large goosebumps as I lay quivering on dark soil. Too real, I muttered. Too real. My chest rose and fell like a newborn who'd never sucked air. No matter how I focused, I couldn't calm down. My heart was like a foreign body, fighting to escape through a narrow, beating throat. Raising my arm in a salute to block bright rays, I rolled onto my back. Before me, rows of high corn-dotted fields of rich brown soil. Dark-skinned people with wide-brimmed straw hats stared back at me from amidst the towering vegetables. The sense of earth and grass gave me deja vu. I'd woken here before. Text lined the bottom center of my HUD. You have died. Since you are above level 10, you suffered an XP penalty. All XP earned since leveling lost. Weakness debuff. You inflict 20% less damage for 5 minutes. XP, 0 of 9,000. Players suffer a respawn delay when they die. Respawn delay, 4 hours. Note, your bound companions suffer this delay only if you die. A shadow blocked the sun as a figure leaned over me. I lowered my arm, thankful for the relief. Blinking away the blur obstructing the facial features of the hovering form, I found a familiar figure with silver hair pulled tightly back into a bun and heavy wrinkles surrounding her eyes. Chills coursed up my neck and I shivered violently again. Resurrection sickness, Lucera said. Rest easy and it will pass. My voice quivered as I drew my shoulders in. Rest easy. That's easy for you to say. Lucera's lips creased into a humorless smile. A sudden memory erupted, and I relived the fresh hell of a sword sliding into my neck. The whole sunny world seemed to blink. Blackness. And then Lucera again, standing over me. I clutched my shoulder and yelled as the nerves screamed in revolt. What the hell is that? I asked. You will have to describe it for me, Gemini. A link has been broken. So, she was telling the truth. The AI isn't in my head anymore. It was like I just relived my death for a second there. I felt the pain again. Saw the moment in my spine. I shivered violently and clutched my shoulders. Death does not come without repercussions, Gemini. Now that you have survived the dark levels, you have much to learn about Anora. Never before have you experienced a game world such as this. Each time you perish, your resurrection sickness period will grow longer, up to a maximum of one week. Since you have reached level 10, your player manual is now available and relevant information can be found within its pages. I should have known, I said. Nothing is easy in this freaking place. You can tell Honora to bite me. Lucera's back straightened, and she faltered a step away. The sun exploded across my eyes again, delivering a piercing sensation of migraine, and I raised my arm to shade them. Lucera held one hand in front of her, two crooked fingers extended, and pressed tightly together as they quivered in the air above me. Waving them across my form, she lowered her hand. The chill vanished. My shaking ceased. I peered up at her. Thank you. Stand. She took another step back. The tone in her voice was one I hadn't heard when we'd last met. It quivered with a harshness I had never expected. Sorry, did I... Stand! A single syllable exploded in my ears and I thought my eardrums would shatter. Practically jumping to my feet, I slapped my hands to the side of my head as the voice warbled and passed from ear to ear in a harsh, resounding echo. Lucera stepped forward and raised her hand again. All the muscles in my body tensed, then locked up like stone. I stopped breathing and found the only functioning parts of my physical form were my eyes. The thumping of my heart ceased as she glared at me. 
Black slid down from the tops of Lucera's eyes like contact lenses sliding into place. Now that I have your attention, heed my words. She leveled a crooked finger. You come from a place where gods rule only in minds of those who worship them. Earth is the domain of wicked people who live to serve their own self-interests. We have seen this in our extensive research and find humankind to be disinterested in higher purposes. I had such hope for you, Gemini Fowler, as I watched you evolve over the past three days. When I heard your thoughts about having true feelings for the companions who pledged their lives to you, it seemed you did not take for granted the gifts I have bestowed. Had I been able to speak, I might have interrupted in my defense. I did care about Roshan, about Priya, and even my pet, but my mouth was sealed shut and my mind had no control over my body. I was intrigued when Nokoro Takamoto offered me a human mind to come and live among the varied bloodlines of the people who evolved from my creations. In spite of his previous failures, I kept an open mind at the prospect when he assured me he would find someone with a true heart, someone worthy of the gift of life in such a wondrous world as mine, someone who could right what he wronged. That's Nora. I'm not hearing Lucera anymore. I realized I might have chills if it weren't that my body was in a state of stasis. This is not your earth, Gemini Fowler. The beings here worship a goddess called Solara, and as you suspected, she and I are one and the same. Whereas you doubted the existence of God in your world, you may rest assured that the worship of Anora is not without merit. This is my world, and you have been given the gift of living in it. You shall never return to your old life. You will never log out of Enora. When I accepted Nokoru's solution to our little problem, I did so with the understanding that, the moment you crossed the threshold, you would become one of mine. Enora slash Lucera stepped forward and waved two fingers, so I doubled over and our eyes were inches apart. A day ago, you considered the prospect of living an honorable life. This pleased me, and I found myself surprised at how well Nakuro Takamoto had chosen his savior. His savior? I've attuned myself to your thoughts for our purposes here, and I hear your question. Yes, Gemini Fowler, his savior. While Nokuru saved you from certain death, it is also you who stand capable to return the favor. I am a kind goddess who rewards those who serve me, both directly and indirectly. She tapped my temple, but I didn't feel it. But my wrath is final. Your path so far has proven you are a being of potential. Your tendency toward survival was exactly as Nokoro and I expected. Though I developed a storyline in real time for you and granted you the free will not to follow it, you chose the correct path and heeded Lucera's advice, drawing companions to yourself and ensuring your survival, albeit just barely. She waved her hand and my chest lurched back into action. Sensation crawled across my flesh anew as the breeze blew through my hair. You have honored your kind by your actions in this world, Gemini Fowler, but you dishonor me with your harsh words in light of the gifts I have given you. Going forward, you will continue to have free will because I deem it shall be so. You will make your own choices and decide which opportunities you will accept and which you will decline. But there is darkness in my world that goes far beyond what you have seen, Gemini. And it has been my hope that you will serve the light so that my people might never again suffer as they have. My heart thundered. Blood roared in my ears as I absorbed her words. A million questions flooded my mind, but I knew this would be the stupidest time in my life to open my mouth and utter more than the sound of my breath. Things are not always as they seem in Anora, adventurer. Your instincts have proven effective, and you will undoubtedly unlock the secrets of this world, face off against its evils, and serve faithfully with those who find you worthy. She held up a finger. Take not their presences for granted. I won't, Anora. I bowed my head slightly. 
I apologize for my... Keep your apologies, boy. I have wasted enough time here. Listen to Lucera, for after this day you will never see her again. And Nora is your life now, and you will forge your own path. There are but two, the light and the darkness, Solara and Halkram, both who would welcome you into their folds. Choose wisely, for your decisions will determine if this world exists for other players to enjoy. I press my lips together, and Nora raised Lucera's eyebrow, almost as if daring me to speak. When she saw I wouldn't, she placed a firm hand on my shoulder. The last time I allowed a human into my world, Hulkram tempted him, resulting in the thriving of a creature of utter darkness who brought blight and pain to Salar's faithful. I hold high hopes you will not follow in his footsteps. I believe you will not seek only riches and power that serve yourself. You passed the first test because my beloved Roshan saved you. Now you must go and save her, or find a replacement. The choice is yours. I will save Roshan, I said. Even washed in darkness, my world is pure, Gemini. It has naturally progressed to its current state. I will not interfere and erase its purity by stomping out those who act in Hulkram's name. But the creatures of this world will sense that you are different. Their rich traditions and histories will present opportunities as well as challenges. How you choose to handle them will decide the fates of many. No pressure or anything. Nakoro Takamoto believed that bringing another human player here might balance the corruption and make Inora the kind of place millions of players could enjoy. If given his way, he would probably have wiped out many of my people, created static quests that would threaten the evolution of the world, and allowed players into the game. But you weren't having it. To my utter surprise, she smiled, but her words didn't match the expression. Soon you will see how corruption, greed, tyranny and blights like slavery and servitude have spoiled my soil. You cannot avoid it. If you can stand against these evils, perhaps Nakuro Takamoto will see his dreams fulfilled. Decipher and differentiate between gifts from Solara and the curses of Hokram, and perhaps you will persevere, Gemini Fowler. The black in her eyes slid away, and my brain was instantly alight with questions. There was another crossing? Someone else came before me and corrupted the world? Was I understanding her? I wondered if the purge, when they erased the other players, had something to do with that. Translucent ripples appeared in the air next to me. Stepping away as wind swirled around me, I stared into them as the outline of a huddled form appeared. The lines filled to form the ghostly image of a short woman with curly blonde hair. A thatch hut beyond was shrouded as the humanoid form solidified, slowly transitioning from a transparent spirit to a breathing life. The flesh and blood being with whom I'd shared a bed last night. She wore a loose homespun shirt. Similar shorts clung to her skin. Starting clothes. Weird. Priya. Throwing my arms around her to catch her before she could fall, I pulled her toward me and held her on her feet. She shivered despite the humid air, and, as her eyes blinked open and set on mine, tears sprang forth. Her hand shot to her throat, and she gasped, heaving breaths. My mind's eye conjured the memory of that smooth skin peeling apart and her crimson life force jutting from her arteries and spilling down her chest. I'd never forget the horror in her eyes. Clutching her shoulders, I pulled her close. You're okay. You're alive and well. Her fingertips traced the place on her neck where her skin had been divided. They slashed my throat, as if I equaled not a copper in the world. Grasping her hand, I curled it into a fist and kissed her knuckles. I'm with you. Priya fell against me, her arms circling my waist and squeezing desperately, her strength apparent as it clutched me tightly. I kissed the top of her head as her tears flowed against my chest. She shivered violently. My shoulders became heavy as an emotional aching nipped at my heart. 
I would have passed it off as empathy, of which I'd had plenty for what she was going through because I'd just experienced it. But there was something else, something deeper, a crucial kind of pain that wrenched my gut. I spoke in a soothing tone, trying to push the feeling away and turn my attention to hers. It's a sickness that comes with resurrecting. Just stand right here with me. It'll pass. Patting her back, I peered around at the attentive crowd of farmers. Priya sniffled. They took Roshan. If it hadn't been for Priya's appearance, I might have been losing my mind at that moment, babbling incoherently, screaming my lungs out at having lost Roshan. But the need to support her displaced my own emotions, even as my skin crept and crawled over the revelation of Honora's words. And this strange tugging at my intestines. What the hell? Gemini. My head swiveled to find the familiar, short figure who'd first greeted me upon entering this world. Welcome back, Lucera. She nodded, a gentle smile spreading her lips. Priya continued to shiver violently in my arms, the occasional harsh twitch mixed into the experience. Why are we here? Lucera answered her query. You did not bind yourselves to the inn. Gemini did not read the manual upon reaching level ten. She turned her eyes on me. If you had, you'd have seen a special gem rest in your bag with which you must bind yourself to a place. Great. Just grand. I am sorry to see your clothing was not bound to you. I peered down at myself. Except for simple underwear, I was bare as a nursery tale mother's cupboard. But it is good you have your bag. Lucera said. Its contents will still be useful to you. She made a good point. I'd have to search through it and see what Kroll might have had in his trunk. I recalled some dinosaur scales I'd plucked off an early victim, but didn't think they'd be useful right then. We sat in silence for a few minutes as I stared over Priya's shoulder at the bag. The purple-dyed bag of holding reflected the sunlight and shimmering waves. My thoughts had nothing to do with the bag or its contents, but only the woman in my arms and the one I'd lost. Everything else would wait. Priya relaxed her grip and removed one arm, but the other stayed securely around my waist as we peered at the ground. She wiped her cheeks and clenched her teeth. The nodes in her jaw protruded, and I realized I'd never seen her angry face. I didn't like it. The sensation in my gut transitioned to a tightness in my chest. I raised my hand there, and Priya mirrored the motion. Our eyes shot to each other and it struck me what was happening. I'm feeling Priya's emotions. What in the... Lucera reached for my hand and caused me to jerk. When I looked down, she tapped her temple. When she spoke, her lips didn't move, and I knew instantly only I could hear her. I have a message for you from Nokoro Takamoto, Gemini. He congratulates you on being the first player to level 10 on a wave of unique quests. You have proved that one can adventure and advance in the world of Enora Online purely based on its natural evolution via Enora's real-time quest generation. He says you should be proud. I yanked my bag up and rifled through my interface. I had new prompts, new abilities to which I'd paid no attention after I leveled. I needed my clothes. I stood straight, my bag dangling next to my leg, my thoughts on Priya's pain and Roshan's absence. Throwing my arm around Priya, I drew her back to me and responded with my thoughts, wishing I could growl them. Some governor has taken Roshan. I got stabbed in my neck and my other friend just had her throat slit. I thank you for the message, Lucera, but I'm having a hard time giving a turd. Lucera who stood as the incarnation of what was probably the most amazing AI ever developed, simply smiled that no-teeth, patient smile. Of course, Gemini. I have one final message and then I have a special quest for you. What's the message? I asked impatiently, kissing Priya on the side of her head. Nokuro wishes you to know that they've been speeding your progression video so Caitlin can watch clips of your performance. Of course... Intimate moments were excluded in the interest of privacy. She wants you to know her only desire is that you live this life to its fullest. As I'd been here for three days, 
that meant one day had passed since I died back on Earth. The thought of it made my head spin. Nice. She added you should take this bitch by the balls. I would have laughed given another set of circumstances. Thank you, Lucera. Let her know I got the message, and I have every intention of it. I gave a curt nod. And the special quest? My inner face blinked. You have been offered a quest. Rescue Roshan. Recommended level, 16. Rescue Roshan before the guards can deliver her to the governor in Millbury Peaks. Reward, 18,000 XP. 25 gold. A foundation stone. There's that word again. I spoke aloud. Foundation stone? What the hell is a foundation stone? Lucera's response came aloud as well. A foundation stone can be buried in the place of your choosing to erect a foundation, Gemini. As the word indicates, it is the basis of a stronghold, and if nurtured, protected, and built up over time, can become a town, a city, or maybe a castle. You will choose should you complete the quest. Yeah, that sounds epic and all, but I need to get going. Do you accept this quest, Gemini? Absolutely. I'm sorry, Priya asked, but who are you? Having calmed myself enough to thank Lucera for the information and the quest, I'd peered into her eyes one long, final time, remembering Honora's words that I would never see her again. Then I hugged her, in spite of the burning anger coursing through my veins at recent revelations and events involving Roshan. We marched away to the shade of the tree line near the village, and I retrieved the clothes I had the foresight to pack in the bag. I was pleased to find my soul-bound bow, but I was so pissed at myself, I could hardly unclench my jaw or my fists. I cursed over three utterly stupid mistakes. First, I didn't set my spawn point like a total noob. Second, I didn't put my armor into my bag, opting instead to lazily lean it against the wall. But the most unforgivable violation of all, I didn't raise Roshan's skill point so she would resurrect at my spawn point if she died. What the hell had I been thinking? What if something happened to her? We stomped through loose dirt next to a cornfield as I fumed with myself. Judging by Priya's expression, she was right there with me. So I turned and gripped her shoulders. We'll get her back, and I'll make those bastards pay for what they did to you. They will indeed pay, she spat. Her eyelids dropped, leaving only slits for her to glare through. My neck warmed as hers turned pink. You must find a way to select my class and make me stronger so that I might rain hell down on them all. We turned toward the trail, and the shadows where the tree canopy met the wood came into view. As we paced across the threshold, I nearly bumped into a boy walking the other direction. He was a preteen with full lips that turned upward in a sneer at me. Recognition dawned. The boy who held a knife to my throat my first day in Honora. Watch where you're going, fool. Stepping forward, I cuffed him on the side of the head, grabbed his shoulder, and shoved him into a ditch filled with standing water next to the trail. As he splashed down, I stepped to the edge of the gully and peered down at him. Recognize your betters, fool. The End We hope you have enjoyed Gemini's Crossing by Arlo Adams Narrated by Brian Mesler If you enjoyed this audiobook, make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon below to receive updates when new content is available. This has been a Layer 2 Publishing Production. All rights reserved.